स्ट्रीम की इज रॉन्ग हेलो गाइस आई मी ऑडिबल एंड विजिबल इफ सो जस्ट गिव मी एस एम ए हाई गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन गुड इवनिंग होप आई एम ऑडिबल एंड विजिबल Thank you, Doxing. Thank you, uh, Okiva, Ashik, Shifani, Ella. Okay, great. Fine. So, myself, Doctor Anjit, and I am going to teach you pathology uh, at PW. And uh, I hope we, all of us together, will be reading many, many more things in pathology and medicine, and we'll love pathology and medicine. By the way, your exams are not a concern. Our only concern here at PW is going to make you good doctors. That's all. so it is about learning medicine it's about enjoying medicine exam be it distinction be it honors be it your neat pg fmg or inicit or usmle any exam is a by product of enjoying medicine right so with that note uh, let's go to the sprint session whatever doubts you have please type in the comment box since there'll be delay i'll definitely take all your doubts and definitely be replying to all your doubts and put headphones on if you're watching in mobile phone on a laptop be attentive i'll have the annotated pdf in the pw channel and definitely we'll learn more things together and my usp is going to be we are not going to use memory to memorize things we will use logic and your real life to understand pathology as well as medicine okay great so let's start so fastest fingers first and so there are few thumb rules in uh, entire pathology because the most difficult thing in pathology what we generally think is the images right the hn images which is not clear i am not able to understand any images right so what we'll do is there are very few thumbnails uh just tn we'll discuss anything about uh, mostly the entire pathology fine so i have only three colors uh, do remember this thumb rule if you want you can write this thumb rule i have pink that's the first one i have blue that's the second one and the third one is clear these are only three things which is there in your microscopy in the entire pathology right so remember this if something is blue in color in a microscope it's made of nucleic acid it should be either dna or rna most of the time it's just the nucleus that's all if something is going to be pink in color rest everything inside a cell will be pink in color right okay if it's clear the first thumb rule which i want you to remember is anything clear under microscopy think of factor okay i'm sure they'll try to cover as much as possible yes hopefully we'll be covering 90% okay so these are three thumb rules and i want you to remember this forever whenever i ask these questions you keep on answering the same thing so you will never ever forget things and we'll like i said we'll go smoothly we'll go using logic and just uh, we'll learn pathology together fine so first thing we'll go to the first mcqs uh, i want you guys to comment on the mcqs do comment on the mcqs i will be expecting mostly the right answers from you guys i'm sure you guys are definitely smarter than entire generation of uh, us so go to the answer maybe i'll give a few clues uh, this question primarily is put for one reason and i have primarily put the question without an image though it is an image based question it's a 45 year old person chronic smoker came to the clinic with complaints of cough the physician examine the patient and takes a biopsy and the picture is given below i have not given the picture i'll give you the picture soon which of the following changes is most likely to be happen in this patient any comments okay there are people commenting c metaplasia great see why i purposefully took the image out of this question is the first and the foremost thing which i want you guys to learn is ibq is not mostly based on the image an ibq is based on the question what happens in ibq is when you look at the image you are not getting head or tail of it so what happens you get frustrated you get anxious and you make a mistake so though it's an ibq even without the image you can answer the question so keep this in mind going forward whenever you have an image based question try to hide the image look at the history and answer it that will be more than easy for us right now i'll use the same question with an image this is the image same the same thing just there's an image here that's all like you guys said the answer the correct answer is undoubtedly your metaplasia that's all right so it's a smoker with metaplasia if you want to excel pathology as well as medicine there's only one thumb rule again learn and understand things just learn and understand the terminologies that's all 
So it's metaplasia. I just want you to look at this. It's meta and it's plasia. Right? It's metaplasia. What does meta mean? What does meta mean? I just want you to answer. What do you think meta means? I'm sure you guys know. Thanks to Facebook and everything, meta means change. Even from your school days, you must have read metamor metamorphosis, right? Change in the morphology. So meta means change. Plasia here means growth. So metaplasia is nothing but change in growth. That's all. It's just there in the terminology. So metaplasia means there's going to be a change in growth. That's all. It's as simple as that, right? Now let's take our history and use to understand and derive what will be the change. That's it. Fine. Let's have a look. What our history was, it was a smoker, right? It was a smoker and the problem was in respiratory tree. Right? It was in respiratory tree. Now answer again a question. What is the normal epithelium seen in respiratory tree? Just quickly. You can use short forms. You can use whatever you want. The normal epithelium in the respiratory tree. Great. The normal epithelium in respiratory tree is superb. I can see people commenting ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium, right? The only thing what is important for me here is cilia. That's all. It's cilia. It's there. And when a person keeps on smoking, there's going to be particles coming inside, right? The particles goes and hits the cilia. Am I right in saying that cilia is very, very fragile and cilia will die? Definitely cilia will die, right? It's a ciliated columnar epithelium. There's a very fragile structure. The smoke will destroy the cilia. So I need a change. That's a stimulus there. Stimulus for you guys to read is need PG notification. Like that here, stimulus to change here is the smoke. The smoke destroys cilia. So I have to change to a very resistant epithelium. What is the skin made of? Because why I'm using skin is most of us in whatever part of India you are, you will have pollution. Skin has nothing. It is perfect, right? In spite of abundant amount of smoke, my skin doesn't change because skin is very, very, very resistant to smoke. So it changes to your squamous epithelium. So there's a change happening from ciliated columnar to squamous. And that's why I'm going to call it an squamous metaplasia. It's changed from ciliated columnar to squamous. So it's in squamous metaplasia. How many of you guys have memorized most common things and you've forgotten? I'm sure quite a few guys here would, must have had a huge list of most commons. You try to memorize it, but at the end of the day, you forget it, right? Because we are going to use logic to remember most common and not others. Fine. We're just going to use logic to remember most common. Fine. Chandra Prakash, yes, you can say whatever you have doubts. Fine. So you must all have read about Bharat's esophagus, right? It's Bharat's esophagus. So Bharat's esophagus. I just want you to comment here. What do you think is the etiology of Barrett's esophagus? The etiology of Barrett's esophagus, the disease which causes Barrett's esophagus, it is GRD, right? Chandra Prakash, I am listening. You can please give a comment. It's GRD, right? So what happens here is in GRD, which part do you want me to repeat Chandra Prakash? In GRD, there's going to be acid reflex. There's going to be acid reflex, which will go into the esophagus. Again, guys, comment. What is the normal lining of esophagus? Ashad, I will definitely give you the PDF. If you want, you can write. The normal lining of esophagus is squamous epithelium, right? It's simple squamous epithelium, a stratified squamous epithelium. So now here, the acid reflex, let's assume skin is again squamous. You drop a acid on your skin. Am I right in saying that skin will burn? It will burn. So will esophagus also burn when I drop an acid? It will burn. Let's go back to your school days. I'm having acid. The easiest way to neutralize acid is you put a base to it, bicarbonate to it, right? You just put a bicarbonate to it. MBBS synapse, it's going on good, so don't stimulate them, please. <laughs> okay, it's going on good so far, right? So I'm going to have a drop of acid on your skin. It will get destroyed. So I'm going to have mucus to neutralize it, right? So what I'm going to do is I need an epithelium which can produce mucus. Now you, you guys are going to tell me which epithelium can synthesize mucin? Which epithelium can synthesize mucin? 
Again, I'm just going to wait for your answer. I'm sure you guys will answer. Some of you will definitely answer columnar epithelium. I want to be much more specific. Which type of which cell in columnar epithelium will secrete mucin? It's perfect. It's your columnar epithelium. To be specific, it's going to be goblet cells. Right? So I'm going to call it a columnar metaplasia. Right? It's as simple as that. I have columnar, columnar metaplasia. Or I can use the term goblet cell metaplasia. And it's very, very simple. Perfect. Now, let's use logic to remember which is most common. Like I said, tell me, don't look at the books. Don't look at your memory. Tell me from real life, which is more common, smoking or GERD? You have lived for 20 plus years approximately, which is more common, smoking or GRD? Undoubtedly, smoking is most common. So which is the most common metaplasia? Undoubtedly, respiratory squamous metaplasia is definitely more common than Barrett's esophagus. Right? Uh, yes, bad dog, you will have the PDF. Right? So that's all. So you don't go and memorize in writing in a uh, note that this is most common. You have lived, so you know which is most common. So undoubtedly, you know which is the most common metaplasia. As simple as that. Fine. Great. Now, let's extrapolate this topic a little bit more in detail. See, I want you guys to imagine. Imagination is the best gift what all of us has got. With that imagination, we can know, we will know how it looks in microscopy. We will know how it looks in gross. Now, again, tell me, I have two epithelium here. One is squamous, one is columnar. Which of these two epithelium is multi-layered, squamous or columnar? Again, a very, very simple question. You guys know, one of these will have stratification in the name which is multi-layered. Squamous is obviously multi-layered, right? Let's just for an understanding, draw this. Let's assume that this is squamous epithelium. I'm having multiple layers, stratified squamous epithelium. Columnar epithelium, right? Just a single layer. Okay, a single layer columnar epithelium, fine. Squamous is obviously multiple layer. Below every epithelium in my body, I will have your sub-epithelial blood vessels. So what I'm going to see here is, I have blood vessels here, I'll have blood vessels here, right? I'm just doing BV for blood vessels here. Again, just by using logic, answer me, which of these two epithelium, the blood vessels will be easily visible, squamous or columnar? Simple question, which of these two epithelium, the blood vessels will be easily visible, squamous or columnar? It has to be columnar epithelium right because columnar is very very thin so in other words in a naked eye can i call a columnar epithelium in naked eye will be red in color because the blood vessel is easy was easily visible and the squamous epithelium for naked eye it's going to be pale in color because i'm having multiple layers simple now let's take a patient with barrett's esophagus where the esophagus normally is having squamous epithelium and on top of that I'm having columnar epithelium. So a pale epithelium is being replaced by a red color epithelium. Can I call it red velvety mucosa on endoscopy? That's an MCQ, right? It's simple logic. It's red velvety mucosa. It's red velvet like mucosa. That's as simple as that. Right? You need not memorize. You know everything, right? It's red velvety mucosa on an endoscopy, right? So let's look at that. That's your endoscopic image. I just again draw two things. One, two. You are going to tell me which is squamous, which is columnar. Which is squamous? Which is squamous? One or two? You just need to know the theory, rest everything you can extrapolate. Which is squamous? One or two? Perfect. The first one is squamous, right? And the second one is columnar. Because first one is pale and the second one is red. So this is how Barrett's esophagus looks. So can I say if this whatever we have read is true, wherever in my body, when I have squamous and columnar transition, I will definitely have this red color and pink color. You will have, right? If you remember OG, cervix, squamocolumnar junction, transition zone looks the same. It's simple as that, right? So wherever squamous columnar changes, the same appearance will be there, right? Perfect. That's gross. That's an endoscopy. I'm a pathologist. I want to make sure you understand microscopy also. I'll use the same logic here. I'll use the same logic. Squamous epithelium is multi-layered. Columnar epithelium is single-layered. Can I say that columnar epithelium will form glands? It will form glands, right? So I'll use the image here. There's the image here. Again, I'm going to draw two things. One, right? And this is two. You are going to answer, right? You are going to answer this. I'm not going to answer. 
H and E is not difficult, it's simple. Tell me which is squamous, which is columnar. It's simple, it's very, very simple. Again, perfect. First is multiple layer, stratified squamous epithelium. Second has glands, columnar epithelium. If I give you history, if I give you history of recurrent chest, uh, recurrent epigastric pain and burping with the biopsy from esophagus, do you think it's difficult to know uh, identify this as Barrett's esophagus? It's not at all, right? It's extremely simple to identify it's Barrett's esophagus, right? It's extremely simple, perfect, right? That's all I want. Just give you a time. I'll make sure pathology will be definitely simple for you because path is extremely about co um, concepts. That's why it's very, very simple and you will definitely learn about it. Fine. Great. That's about the first question. The first question was an image based question, but without the image also you guys answered it. Right. So don't look at image for image based question going forward. Fine. Ashit, glands, uh, columnar epithelium generally form glands because columnar epithelium functions to secrete. Right. When it secretes, glands only will be secreting it. Fine. Hallmark is definitely goblet cells. Yes, like Dr. Vakar said. Right? Okay. Let's go to the next question. Read the question and we'll learn it. I want you guys to answer. I will keep quiet for maybe 15, 20 seconds. Read the entire question and then go to the options. Go ahead. Maybe I'll help you a little bit. 37 year old with a history of chronic alcoholic abuse and gallstones brought to the emergency. Complaining of severe abdomen pain for the past three days after increasing alcohol. Lab emergency room indicates elevated amylase and lipase. Right? During treatment, the patient dies. And the autopsy finding is here. What's the greater momentum seen below? Amazing, right? You guys answered A. See, there are two things I'm going to do here. Someone said that uh, someone said that that uh, fat is clear. Perfect. Fat is definitely clear, right? Again, I'm going to draw a few things. One, two. Which of these two do you think is normal? One is normal or two is normal? One is normal or two is normal? One is normal. Two is necrosis. Right? Two is necrosis. Remember that always. Anything necrotic is going to be pink in color because necrosis does not have nucleus. It's a dead cell. So when nucleus is gone, the only color which I'm going to have is pink color. That's all right. So necrosis anywhere, anywhere necrosis will be pink in color only. Remember this forever. Necrosis is equivalent to pink color, right? Perfect. Two is necrotic area. This entire thing is necrotic area. And the one is the normal area. Yes. We'll show what type of necrosis. If it is greater momentum, whatever you guys answer is right. It's fat necrosis. If biopsy is from pancreas, what will be the type of necrosis? Can you guys answer? Again, it's something which is important, which I want you to remember. Pancreas does not show fat necrosis. Pancreas shows, same case of acute pancreatitis, pancreas shows liquefactive necrosis. Pancreas doesn't show fat necrosis, right? Always remember this. See, there are two things. You might make a mistake here. When you have a case of pancreatitis, can I say, Am I right in saying that pancreatitis, the major problem is, is going to be over activation of enzymes? Yes, you'll have too much activation of lipases and the pancreatic enzymes, which destroys pancreas, right? So the mechanism of pancreatitis is enzyme activation. When there's an enzyme activation, that's the mechanism for liquefactive necrosis. But the same enzyme, one of the prominent enzymes in pancreatitis is lipase, right? So the lipase goes outside. When that goes to the peripancreatic fat, there are two things here for me. One is peripancreatic fat and the other one is omenta. In these two places, it is going to be your fat necrosis, right? Please be very, very careful here. It's going to be fat necrosis here. I want you to remember this. In pancreas, it's going to be liquefactor necrosis. In your peripancreatic fat and omentum, it's going to be fat necrosis. Clear? Great. Uh, yes, and Shuman, both. Okay. My student, uh, you will definitely do the path two paper very well. Fine. And all the best for your ENT practical, Shuman. Fine. Now let's have a quick review about every necrosis because every necrosis is per is very, very easy. Hi, the brush. Just a quick overlook of each necrosis. I'm going to ask you a few questions and you're definitely going to answer here. And Shuman, it will be there in the PW app soon. Fine. 
Coagulate to liquefy to caseous fat fibrinoid. I have only five types of necrosis, right? Very, very simple thing. Which is the most common? You guys know most common. I am not going to repeat it. The most common is your, obviously your coagulated necrosis, right? If I ask you, where do you see coagulated necrosis? Everyone will definitely answer. I will see them in every solid organ infarct, except it's seen in every infarcted organ, every solid organ infarct, except which organ? I'm sure you know the except. Except brain, right? Right, brain. <clears throat> sure, sure, if you have a doubt, definitely ask me. I'll de definitely answer you. Fine, except brain, except CNS. You must have definitely known that this except CNS for a long, long time. But we never are tuned to ask why brain. We should always be tuned to ask why. Because when you ask questions why, that's what is going to make you great. See, because you are teach I'm teaching here. I want you to be become better than me. The only way to become better and better and better is keep asking why. Fine. So here, the mechanism of coagulative necrosis is simple. It is protein degradation. Okay. It's protein denaturation. That's a mechanism of coagulative necrosis. Have you touched brain? Have you touched brain? I'm sure you must have, you guys must have touched brain in your anatomy dissection, right? Brain is soft or hard? The normal human brain. It's extremely soft, right? It's extremely soft. Can I say your tummy fat is also very, very soft? Sure, Julie, we'll definitely discuss everything logically in IHC markers as well. It's extremely soft because brain is rich in fat. That's why your omega-3 fatty acid increases it, right? So now, can a protein denaturation mechanism work for brain? Simple question. Coagulative mechanism is protein denaturation. Brain is full of fat. Can it destroy? It cannot destroy. So the only way to destroy fat is, I need lipase. I need enzymes. I'll go back to this again. What we read in pancreatitis. This is the mechanism of liquefactor necrosis. I want lipase. Only when there is light pace, I can destroy a soft brain, right? So here, the reason why brain has liquefactive necrosis is because of the consistency, because of the raw material present there. Here, the mechanism of activation is your enzyme activation. Okay. So that's why brain in fact. See, again, like I said, you guys are not students for me. Once you start your first year of MBBS, you are my colleagues, you are my doctors. Brain in fact, no one needs it. Right? There is no requirement for brain in fact. Right? So brain in fact, no one does a biopsy. But on the other hand, I need to remember which all conditions will have more of enzyme activation. When I take WBC for an example, am I right in saying that WBC will have lots and lots of enzymes inside them, neutrophils. You'll have lots of enzymes in the granules of the neutrophils. Am I right in saying that? Yes. So can I say a condition which has lots and lots of WBCs or neutrophils will have enzyme activation and will have liquefactor necrosis? Simple. Now you guys are going to comment. Tell me a condition. I'm having a lesion in my hand which is swollen and inside there's lots and lots of pus cells and WBCs and neutrophils. What do you call the condition as? Great Anshuman, what do you call the condition is? Abscess, perfect. That's the only place is required for me, right? It's not about brain in part because no one takes a biopsy for a stroke, right? So abscess cavity will have liquefactor necrosis. Can I also say a wet gangrene will have lots and lots of pus cells, lots and lots of neutrophils? Yes. So can I say wet gangrene also will have liquefactor necrosis, right? It's simple. It's wet gangrene. A dry gangrene will not have superadder infection. A wet gangrene will have superadder infection. Simple logic. Just remember this. You can extrapolate, right? That's about liquefactor necrosis. Caseous. Till you are alive and till you are going to practice medicine. Caseous necrosis. Till you are in our country or wherever you go, it's going to be tuberculosis. Caseous necrosis is equal to TB. That's all. Granuloma is equal to TB. There's no other doubt at all, right? Just if you're writing USMLE exam or any foreign exam, remember histoplasmosis. In India, histoplasma is not a common condition. And one more, coxy D-diomycosis. Okay. 
just if you remember if you're writing US assembly exam because histoplasma and coccidium mycosis in USA there are few states Missouri Mississippi very common it might help otherwise it's only tuberculosis fine that's about cases next one fibrinoid again we'll go back to the terminology terminology is very very important for me oid oid means like right fibrinoid means fibrin like again you're going to answer the my job is very simple if you are ready to understand where do you see fibrin or in which condition you will see fibrin or fibrin how much however you want to pronounce where will you see fibrin or fibrin when there's a blood vessel which has been cut am i right in saying that i'll have fibrin or fibrin yes pan is right arrhythmia doc i'll just come to that soon pan is perfectly right i'll come to that vessels right when a vessel breaks the clot is nothing but fibrin clot right so which means fibrinoid necrosis, fibrin-like necrosis is equivalent to vessel wall necrosis. That's all. The reason why I didn't write pan here is, can I say any vasculitis, be it pan, be it vaginus, be it Jane cell arthritis, any vasculitis, I'll have fibrinoid necrosis because it's in vessel, right? So it's not just pan. Don't read for an MCQ, read for knowing it. If you know it, MCQ will definitely get it sorted. It's any vasculitis. Any vasculitis will have fibrinoid necrosis. It's just not pan. Second part here. Can I say in SLE, he not skull and papyrus also will have it. In SLE, there's going to be circulating immune complex and that immune complex will get deposited in the vessel and SLE also causes vasculitis. What type of hypersensitivity will SLE come under? It will come under? Type 3 hypersensitive, right? So type 3 hypersensitive reaction also will have fibrinoid necrosis. And someone commented on malignant hypertension. Malignant hypertension also will have fibrinoid necrosis. Because in malignant hypertension, if you remember the flea bitten appearance in the kidney, because the capillary ruptures, rupture vessel wall. Again, it's malignant hypertension, fibrinoid necrosis. Again, someone commented on astro bodies. It's becoming amazing now. Can I say? Heart is the largest vessel. Is that statement right? Heart is the largest vessel, right? So when I have a disease in heart, which is involving all three layers, it acts like a vessel. So ash of body seen in rheumatic heart, heart disease will also have fibrinoid necrosis. In other words, I need not remember this list. I don't want mnemonics to remember this list. Just remember any damage to vessel wall will have it. A DOM3 type 3 hypersensitivity because you'll have circulating immune complex which deposits in the vessel wall and it causes fibrinoid necrosis. Clear? Fine. Fibrinoid is equal to vessel wall. That's all. Fat. We saw an example. The MCQ what we saw. Why was it? Uh, Nikuj. Fibrin will get deposited because what happens here is let's assume this is my vessel. When there's a problem, I won't have entire thing destroyed. This part will get destroyed. That's all right. Rest of the vessel is still there. So it will get deposited. Fine. It looks like fibrin. It's not fibrin exactly. It looks like fibrin. So we call it fibrinoid necrosis. Fine. Okay. Fat necrosis. Two areas which I want. One is your acute pancreatitis. Not in pancreas. In the omentum and everything. Okay. The second is the most important thing for me. It's your traumatic fat necrosis. See because omental Fat necrosis, I am not interested at all because you are not going to take a biopsy of omentum for acute pancreatitis. You do an amylase, take history, treat, send the patient away. I just want you to look at what is required for me, that's all. Traumatic fat necrosis of breast. See, this is required for a doctor. Okay, I'll tell you why it is required for a doctor. Breast parenchyma, gluteal region are rich in fat. So then there's any trauma, fat undergoes death. Now again, we'll go... I'll do definitely do it made said. We'll go into little bit in-depth understanding. If you remember necrosis, what is the most common ion seen in necrosis? Arrhythmia doc, it will be coagulated to necrosis in dry gangrene. What's the most common ion in necrosis? It is calcium, right? So calcium is the most common ion in necrosis. So here in this traumatic fat necrosis, am I right in saying that there'll be calcium deposition or calcification? Yes, Adia, uh, acute pancreatitis in pancreas liquefactive 
in omentum it is fat necrosis fine okay so here i'll have calcification so my concern here is only thing is calcification is a major concern so breast parenchyma has calcification if i do a mammogram there is a condition called as comedo dcas will that also have calcification i'm just linking systemic path and this we have a condition called as comedo ductal carcinoma in situ this also will have necrosis this also will have calcification okay simple right great now i have a problem i have to differentiate between them radiologists will definitely have to differentiate and that's why your practical mcu comes perfect right rpr what you said was perfect now having two different pathology one is hitting trauma trauma cannot destroy one single cell trauma will destroy a group of cells cancer will be cellular level right cancer will be cellular level so which of these two traumatic and comedo necrosis will have macro calcification simple pure logic we need not memorize it no memory which will have macro calcification obviously this will have macro calcification and this will have micro calcification like what rpr said that's correct right so our only goal is to apply it diagnose it treat the patient that's all right so it's simple so we know all the five things here we know all the five different types of necrosis necrosis is very important for me we will be extrapolating general pathology into systemic and your hematology into in depths you know general pathology you know the entire subject okay now let's go to one more question i'll keep quiet for maybe 10 15 seconds then i'll start discussing this question this might be a little bit new but i want you to remember this just for one reason i'll tell you why i will share it mmh okay great so guys you guys are answering c and a majority are c necroptos right perfect see it's a very simple theoretical question it's a one liner question the reason why i put this question is i want you to understand necroptosis because whenever you see a disconnect between theory and practical i am missing something that's the learning lesson here right let's assume this let's assume i'm going to draw a mechanism you will tell what mechanism it is fine are the hay sulfur test i think you will be you should be asking the biochemist i really don't know about that fine so let's say fas and your fas ligand what process is this in which type of cell death you'll have this aditya in pancreas in the substance of pancreas you'll have liquefactive and the omentum you'll have fat necrosis fine this is nothing but apoptosis right okay there's nothing but apoptosis in apoptosis you must have definitely read this let's assume this apoptosis activates fadd this is how my body kills viruses this is how my body kills viruses now again a practical question which all of us must have experienced since we have come out of covid can i say viruses are the one which can undergo massive amount of mutation keeps on mutating right again and again and again keeps on mutating so when my body killed a virus using this extrinsic pathway of apoptosis what what my virus did was created an enzyme which blocked it they had something called as flippase this flippase went and blocked fadd so when it blocked fadd can the virus infected cell die or it live it lives right so virus was very happy how much ever covid can mutate alpha beta gamma till zeta my body will take care because we are a much developed organism so what i did was i have to escape this so i said fadd is blocked i am not going to go and fight against the virus i will have one complex called as rib complex the rib complex will be activated this rib complex goes and activates mlkl this mlkl destroys the cell membrane how can we name this the person who have named necroptosis apoptosis everything are just born early that's all they are not geniuses they are born early so i have a disease which starts with apoptosis right and it ends with cell membrane damage right i have a disease which starts with apoptosis but ends with cell membrane damage cell membrane damage is a feature of necrosis or apoptosis it's a feature of necrosis so what will you name it you're going to name it necroptosis right 
okay uh, sanyasi uh, pancreatitis will be liquefactive the omentum in pancreatitis will be fat i will discuss it clearly in the first question we'll, you can go back and see it later on fine so this that's how necroptosis came the origin was this why i need you to know this is i am sure you must have read about hepatitis i am sure you must have read about hepatitis right i am right in saying that in hepatitis you must also read about your uh, uh, councilman bodies yes so can i say councilman bodies are apoptotic bodies right they are apoptotic bodies right there is apoptotic bodies so hepatitis kills cell by apoptosis virus induced hepatitis apoptosis there is no cell membrane damage am i right in saying that if there is no cell membrane damage the intracellular uh, cell or the enzymes will not come outside which part bgs intracellular enzymes can never come outside but i am again asking you same question if intracellular enzymes cannot come outside will hepatitis have elevated ast or alt just looking at this tell me hepatitis virus induced had councilman body had apoptosis will the ast alt level be elevated or not ast alt level shouldn't be elevated ideally speaking but have you read that in multiple places hepatitis means the first finding is elevated ast alt yes liver enzymes will be elevated that's what i was talking about disconnect you know that it has apoptosis but you also know that ast alt level will be elevated because it's not apoptosis this is what happening it's necroptosis because of cell membrane is getting damaged it becomes elevated right so there's a disconnect so whenever you see some disconnect in your real life between what you read and what is you're seeing please put more time and energy into it you are about to discover something new everything should definitely be logical if logic is getting problematic we are missing out something right so where you see necroptosis this answer like you guys said is necroptosis necroptosis is seen in viral infections especially cmv because cmv is where we discovered necroptosis fine right? sarosh give me give us a month we'll definitely tell it and you have steatohepatitis there also you're going to have necroptosis whenever a new thing comes in market they will use all the I'll come to it adia we'll use all the existing uh, unknown pathogens we'll put into this right so you have your neurodegenerative disorders coming there parkinsons alzheimer's everything aditya that's a very very good question so what happens is let's assume you have same covid virus can i say that when i'm having a viral infection it need not be always one clone of the virus there some of them will escape this mechanism that will be killed by necroptosis some of them which cannot escape or which cannot produce full paste will be killed by apoptosis that's why i will see councilman bodies at the same time i will also have elevated liver enzymes amazing question be the same keep asking questions again and again if i know the answer i'll answer if i don't know i will read an answer even if after reading also if i don't know go ahead and discover because some someone has not diagnosed that everything fine uh, dr b just flipase is an enzyme produced by the virus to stop apoptosis flipase stops or destroys fadd so that apoptosis stops fine perfect great super let's go to the next one fine rpr i hope hindi is not a problem i'll try to converse in english not so fluent in hindi i can understand your hindi that's why i'm going in english right okay next question answer <clears throat> i'll mute myself for 10 20 seconds i want you guys to answer Sure, Capricorn. Okay, our time is up. So answer: thirty-three year old, five week history of cough, cough pain, low grade fever, and you have elevated levels of creatinine kinase, and there's a muscle biopsy with numerous eosinophils. Nikuch, I'll discuss it soon. Wait, right? Perfect. So it is interleukin five. We will leave the answer because it's a theoretical, it's a memory based answer, which I'm sure everyone will know. Tell me the diagnosis in this patient. Nikuch, coming back to your question, apoptosis is a dead cell. In a dead cell, nucleus will not be there, right? So that's why it's more pink in color. 
diagnosis it's a muscle related parasitic infection so could be trichinella trichuris dr mamta will be the best person to talk about parasites must be something like trichinella or trichuris or maybe a tinea as well right so some muscle related parasitic infection that's why we are having eosinophils and interleukin 5 is going to be there strong alloids also it's fine but strong alloids in muscle it's more in the bladder right that's what my understanding is okay great i want you to remember this person this person is a very very important person because again there are few things in interleukins which will blow your mind one of them is interleukin 17 Inter interleukin 5 attracts eosinophils interleukin 17 does something called as an acute horn chronic inflammation okay that's simply superb i'm sure you must have come across this for uh, value reading but you must have just overseen superficially i'll just take that point and will tell you uh, inflammatory bowel disease ulcerative colitis crohn's disease both of them are acute or chronic they are chronic disorders right perfect am i right in saying that in the same inflammatory bowel disease in ulcerative colitis you must have read about your uh, microapsis cryptapsis yes abscess is collection of neutrophils didn't it strike you in a chronic inflammation how the hell did i have neutrophils because in ulcerative colitis interleukin 17 is involved that's why in a chronic inflammation also you will have abscess collection because it's acute on chronic inflammation that's the beauty of interleukin 17 it's not just that one more thing uh, I'll just ask one more question. Psoriasis, acute or chronic? Psoriasis, acute or chronic? Psoriasis, chronic, right? At the same time, in psoriasis also, you must have definitely heard about Munro's microabscess. Same thing here. Right? It's Munro's microabscess. Because psoriasis also will have interleukin 17. So wherever interleukin 17 is there, it has two things. It will have chronic inflammation at the same time acute inflammation. If you see in a chronic disease and acute inflammation, remember this. You will you should remember this because these are variations. Whenever there's a variation, you might fall and you might write the wrong answer. Fine. And interleukin 1 is a lymphotrophic factor. It's a lymphocyte chemoattractant. It just attracts lymphocyte, that's all. Uh, come here. See, in kidney, see, it's mostly it's going to be hypertrophic. A little bit of change in the glomerulus also happens. Fine. Okay. Yes, BGS. Potrius happens in your mycosis fungoides, right? That's a totally different condition. We'll look at it when we come to mycosis fungoides. Fine. Okay. Okay. Now, our, my only thing is, the inflammation is something which I want you to excel in microscopy. Theory part of inflammation, I'm sure you'll know. Select and integrate everything you will know, fine. Yes, Nikunj. Select and integrate everything you know for sure, right? So what I want you to understand is how inflammatory cells will look in a biopsy. I'll tell why I'm going to teach you this because it's very, very simple. It's also a pyrogen cache. It's an acute phase reactant. It uh, attracts neutrophil, uh, sorry, lymphocytes in a biopsy, right? It's also pyrogenic. Pyrogenic is a systemic effect. And this is a localized effect, fine. Okay. Ranjana, uh, Mamta will help you with interleukins and how to remember, fine. So why I want to remember, uh, why I want you to learn how a neutrophil looks in a biopsy is, if you are confident in diagnosing neutrophil in a biopsy, am I right in saying that you can diagnose meningitis, encephalitis, or a tip to acute inflammation, paranoia? You can, because everything is neutrophil. If we can diagnose eosinophil with confidence in a biopsy, you can diagnose asthma, you can diagnose drug allergies, you can diagnose any parasitic infection. If you can diagnose lymphocyte in a microscopy, you can diagnose every autoimmune problem. Because half of my disease in every system is inflammatory. Why I'm struggling to identify a biopsy is I don't know these inflammatory cells in a biopsy. How neutrophil looks in a biopsy is I want a little bit of help from you guys here. What's the color of nucleus in a biopsy or an HNE? It is perfect. It is blue in color, right? So here it's going to have a tiny bent nuclei. It's going to have a tiny bent nuclei. If you have a bent blue color, that's neutrophil. That's all. You will not see the 
granules, you will not see the chromatin thread, you will not see the cell membrane. It's going to be blue in color, that's all. A bent blue nuclei is going to be neutrophil. Okay. Yosnophil again, don't go with the nucleus in yosnophil. I am sure everyone here knows that yosnophil is bilobed, right? It's going to be like this, bilobed. But when I cut a bilobe, when I'm going to cut like here, it's going to be two. If two lobes are one behind the other, when I cut, it looks like only one lobe, right? So bilobe, one lobe. So don't go with nucleus for your snuffle. Always go with pink color granules. If it's pink and granular, that's your snuffle. Right? No, with lobes, no spectacle shaped nuclei, no headphone shaped nuclei. It's pink color granules. Uh, yes, Kumar, you can ask. So it's plasma cell. So we have a plasma cell. Plasma cell looks very unique. It will be an oval cell with a nucleus in the corner and plasma cell produces antibodies, right? Antibody, uh, Kumar, you can ask your question rather than commenting. I have a question. So antibody is nothing but protein. What do you think will be the color of protein in a biopsy? Guys, answer so that Kumar's question goes up. What do you think will be the color of protein in a biopsy? Protein is going to be pink in color, right? It's going to be pink in color. Fine, that's all. We'll have more pink color here. A pink color cell. Protein is pink in color in a biopsy. Antibody is nothing but protein. Pink color cell, a nucleus like this in the eccentric and a perinuclear halo. That'll be halo. I'll exactly tell you why this halo is seen. See, everything what I see here, everything what I see in microscopy has a reason. Antibodies of plasma cell should be inside the cell or it should be secreted a very simple question good evening it should be secreted or should stay inside the cell it should be secreted right for a protein to secrete let's go back to biochemistry am i right in saying that it needs co-translational and post-translational modifications it does so for me to put the antibody outside the cell to secrete, I need lots of post-translational modification. And post-translational modification, if you remember biochemistry again, happens in Golgi apparatus. So this halo is nothing but increase in Golgi apparatus. Golgi apparatus is not stained in a microscopy. I need that to, put, to push it out, right? That's why you have the halo. And that's a very classical finding of plasma cell. Whatever I see in microscopy has lots of reason. And we're going to just go and learn the reason MCQ will definitely clear on the go, right? Next, lymphocyte. Lymphocyte is the easiest and the favorite thing, right? Lymphocyte will be small round blue cell because lymphocyte doesn't have a lobe, the single round nuclei. It's just small round and blue cells. It's as simple as that, right? Okay, it's as simple as that. Hi, Jatin. Look at macrophage. Macrophage also will blow your mind. You are going to tell me again, you are going to tell me, you are going to imagine, you will tell exactly how a macrophage looks. Which part Aditya? Ask me again. What is the function of macrophage? Macrophage is only one function. Macrophage is like us. Macrophage knows to eat. That's all. You just know to eat. So macrophage eats a dead cell. It's phagocytosis, right? It's going to eat dead cells. Once it eats lots of dead cells, it's going to have only your cytoplasmic membrane it's just going to have a cytoplasmic membrane cytoplasmic membrane is made of phospholipid bilayer so it's made of fat right so what is the color of fat in a microscopy what's the color of fat in a microscopy fat has only one thing a thumb rule it's going to be clear right so can i say a macrophage is going to look like this Nucleus with a clear cytoplasm. Yes. Perfect. Have you been using the term from second year onwards? Macrophage is also called as foamy cells. The reason to call it foam cell is the cytoplasm of a macrophage looks clear. That's why you use the term foam cell or colorless. Foam is colorless, right? The only problem is people don't teach us why it is called foam cell. I'm going to teach you why. Once I teach you why, you don't need me. You shouldn't need me. The ex exact point of teaching it is, I'm going to teach you, give you everything. You become amazing doctors, clinicians, surgeons, whatever it is. Fine. Okay. Uh, Ranjana, the reason why Golgi is not colored is that's how Golgi is. Aditya, plasma cells, the halo is due to Golgi apparatus. 
Golgi apparatus needs is needed for the post translation modification so that the antibody can be secreted outside. Fine, great. Now I know all these five things. I'm going to show you images. You guys are going to answer what inflammatory cell it is. If you can answer all the five inflammatory cells, you can diagnose 50% of the cases which comes to a pathology lab. 50%. What cell is this? What cell is this? Bent nuclei. What cell is that? Just comment the first letter. That's enough. Uh, they are most more or less. It's neutrophil. Perfect. Right. It's a neutrophil. Great. Again, one more thing. What cell do you think this is? I'm marking with green color. What cell do you think this is? The blue dot. What cell is that? That's a perfect. That's a lymphocyte, right? Neutrophil lymphocyte. I just want you to know it's you have. I want you to just identify them. If you can identify them, just give me two minutes. I'll tell you how to use them. Fine. What cell is this? There are multiple here. I'm marking many of them. What are these cells? What are these cells? I'm having granules, pink in color. Perfect. They are eosinophils, right? Perfect. They are eosinophils. Perfect eosinophils, right? They are pink color granule. If you remember, I told you don't go with the nucleus. If I look at this cell, I have two nucleus. If you look at this cell, there's only one nuclei. So always go with granules, pink granular eosinophils, right? Great. What cell is this? Again, fastest finger first. Just come in the first letter. That's more than enough. It's again, small round blue cell. That's again your beautiful lymphocyte, right? Great. Superb. Next. What cell is this? Just give me some second. You will definitely identify everything. What cell is this? That's having an extremely clear cytoplasm. Clear cytoplasm, foam cells is going to eat the dead cell. It's going to eat the fat. That's your perfect macrophage. Right, super. Just one more cell. What cell is this? I'm sure you can see the perinuclear halo. That's a clue for you here. That's great. That's your plasma cell, right? Perfect. Okay. Now I want you guys to comment. If you can confidently identify in a biopsy, neutrophil, eosinophil, lymphocyte, plasma cell, and macrophages. Yes? You can, right? You will definitely be able to. I'll tell you now how we are going to use this. The utility is what is important for me here. Let's say I have given you a history of pancreatitis and the pancreatitis biopsy shows lots of plasma cells and lots of uh, uh, lymphocytes. Lots of lymphocytes in the plasma cells. I'll come to that Ranjana. If you see lots of lymphocytes, plasma cell in a pancreatitis biopsy, can I call it chronic pancreatitis? Yes. So if you can call it chronic pancreatitis, it's lymphocytes and plasma cells, right? So will I be able to say the etiology here is autoimmune pancreatitis because lymphocytes are seen in autoimmune condition. So just by looking at a lymphocyte, you can diagnose it's chronic autoimmune pancreatitis as simple as that. Now let's to put the same information, lymphocytes and plasma cells are seen in autoimmune pancreatitis. I just want you to identify the lymphocytes. If you can identify the lymphocytes, and if the biopsy is from thyroid, tell me the diagnosis. Lymphocytes, biopsy from thyroid or FNAC from thyroid, diagnosis. Just one cell, you can make it amazing diagnosis. Lymphocytes, plasma cells in a thyroid. Hashimoto's, that's all, right? Hashimoto's. Okay, uh, Stubi, you are also right. It could be Graves or Hashimoto's. If it is hyperthyroidism, Graves. If it's hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's. Clear? Same lymphocytes, same plasma cells in a salivary gland biopsy. Diagnosis. Lymphocytes, plasma cells in a salivary gland biopsy. Diagnosis. It is fun. Pathology is fun. We are not reading the right way, that's all. Tell me which autoimmune condition affects your swell, uh, salivary gland. Salivary gland. Chagrin. That's it, right? So I just want you to remember lymphocytes. Stubi, Warthin means it is a tum tumor. If it's inflammatory condition, geogram, right? That's all. It's very, very simple to remember, right? So, eosinophil is this. Okay, I hope you can see the eosinophil. 
if you have missed out anything you can ask me in the telegram group or facebook group of your uh, pw i'll be definitely coming up with all your answers in the easiest possible way remember the five inflammatory cells if you remember the five inflammatory cells everything is taken care of we'll use this also i'm seeing macrophage macrophage by the way is a cell of chronic inflammation every chronic inflammation will have macrophage right i'm seeing macrophage in the iota or i'm seeing foam cells in the iota what is the diagnosis think answer chronic inflammation in iota below the intima diagnosis it's simple you know the answer diagnosis can i call it atherosclerosis chronic inflammation of a blood vessel is atherosclerosis right that's it right just inflammatory cell if you know the inflammatory cell you can diagnose everything fine uh, ranjana lymphocytes is not the primary cell of chronic inflammation macrophage is a primary cell of chronic inflammation lymphocytes are also seen in chronic inflammation which is of autoimmune or viral origin right remember that lymphocytes are also seen in chronic inflammation if the chronic inflammation is due to virus or an autoimmune process if it's not virus not autoimmune process it is macrophage macrophage is the chronic inflammation right uh, see kt aneurysm no it's atherosclerosis because aneurysm it could be secondary to atherosclerosis but aneurysm is not primarily an inflammatory condition it's destruction right right so we know inflammatory cells if you're done with inflammatory cells we'll go to the next question where we'll beautifully identify a few more things as well uh, okay the question is half cut so ignore that maybe start from this the lymph node biopsy shown below which of the following is the most appropriate diagnosis shubhajit we'll learn in this we'll try to change because change is the only constant right we'll learn we'll understand if you're not getting anything tell me i'll definitely help you uh, understand that lymph node biopsy and this is a granuloma right granuloma is seen there's only one diagnosis perfect you guys are already commenting it's your classical tuberculosis okay now i'm going to rephrase the question uh, this patient let's assume it's an uh, 15 year old person with fever and cough that's a history and the image shows non necrotizing granuloma there is no image there but the question says the image shows non necrotizing granuloma right non necrotizing granuloma same option diagnosis same option non necrotizing granuloma diagnosis thank you shubhajit it's still tuberculosis don't change to sarcoidosis be it necrotizing be it non necrotizing granuloma diagnosis is always tuberculosis remember this i'll tell you why very soon be it necrotizing or non necrotizing granuloma my first diagnosis and the only diagnosis is tuberculosis sarcoidosis is always diagnose of exclusion we'll just finish it in a, in a few minutes fine okay now let's understand why and how a granuloma is seen right if if you can understand granuloma we can easily understand everything granuloma is a prototype right let's take a person as inhaled tb base like and your macrophage is there macrophage is eaten the tb base like right the tb base like came here how many of you can uh, make memes if you can make memes this is your uh, homework today make a mean on tuberculosis tuberculosis is thug life because tb can multiply inside a macrophage it multiplies inside macrophage it's simply superb macrophage was one of the most powerful immune cell what i had tb went inside there and said i am going to multiply here you can't do anything to me it multiplies inside the macrophage so what happens is macrophage like it's stuck it's stumped so what it does is if you are not able to solve a question if you are not able to understand something you ask the help of a friend macrophage says let me also ask the help of my friend the friend is lymphocyte now you are going to tell me you are going to tell me how will a macrophage communicate with a lymphocyte you already know the answer i just want you to remember it you know everything you know everything tell me how a macrophage can communicate with a lymphocyte i'll give you a clue macrophage is also called as antigen presenting cells please make a meme home then macrophage are also called as antigen presenting cells how do they connect they connect by yeah interleukins comes but they connect by mhc2 right there'll be mhc2 here fine yeah so it stays here it presents the tb antigen 
to my which cell cd4 or cd8 it is cd4 t cell right so with the help of the mhc2 it presents the antigen it's an antigen presenting cell right gives you the cd4 cells so this cd4 t cell at the end of the day what it does is it goes to your th1 pathway one person helps in the conversion of cd4 to th1 pathways interleukin 12 okay now what th1 pathway does is th1 pathway secretes th1 is nothing but cd4 cell it secretes a molecule called as interferon gamma okay secretes a molecule called as interferon gamma i just want you to remember again ranjana because cd8 is primarily for virus is a bacteria so it goes to th4 cd4 right if you remember tb diagnosis have you heard about quantiferon gold test it will definitely be there uh, a synapse in the pw channel fine quantiferon gold test right so quantiferon gold test is based on this it's going and directly hitting the pathogenesis that's why i'm saying quantiferon gold is extremely sensitive for me i can easily diagnose them right because this interferon gamma what it does is it changes a normal macrophage into an activated macrophage okay it changes a normal macrophage to an activated macrophage simple right so this activated macrophage function changes yeah, it's the interferon gamma release as a same thing right the activated macrophage function is not phagocytosis they secrete they secrete two things interleukin 1 and interleukin 12 see now it's very simple we just now read in the mcq interleukin 1 is a lymphotrophic factor so what does interleukin 1 does is it brings more and more lymphocytes it increases lymphocytes what do you think interleukin 12 does interleukin 12 converts the lymphocytes into th1 pathway so what does th1 pathway does secretes interferon gamma more activated macrophage it's a vicious cycle it keeps on going again and again and again right so entire cell number increases a lot right uh, 815 shubas uh, 830 right it increases a lot so now let's look at this you're going to tell me how the activated macrophage looks can i call these two as proteins can i call interleukins as proteins yes or no i want comments both of them are proteins right perfect so what is the color of protein in a biopsy you guys know you are excellent pathologist by now color of protein in biopsy it is pink in color perfect my normal macrophage was clear because the function was phagocytosis now this macrophage is secreting protein so it becomes pink in color we know one more cell which secretes protein plasma cell antibody the size of plasma cell or the shape of plasma cell was like this right we had plasma cell which looked like this elongated the nucleus of plasma cell was in the corner or in the center Kumar, if you have any doubt, do let me know. I'll definitely try to reply it. Fine. The plasma cell's nucleus was in the corner or in the center? It was in the corner. So can I say, if something accumulates inside the cell, the nucleus will go to the corner? It will, right? So here also, my nucleus goes to the corner. And it's pink in color. So the first person who saw the cell, multiple cell in a biopsy, you will definitely be amazed with this. For the first person who saw this, he saw cells like this. Cells like this, oval cells, nucleus in the corner, and pink color cytoplasm. Am I right in saying that these cells have a little bit look like a columnar epithelium? Can I call it columnar epithelium? Looks like a columnar epithelium, yes or no? Yes, right? So it looks like an epithelium. What's the term which we learned in necrosis for like? We le learned a term for like. What is that called as? Like means oid. So can I call this epithelioid cells? You're not going to read Robbins. You'll write textbooks. It's simple. You just have to understand it. You understand it. You'll definitely know everything. It's epithelioid cells or epithelioid macrophages. The reason the name came is the cells look like an epithelial cell here, right? So now I'm going to have hundreds and hundreds of epithelial macrophages coming here. Is there a possibility that the epithelial macrophages can fuse to each other? They can fuse, right? They'll definitely fuse. If it fuses, if it fuses, 
will have more number of cells. Someone commented lang hands. Will it form a giant cell? Because all these epithelial cells have the same structure, same function. It will form a gang. So that gang is your lang hands giant cell or giant cell. That's all. Okay, that's a giant cell. Right. So giant cell is nothing but fusion of epithelial and macrophages. Right. It's fusion of epithelial and macrophages. Now let's go to MCQ. The problem or confusion in MCQ is I am not understanding it properly. Now tell me, listen carefully and answer. You need not be in a hurry at all. Tell me which of these two is the principal cell or the first formed cell in granuloma? Epithelioid cell or Jain cell? First formed cell or principal cell of a granuloma? Epithelioid or Jain cell? That's an MCQ. It's undoubtedly epithelioid cell, right? Epithelial cell is a first form cell in a granuloma and Jain cell is just a union of it. So here I don't have a confusion at all. It's not a controversy. Controversies are created by human beings. Science is superb. Undoubtedly epithelial cell is a principal cell of granuloma. Okay. It's a principal cell of granuloma. Jain cell is not. Right. Now let's see how this granuloma should look. Again, close your eyes. Close your eyes for a second. Please close your eyes. Let's imagine it. Medicine is beautiful. We had epithelial cells in the center. Epithelial cells was, has a pink cytoplasm. So it'll have pink color center with elongated little bit of nucleus in the corner. And these epithelial cells secrete interleukin 1 which attracts lymphocytes. So surrounding this pink center, I'll have multiple blue dots because lymphocytes we know it looks like a small round blue cell, right? It looks like a small round blue cell. So when it looks like a small round blue cell and the pink color. Can I call this a granuloma? Can I call this a granuloma? Obviously, right? It is a granuloma. You have the pink epithelial cells here. You have the amazing small round lymphocytes here. And that's how granuloma is. Next time when you go to your slides, you have a problem. Don't look outside the slide. Look inside the slide. The picture will speak to you. The only problem is I'm not speaking to the picture properly. That's how a granuloma looks. Now, I told initially, be it necrotizing or non-necrotizing, my only thing is tuberculosis, right? Now, let's say this entire granuloma, am I right in saying that the only purpose of the entire granuloma is to kill the TB bacilli? Yes. The only purpose of the granuloma is to kill the TB bacilli, yes or no? Yes. So let's assume I have two patients of tuberculosis, one patient had amazing immunity, the other patient didn't have very good immunity. Am I right in saying that the person who had amazing immunity will kill the TB bacilli and will cause caseous necrosis? Yes. But the person without good immunity, will there be necrosis? Yes or no? There will be no necrosis. So necrotizing caseous necrosis or non caseous necrosis depends on the patient's immunity. This granuloma doesn't have necrosis, Nikuj. I'll come to this sooner. It doesn't, it's based on patient's immunity. So both necrotizing and non-necrotizing granuloma will be seen in tuberculosis, right? Uh, it does have a slipper shaped nuclei and elongated nuclei. That's all right. So whenever you see granuloma in microscopy in any damn question till you are in India, it is tuberculosis only, be it necrotizing or non-necrotizing. So with this concept, I'm going to make you understand a table which you must have memorized till this time. Zero memory is our idea because medicine is so beautiful. It's always beautiful, uh, Shri Vokal, right? Now, now the beauty of medicine is you understand a concept, you have to extrapolate. If you don't extrapolate, there's no concept at all. We will extrapolate for sure. Okay, let's keep like this. It's due to the secretion of protein shraddha, right? Now we have necrotizing granulomas and non-necrotizing granulomas. I'm sure you must have remembered this table. You must have memorized this table, right? You must have definitely memorized this table. Now I'm just going to rephrase it. Can I say, if my body can kill something, there'll be necrosis. Is my statement correct? My body can kill something. Can I say it will have necrosis? Will have necrosis, right? Yes. So here, TB will have necrosis. Can I say, Leprosy is something which my body can kill. Leprosy also my body can kill, right? Especially pure neuritic leprosy. 
can I say my body can kill histoplasmosis? It can. Can I say my body can kill coccidioidomycosis? I'll answer your question, Sri Vokal. Just give me a second. It can. So all of which my body can kill will cause necrotizing randomness. If the person's immunity is not good, again, TB is the first person, even if it's not necrotizing. Now let me ask you, a person has coal workers pneumoconiosis. The person inhales coal into the lung. Can my body kill coal? Coal is already a dead tissue, right? Can I go and kill coal? Can I go and kill silica? Can I go and kill asbestos? I cannot kill asbestos. I cannot kill silica. I cannot kill coal. If I cannot kill something, it produces non-necrotizing granuloma, right? You need not memorize Shubhash. It's any occupational lung disease. I can't kill them. If I can't kill them, it causes non-necrotizing granuloma. Is there anything to kill in uh, your uh, sarcoidosis? Nothing to kill. Is there anything to kill in your Hodgkin's lymphoma? Nothing to kill. Can you kill a suture or a foreign body? Nothing to kill. If I cannot kill, it's going to be non-necrotizing granuloma. Sarcoid, your foreign body granuloma causes non-necrotizing granuloma. Your sarcoid causes non-necrotizing granuloma because there's no organism to kill, right? Your Hodgkin's lymphoma will also cause non-necrotizing granuloma. Again, there's no organism to kill there. So like someone said, Crohn's, again, I have nothing to kill, non-necrotizing granuloma. Like I said, you need not read textbook. You remember something, I cannot kill that, goes to non-necrotizing granuloma, as simple as that. Like Shri Vokal said, I'll go back to the granuloma picture. Just a second. Here, I'm having so many inflammatory cells, right or wrong? I'm having too many inflammatory cells, right? Am I right in saying that these inflammatory cells here, uh, we'll see some sometime later, Keshav, about viral infections. These inflammatory cells here will release free radicals. Lots of free radicals. If it releases lots of free radicals, will it cause host tissue damage? Yes or no? It will definitely cause host tissue damage, right? Now oh, that's, that's what learning medicine is about, right? So when this causes host tissue damage, this will definitely destroy the host. That's why the hallmark of chronic inflammation, right, is tissue destruction. Whenever I destroy a tissue, it will heal. This tissue destruction is secondary healing, not primary healing. Will it form fibrosis? It will form fibrosis with fibrosis. Never ever forget this. This is enough for me to remember many, many things. Tissue destruction, healing by fibrosis. Now, if you remember your medicine or radiology, can I say a TB X-ray will have fibro cavity lesion? Everything comes from here, right? Everything comes from understanding. Fibrosis, destruction is cavity. Fibro cavity in X-ray is suggest of tuberculosis. You know that. It's a chronic inflammation. That's all. If you know chronic inflammation, you know everything. You just, I just want you to understand it. If you understood, that's enough. We can keep on building multiple things here. I have not talked about Jain cells at all. Jain cells are mainly for MCQs. Why I'm saying mainly for MCQs is, I need not always have Langan type of Jain cell. I can have any type of Jain cell in tuberculosis. But when I say Langan, it's for tuberculosis, for an MCQ, that's all, right? So when you have a nucleus, the blue color is nucleus, right? There are multiple nucleus here. When you have a nucleus like this, horseshoe, when you have a nucleus in the form of a U or a horseshoe, I call it Langhans type giant cells. It's a U or a horseshoe shape, it's Langhans type, right? right great. When I have the same arrangement of cells like this, all these are nucleus. I'm sure you can see the blue color in the form of a circle. If it's a circular arrangement, I call them something called as Tuton giant cells. Tuton Jain cells are seen in which condition? It's seen in a condition called as Xanthoma. Now it will e become even more amazing. What is Xanthoma uh, primarily made of? Xanthoma is primarily made of? What is Xanthoma? It's a collection of what? Xanthoma is a collection of? Fat, right? Xanth is fat. It's a collection of lipids, perfect. What's the color of lipid in a biopsy? Lipid is clear, fat is clear. Now go back and look at the Jain cell. I'm sure you must have missed it first time. Can I see fat here? 
Are you seeing fat surrounding the nucleus? Clear vacuoles. So this is definitely xanthoma. So it's not just about the giant cell. It's also the lipid which is surrounding there. It's two-ton giant cell which is xanthoma. Fine. So that's how you can pick up xanthomas and the appearance of the giant cell. Fine. Perfect. Can you see here a foreign body? There's something like a thread going on, right? There's something like a thread going on. So that's a foreign body giant cell. So foreign body giant cell has no particular nuclear arrangement. It will be half a sad. It will be here and there. It doesn't look like a circle or something. If it's half a sadly arranged, half a sad arrangement of nucleus, I'm going to call it foreign body. Actually, this foreign body is nothing but your um, suture. There's a suture material here. That's your foreign body giant cell, right? These are normal things. See, but when you look at a uh, question, like uh, when you look at a uh, question, most of the time they'll ask uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, syndromes, random syndromes. Unfortunately, an exam, at least in India, is not to test a student. I always feel that exam is for the examiners to show off. They like, I diagnose this, that, go and read it. When you become professors, the only motive of an exam is to make sure the student learns, not the student is going to go in depression, which means you are a, the examiner is not a good person. He or she is a saddest. I want you to make sure you learn and I want you to make sure you know the normal things. That's all. But just for an exam, we have few different types of granuloma, which are extremely rare to see in real life. Tuberculosis is the most common granuloma. If my undergraduate can diagnose TB granuloma, more than happy. Right? So this granuloma is stellate granuloma. But examiners want this, right? Unfortunately, exams like, okay, go and read the syndrome. I don't know why they are so much obsessed about syndrome. When I can, when I'm finding difficulty in diagnosing your uh, uh, normal URA and don't know when to give antibiotic, I don't know why, right? So stellate granuloma, this is just for exam. For the stupid examiners, I hope all these guys, when you become examiners, you'll ask normal things which an undergraduate need to know. We'll change it, right? This is seen in cat scratch disease. Okay, perfect. That's seen in cat scratch disease. Right? We have one more granuloma. This is called as a donut shaped granuloma. It looks like a donut, right? A donut shaped granuloma is seen in a disease called as Q fever. Okay, it's Q fever, right? So this donut shaped granuloma is actually very common in two organs. One is liver, the other one is bone marrow. It's common in these two organs, liver and bone marrow, and you see in Q fever. This is purely for exams. Rest everything, every doctor should know how to pick up granuloma because TB is, if I can say, national disease, right? It's there everywhere, right? Uh, stellate because for the person who first saw, it looks like a star. It's an irregular granuloma, that's all. It is not well defined, so it's called stellate granuloma, fine? Okay. Next question. Again, it's an uh, question. It's an IBQ, but I'm not having an image. This is again to reinforce that you can solve a question without image also. Tell me the answer. Diagnosis here is a simple one. 25 year old routine examination, six foot five inches. Early diastolic murmur, some problem here. Perfect. The diagnosis is straightforward here. It's Marfan syndrome. Answer. Autosomal dominant, right? It's a very, very simple thing, right? Arathmia, uh, just give me 10 minutes. You will never ever worry about pedigree, right? Just 10 minutes. Okay. See, pedigree, I have a rule for pedigree. If you cannot solve a pedigree in 10 seconds, the pedigree is wrong, not you are wrong. You are right. 10 seconds is the time required to solve the pedigree if you know how to identify pedigree. If you take more than 10 seconds, skip the question. The pedigree is undoubtedly wrong, right? We are going to learn pedigree. For learning pedigree, there are few rules. These rules are given by Gregor Mendel, the original person, right? So Mendel's rules is what we are going to learn here. See, uh, for learning Mendel's rules, I want few information which I want you guys to know. I'm sure you know that. What does the symbol stand for? Male, female, men, women, however you want to call it, right? Sure, just 10 minutes, you'll definitely master pedigree, right? When there is a family, always the kids are drawn in the second generation, right? 
these are the kits kits are always drawn in a second generation fine if you have solved any pedigree you must have noticed a pedigree will be most of the time in the form of a triangle and just drawing, uh, drawing a random pedigree it will be always in the form of a triangle that's how pedigrees are and if you have noticed that you will see one two three written on the corners or a b and c written on the corners have you noticed them a b and c or one two three right so a b and c or one two three are your generations i just want you to remember this that's all first generation second generation third generation right what does this symbol stand for if i make something black what does it mean can i call them the patient is having a disease yes so in other words can i say the topmost or the first generation here is affected yes perfect so now can i say all the three generations here are affected am i right in saying that all the three generation here are affected yes i just want you to remember this so when i say all generations are affected which means at least one person every generation should be affected now i just remove this in this pedigree now it's all generation affected or not all generations are not affected right all generations are not affected here perfect this understanding is enough for me when i say all generation affected at least one person every generation not the entire generation clear okay now i'll go to the rules of pedigree i have three rules and one rule for your stupid examiners just three rules for to solve every pedigree right and please if you can if you have a pen and paper write these rules so that you remember forever or i'll give the pdf take a screenshot read the day before exam fine so the first rule is always rule out mitochondrial inheritance the reason why i am saying rule out mitochondrial inheritance is mitochondrial is non mendelian inheritance what i said was these are gregor mendel's rule you cannot uh, pick up mitochondrial with these rules first rule out mitochondrial the simplest way to rule out mitochondrial is mitochondrial is maternal inheritance or paternal mothers or fathers mitochondrial is maternal right so if the mom is affected how many percent of the kids will be affected i'll come to that also aditya wait wait a minute if a dad is affected how many percent of the kids will be affected mom affected 100% kids affected that's mitochondrial dad affected 0% kids affected right i'm sure you know this right so if you see a pedigree which is falling with this thing mom 100% kids dad 0% kids it's mitochondrial that's my first rule the second rule for me here is i'm just going to see whether all generations affected or not you have to ask this question ignore that spelling error you have to ask this question whenever you see a pedigree if all generations affected or not if the answer to this is no i am dealing with a recessive disorder okay i have only two recessive disorder that's all in one recessive recessive disorder only men will be affected in the other recessive disorder i'll repeat as such just give me a second both men and women are affected okay which will have only men affected x linked recessive or autosomal recessive which will have only men affected has to be perfect has to be an x linked recessive if it's both men and women it has to be autosomal recessive Ashtosh, I am repeating for once. Now just listen to me. I just have to look at every pedigree. All generations affected or not? If the answer to this is no, I am having a recessive disorder. Then I have to look. Only men are having the disease, or both men and women are having the disease. Only men having the disease, excluding recessive. Both men and women having the disease, autosomal recessive. Simple. That's the first thing. Second. Okay. Again, same question. All generations affected or not? if the answer to this question is yes i am dealing with a dominant inheritance see dominant inheritance has two things two questions not one question the first question i am going to ask is is there a dad to son transmission 
okay listen carefully to what i'm going to say and then answer but i want everyone listening to this to answer this let's assume i am having an x linked dominant disorder which means my x chromosome is abnormal and i'm going to give birth to a son if i have to give birth to a son i have to give my y chromosome then only the zygote will become a male zygote right so is there any possibility as a father when i have a x linked dominant disorder i will transmit that to the son yes or no ranjana monocytes in the blood in tissue it's always macrophage is there is any possibility i will transmit to son definitely no perfect if the if there is no dad to son transmission if the answer to this is no you are thinking of an x linked dominant disorder like i said it's not with one question i have two questions here right if the answer to this is no i am probably dealing with an x linked dominant disorder probably right next is next question what i had to ask is dad is affected then 100% daughters are affected again i am going to ask you a simple question same thing i am having an x linked dominant disorder i have an affected x chromosome i am going to give birth to a daughter if i have to form a female zygote i have to give my x chromosome so can i say if i have a x linked dominant disorder how much ever girl babies is going to come from me will always have the disease because to form a girl baby i have to give my affected x chromosome right yes so it will have a disease so if the answer to this is yes if all 100% daughters are affected the simple thing is it's x linked dominant disorder if the answer to this is no if the answer to this is no it's an autosomal dominant disorder i will repeat this flow chart again right i'll repeat this flow chart the best part is when you apply i told 10 seconds right it will take less than 10 seconds right if all generation are affected if the answer to that is yes i am dealing with a dominant disorder the next question is is there a dad to son transmission if the answer to this is no probably an x linked dominant disorder the next question is when the dad is affected all 100% daughters are affected if the answer to this is yes which means i am it is confirmed an x linked dominant if the answer to this is no it's a confirmed autosomal dominant disorder right okay akash if you're not understanding something tell me i'll reply for sure okay that's how it is fine just it's a little bit of barrier we'll definitely get through it okay perfect like i said there are only three rules for a normal person to understand pedigree but unfortunately we are sitting for neat pg exam sadistic examiners right i have to know about wiling disorders also this came once in inict i'll tell you why i did not know wiling disorder I'll tell you why I need not know Y-link disorder. Y-link is otherwise called as whole andric. Andric is men, whole is entire, right? Whole is entire and andric is men. If every male is affected, and if only men are affected in the pedigree, no female at all, then it is an Y-link disorder, right? Then it is an Y-link disorder. The reason why I said it's not required is there are two common wilding disorder. One is excess growth of hair in the ear. Do you go to a doctor or you go to a barber shop? You shave it off. No one is going to say, let me do a genetic analysis and see what's happening, why the hair is growing. The second common disease of wilding disorder is your azuspermia. Right? Azuspermia. In azuspermia, there'll be no family to draw a pedigree. I need not worry about it. But still, your examiners ask this pedigree in an exam. Uh, please don't become like them, right? Please never become like them. This is not required for an undergraduate. The first three is required for undergraduate, right? I hope you have written it down. We'll now look at pedigrees and we'll see if we can solve it. Fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, put your fingers on your keyboard. I want you to answer quickly. All generations in this pedigree affected or not? It's simple. All generations are affected, right? All are affected. Then I'm going to think of a dominant disorder. The second question in dominant disorders, is there a dad to son transmission? There's a dad, no son transmission. There's a dad, no son transmission. If there is no dad to son transmission, probably not finalized, probably an X-linked dominant disorder. 
The next question was, whenever the dad was affected, is all 100% of the daughters affected? The dad is affected, is 100% daughters affected or not? No, 100% daughters are not affected. So the second question answer is no means my diagnosis autosomal dominant disorder. This is the most difficult pedigree you will get. This also you can finish in 10 seconds. If I know what I am doing, you can diagnose in 10 seconds, that's all. Answer is simple, it's an autosomal dominant disorder. Like I said, for dominant pedigree, don't go with the first answer. Both the questions should be answered. Only then you have to go to the answer, fine. Next pedigree. Again, it will take only 10 seconds, fine. All generations affected or not? No. The first generation is not affected. So it's a recessive disorder, right? Both men and women or only men? Both men and women. So it's an autosomal recessive disorder. 10 seconds. That's all. It will be only 10 seconds, right? Just simple. It's autosomal recessive disorder, right? Next question. All generations affected or not? Not affected. So it's a recessive disorder. Only men or both men and women? It is only men. So it's an X-link recessive disorder. That's all. And it's 10 seconds. It should be done in 10 seconds. If it's not done in 10 seconds, you are right. The examiner is wrong. Be super confident, right? Next. All generation affected or not? No. Dominant or recessive? Recessive. So both men and men, women or only men? Both men and women. So it is autosomal recessive, right? Okay. Amazing. So this is where we will make a mistake when you don't follow the rules. What was the first rule? I want you to make a mistake. Make a mistake. We will learn for sure. What's the first rule of the pedigree analysis? Look for mitochondrial inheritance. If you miss the first rule and if you follow the flow chart, you will make mistakes. Don't skip rules. Don't skip steps. Mom affected. 100% daughters affected, dad affected, none affected, mom affected, 100% daughters affected. Now tell it loud and clear, what's the inheritance? It is mitochondrial inheritance, perfect. So never ever skip rules, it's always the first thing I have to rule out is mitochondrial. Please don't skip rules, if you skip rules, you will end up wrong. The first, like uh, just achieve the way to diagnose mitochondria is look at the mom and dad. Mom, everyone, dad, none. That's the only thing to pick up mitochondria inheritance. Fine. Okay. Perfect. Now tell me how many of you can confidently diagnose all the pedigree in less than 10 seconds. I hope you can. Like I said, uh, read the rules the day before the exam. I hope pedigree comes in the exam. You will smile. It will cheer up your mood. You will know that you have got a one right answer. And then entire exam will change from that time. Fine. You will definitely know it, but read the day before the exam. Right. Perfect. So one part of genetics is more or less sorted. Right. Great. Okay. We'll go to the next question. Right. We'll go to the next question. Ah, amazing. Just as you. Someone asked me this. Right. How do I remember disorders? You must have definitely remembered mnemonics for disorder. Right. I'll go with logic again. Uh, see, logic any day supersedes memory. Logic any day supersedes memory, fine. For an autosomal dominant disorder, there are few clues. Every cancer syndrome will be dominant. You tell any cancer syndromes, right? Any cancer syndrome, neurofibromatosis, tuberous sclerosis, pute Jagger syndrome, FAP, any damn cancer syndrome will be dominant only. Retinoblastoma, leaf Romney syndrome, that's one. So taken care of, taken care of. Polycystic kidney disease, structural protein and polycystic kidney disease presence in early age group or later in life. Autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease presents early in life or later in life. Later in life. Almost every dominant disorder presents late in life. That's second clue. Right? If there's a late presentation, it has to be a dominant disorder. Marfan's presence late. Egla Dunlop's presence late. ADPKD present late. That's a clue. I can take care of this. Familial adenomatous polyposis, cancer syndrome. Late presentation. Von Willebrand, late presentation. You must have read that it presents in pregnancy. Late presentation. Marfan's late presentation. Late presentation. Osteogenes imperfecta, it's structural protein. That's a third clue. Right? 
achondroplasia structural protein there are only three things i want you to remember in to for any auto any dominant disorder every cancer syndrome is dominant any genetic disease which has a late presentation is dominant if a mutation is in structural protein like collagen dominant disorder right so these are three cardinal rules to remember dominant disorder don't try to memorize it's impossible to memorize 19 subjects i have a very tiny place for memory and there are lots of personal things to remember as well right why to waste that we'll go with logic here uh duchenne's muscular dystrophy is an excellent excellent recessive disorder right now we'll i'll come to it it's a good question it's a sarcolemmal protein right it's an excellent recessive disorder see there are few diseases you already know the inheritance because you must have read the disease in detail so that will not come to this if there's an unknown syndrome coming use these to easily solve them right that's one second we'll go for recessive again these are tables from your robins again i'm uh, telling an easy way to remember that's all uh, bgs cancer syndrome means like neurofibromatosis one hippel lendo braca syndromes all these are cancer syndromes fine okay ar the first clue is congenital if it presents at birth it has to be recessive all inborn errors of metabolism is recessive i'm not saying autosomal recessive autosomal or x-linked recessive every inborn number of metabolism is recessive anything with an enzyme defect will be and should be recessive uh, rpr polystic kidney disease is autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive autosomal recessive presents at birth so it is recessive right okay that's so if you know a disease which has carrier state I'm sure you, you know few diseases with carrier state, right? Sickle cell anemia, carrier state is there. Thalassemia, carrier state is there. Can I call it recessive? Recessive. Autosomal or X-linked, we will we'll know when we read the disease, that's all. Right? So, again, enzyme, 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 enzyme. This are recessive, not primarily enzymes. But when we read Wilson's and hemochromatosis, in that chapter, you will first read it is recessive. Sickle and thalassemia, do they have carrier state? They do. Enzyme. Enzyme. We can solve everything. Remember this. Remember the three things. Present at birth, enzyme defect, carrier state. These are clues for recessive disorder. See, because I am not saying mnemonics are bad, but when you create a new mnemonic for an exam, you will forget. The mnemonic should be read from MBBS time. Like Those things you will remember. Sister Louis powder face often attracts medical students. Those things you'll remember. Other things is a bit difficult to remember. So try to go with logic. Remember this and try to apply this logic whenever you see a disease. You'll be right most of the time. Fine. That's one of the clues to remember dominant and recessive disorders. Fine. We'll go to the next question. Next is a very simple question. But it confuses sometimes. We'll get rid of the confusion in the easiest way possible. Come on to answer. It's a very simple question. I'm sure everyone will answer this. Harjap, it will be there on PW soon. It's a very, very simple one, right? It doesn't require time at all. It's classical case of an Angelman syndrome. It's imprinting disorder. Angelman and Prada Valley are classical imprinting disorder, right? I'm sure Angelman Prada Valley, you will be wonder like which is maternal, which is paternal. I'm going to tell you a story, which is not my story, which is one of my students' story. His name is Dr. Nishant. So first, thanks to Dr. Nishant. Right, because you should not steal other person's work. So thanks to him. And with his permission, I am telling to everyone whomever I am teaching. Fine. It's a very simple way to remember. This is his story. What he told was, there's an angel. It's a girl who was five, 15 years old. Okay. She was living with mom and dad. Mom and dad kind of had a fight. And unfortunately, angel's mom and dad got a divorce. Angel is 15 year old. Right. Where do you think uh, Angel, who do you think Angel will go to, mom or dad? I'll do it, Katie. Angel obviously stay with mom, right? Since Mega series also teaches medicine. She's a minor, so obviously he's going to be with mom. Sarika, I'll definitely do hemat after finishing this. Okay, so Angel stays with mom and they were completely happy. One unfortunate day, Angel's mom dies. So Angel went in search of a man. 
an angel married a man and they became a syndrome what do you think about marriage happy or sad marriage is happy or sad if you have opinion i'll ask you if you're married or not if you say marriage is happy angel man syndrome classical symptom is laughter they are called as happy puppets right if you say marriage is sad if you say marriage is sad they laugh without a reason that is sad right they laugh without a reason maybe i am not sure if you have seen the movie joker right if you see in the movie joker joker laughs without any reason maybe he is suffering from angel man syndrome who knows right so they are called a laughing puppets and they laugh without a reason which is that now this was a story which nishant said and the way he linked the story with angel man syndrome is absolute beauty like someone said the 15 years is for chromosome 15 right angel where do you see angel <laughs> good one harpach where do you see angel angels and god are ubiquitous right angels and god are definitely ubiquitous when it's ubiquitous which means present everywhere the gene involved in angel man syndrome is ubiquitin 3a that's also linked with angel like angel and god is present everywhere that's what our parents would have taught when we are young the gene is ubiquitin 3a it is present everywhere angel dad got a divorce after the divorce still angel and the mom was very happy right there's no problem there's no syndrome at all so in other words this ubiquitin 3a in you me and in every human being one gene or the father's gene will be silenced someone asked me what does imprinting mean imprinting is not a disease imprinting is normal that's all and imprinting is normal sumit it will come out soon wait for a month right imprinting is a normal process of silencing your mom's dad's gene of ubiquitin 3a will be silenced mine every damn human beings dad's gene will be silenced so what what is the only functional gene copy i have mom's or dad's i have only one functional gene copy which is from the mother and when did angel became angel man syndrome when the mom died so the pathogenesis here is it's simple when there is an maternal copy deletion or the mom's copy deletion because mom's is the only copy i have and when there is maternal copy deletion can i say there will be an angelman syndrome yes only one copy i had that also is gone so there is a disease angelman syndrome this is the most common type of pathogenesis there is one more type of pathogenesis as well so let's take chromosome 15 we all know that we have two copies of chromosome 15 one comes from the mom one comes from the dad right i am sure all of us know this one from the mother one from the father if by mistake if both the copies comes from the dad right by an error if both the copies of chromosome 15 ends up from the dad what do you think will happen to ubiquitin 3a gene am i right in saying that if both the copies comes from the dad both will be silenced yes or no both will be silenced right because whatever comes from the father will be silenced so will there be any functional ubiquitin 3a in that condition no functional ubiquitin 3a right will it cause angelman syndrome it will cause angelman syndrome so this i am going to write it as two chromosomes from the same parent i am going to write it uni parental uni is single parental two chromosomes two for di so me for chromosomes that's all it's uni parental disomy so tell me after listening carefully in angelman syndrome it is maternal mom's disomy or paternal dad's disomy mom or dad this is a question to you uni parental disomy in case of angelman is paternal or maternal m or p it has to be paternal perfect so if it causes paternal disomy right it cause a paternal disomy it will also result in angelman syndrome perfect i'll just erase this for a second because we have two disease right and the symptom is happy puppets happy puppets inappropriate laughter the classical symptom the other disease is prader willi prader willi is exactly opposite prader willi also is chromosome 15 
the gene is alone changed little bit we have a gene called as snurp gene in prada valley this snurp gene mother's copy will be silenced or imprinted which is normal so when do you think you'll have pathogenesis when there is dad's copy deletion so it is paternal deletion and now listen carefully and answer what disomy maternal or paternal disomy it will be maternal disomy okay and the classical symptom for prada beliefs one prada belly increases ghrelin what does ghrelin do i think every every one of us have lots of ghrelin in our body that's why i'm sure you'll have too much of hunger now right ghrelin increases hunger right there will be hyperphagia they'll eat a lot they'll eat keep on eating a lot because of that prader belly syndrome is a classical symptom of childhood obesity that's one of the symptoms which end up in childhood obesity okay so thank nishant as a beautiful story and a easier way to link prader belly and angel man right so it's angel man angel 15 years diverse lived with the mom after the mom died it became angel man syndrome right so that's how you remember angel man and prader belly and both are classical imprinting disorder imprinting is non mendelian prime nucleotide repeat is non mendelian right and your mosaic is non mendelian mitochondrial is non mendelian these are the four non mendelian inheritances fine so that's one more question from your genetics let's go to the next one um okay this is a bit, bit difficult question uh, this is actually from a real life so let's see if you can pick it up which one arithmia yeah okay someone answers correctly uh, i'll give you chocolate i cannot give you chocolate this is not a real class maybe i'll give you some gift a book poor writes the first answer okay vigneshwaran has given the first answer uh, great vigneshwaran since you are given the first answer and that's the right answer as well uh, contact me later i'll definitely give you a book okay great now let's learn this see this i like i said it's a very difficult question right so this neutrophil here right this neutrophil here this tiny guy can you see a tiny uh, projection of the neutrophil that's called as a drumstick appearance it looks like a drumstick the musical instrument drumstick or it's called as a davidson body okay davidson body is the equivalent of bar body what is bar body i'm sure bar body many people will know here what is bar body i'm sure you know bar body what is bar body bar body bar body is seen in men or women it's seen in females right the extra x chromosome will be silenced and becomes an heterochromatin which is nothing but the bar body right so we'll just look at the bar body and then we'll come back to this question so bar body is nothing but it's the extra x chromosome in women generally what happens the genotype is it's 46 xx and in men it's 46 xy by nature i cannot have one gender which has two x chromosomes and they are anyway over performing right and don't worry girls y chromosome does nothing it just gives two things just is obviously excess growth of hair is from y chromosome baldness is from y chromosome so by nature what happens is the extra x chromosome of the women will be silenced okay let's try to integrate it to your uh, biochemistry what is the mechanism of silencing if you have to tell a chemical mechanism which mechanism silences methylation or acetylation which mechanism silences it's methylation right so there'll be methylation happening an epigenetic alteration which silences the extra x chromosome so that that silenced extra x chromosome will be condensed and will be seen close to the nucleus that's called as a bar body okay so male should have a bar body or not will men have bar body because men's genotype is 46 xy will men have bar body they won't because i have only one x chromosome and i cannot silence it right so only women will have bar body 
and the equivalent of that is your Davidson body that also will be seen only in women. Now with this information, let's go back to the question. 22 year old male presents for routine checkup and there is a Davidson body. Now tell me, is a male having a bar body? So this male should have one X chromosome or two X chromosome? This male should have one X chromosome or two X chromosome? Should have two X chromosome, right? So can I say the genotype of this male is 47 X X Y? Perfect. Now answer. Now the answer is Kleinfelter syndrome, right? So this one of my professors diagnosed Kleinfelter syndrome using peripheral smear. I, uh, so thanks to him, uh, we had amazing professors. I'm just transferring whatever they taught me to you. That's all. Knowledge should be transferred. Knowledge should never be with you. Always transfer it to your juniors. That's how you grow as well. So bad body, I can have few questions regarding it. We'll just rephrase this question and I'll ask you something. Internal syndrome. Turners is men or women? Turners are girls, right? Turner syndrome are seen in girls, women, and a patient with Turner syndrome, will there be a bar body or not? Perfect. There will be no bar body. Turners are female and there will be no bar body. So if I have a question saying that it's a woman with no bar body, I will tell it's a Turner woman because Turner is monosomy X, right? It's 45 X. So only one X chromosome. So it is not right. Aditya, the drumstick here is equivalent for the bar body seen in neutrophil. So it's a male patient with a bar body or Davidson body, which means this male should have two X chromosome, obviously the Y chromosome, which makes us 47 XXY. That's your genotype for Kleinfelter syndrome. Fine. Great. Okay. We go to the next question. Comment. Quick, fast finger first. A young pap smear was, adult pap smear was evaluated. Microscopy shows pleomorphism, hyperchromatic cells, and the all layers of ep epidermis with disordered growth. Which of the following is the diagnosis? Most of the, almost every question here are PYQs. That's great, right? It's a very, very simple one, dysplasia, right? I'm going to discuss about dysplasia. I'm sure you know the question. I know, I'm sure you know the answer. We'll discuss what is dysplasia. What I'm going to discuss in the next few minutes is the finding for almost every cancer in my body, right? Every cancer's microscopy. There are only four findings, just four findings. Remember this four, we can remember everything. The first one is pleomorphism. Like I always used to say, everything is in the name. Pleo means multiple, morphism means morphology, right? Pleomorphism is nothing but variation in size and shape of the cell. That's what pleomorphism is, right? It's a very, very simple one, right? Second one. What cell do you think this is? Comment below. What cell do you think this is? Perfect. It's a neutrophil, right? It's a classical neutrophil. So neutrophil, if you can identify my neutrophil, you can definitely identify a patient's neutrophil. When this neutrophil becomes cancerous, it will end up in forming a blast. You generally must have drawn blast like this, right? A big nucleus. Now comparing these two, there's a normal neutrophil and there's a blast. So like tropical Capricorn and Arindam said, can I say the blast, which is the neoplastic cell here, has more nucleus. Yes, that's my second thing. A high NC ratio. Again, one question to you guys. What will be the color of nucleus in a biopsy? Pink or blue? Color of nucleus in a biopsy. It's blue in color. So keep this as a clue. Anything which is blue in color, completely blue in color, has more chance of being a cancer. Because every cancer, almost every cancer will have a high NC ratio here. Right? Okay, third one. Third one is about mitosis. There are two things in mitosis for me. There'll be both increase in the number of mitosis and there'll be atypical mitosis. Right? There are both increase in number as well as atypical mitosis. Both are important for me, right? Both. I'll discuss about what does atypical mitosis mean. Just give me some second. The fourth one here is loss of polarity. Okay. Loss of polarity also is important for me, right? These are the four things here. Okay. 
can anyone tell me quickly what are the stages of cell division or mitosis there are four phases right prophase do, do you guys remember that prophase metaphase anaphase telophase do you guys remember that how many of you remember prophase metaphase anaphase telophase quite a few of you guys will remember that right when did you read that in your school right you must have read that in your 8th 9th 10th standard right perfect so why it asked this was don't blame your memory if you can remember something what you read in school days and if you're forgetting what you read last month the problem is in mbbs i didn't read that's why i am not remembering it let's be very frank that's all if you read you will remember in school days you read in college you didn't read accept it then put effort and read you will definitely remember every person's memory is impeccable if you're a human being the most advanced brain what we have and is definitely will hold things if you can remember school days please put hard work you will remember whatever you read in mbbs as well let's come back to this let's come back to this fine okay like you guys said prophase metaphase telophase anaphase right every cell divides to two new cells so this is a mitotic figure like someone i was saying about mitotic figure if i look at this cell can i say this cell is being divided into two directions yes the cell divides into two directions right this is called a bipolar mitosis bipolar is normal because that's how it is right bipolar is normal okay it's a normal mitotic figure here i'll show you one more image here it goes to three different directions right it goes to three different directions okay uh, sumit ping me on uh, telegram or instagram scrafali bengali uh, tell me how to make it interesting i'll definitely make it interesting for you this is a tripolar mitosis if you look at this one it goes to five different directions can i say it's abnormal multipolar mitosis so any mitosis which is not bipolar is a typical mitotic figure if it is not bipolar it's a typical mitotic figure as simple as that right so we know about mitotic figure and your bi bipolar mitotic figure fine so okay then right okay next one tell me again i want you guys to comment what tissue is this it's a very simple one it's a very simple one what tissue is this what is use this stratified squamous epithelium skin perfect right uh, you guys are beautiful right why are you guys worried you will definitely clear the exam what layer is this this is stratum the topmost layer is stratum corneum the bottommost layer is stratum basale i'm going to ask you one more question stratum corneum is nucleated or not a normal stratum corneum is nucleated or not stratum corneum does not have nucleus right perfect so can you see the topmost layer here is actually pink in color it's entirely pink in color because it doesn't have a nucleus there's tiny little bit of blue thing i'll come back to that soon generally it's completely pink so it's has no nucleus okay the bottommost layer stratum basale should have a nucleus right and they are blue in color because nucleus is blue in color and they have nucleus so what happens in a normal skin is when a cell from stratum basale goes to the top it becomes a nucleate right so this is normal polarity it should lose its nucleus that's the normal polarity of skin so whenever it goes on the top it will lose its nucleus so this is how a normal skin looks i will show you one more skin you just tell me the topmost stratum corneum is having a nucleus or not this is one more skin biopsy this is the topmost layer stratum corneum do they have nucleus or not simple comment do they have nucleus they do have nucleus right so can i call this loss of polarity i am not using the para keratosis i am calling loss of polarity Jane, I'll uh, explain it sometimes later. I'm going to call it loss of polarity. Right? Perfect. Great. What do you think this is? 
I'll tell why I'll not call it parakeratosis. I'll tell soon. That's a mitotic figure, right? Perfect. That's a classical, uh, normal mitotic figure or an atypical mitotic figure. That's definitely an atypical mitotic figure, right? Perfect. So I'm having loss of polaris, polarity and atypical mitotic figure. This one, can I say that this nucleus is definitely very big or an high NC ratio? I do have cells with very huge nuclei, right? There is high NC ratio here. There is definitely high NC ratio here, right? Third, so can I also say, comparing this cell, this cell and this cell, there is pleomorphism. There is pleomorphism, right? Perfect. I'll just zoom out this image. In this image, I'm having loss of polarity, high NC ratio, pleomorphism and atypical mitotic figure. This biopsy is normal or abnormal? This biopsy is normal or abnormal? It's undoubtedly abnormal, right? Now let's name it. Naming is the beauty here. You need not read it. You will name it. You will understand the disease. Abnormal swallowing is dysphagia. Abnormal breathing is dyspnea. Abnormal menstruation is dysmenorrhea. So abnormal growth is dysplasia. It's as simple as that. It's abnormal growth, that's all. This means abnormal. Dystrophic calcification, abnormal. I didn't call it a carcinoma here. It's just dysplastic. To call it a carcinoma, I need one important thing. You need basement membrane breach or invasion. We have a basement membrane invasion. Definitely it is dysplastic, right? That definitely is neoplastic or it becomes a cancer. Okay. BGS, loss of polarities, a normal skin, stratum corneum should be anucleate. If it is, has a nucleus, I call it loss of polarity. I can call it parakeratosis also, but I will call it parakeratosis in a non-neoplastic disease like psoriasis, non-neoplastic. In a cancer, I use the term loss of polarity. Both mean the same thing, stratum corneum having nucleus, that's all. Fine. Got it? Great. Super. How many of you want to become surgeons? This is something which is a practical thing, might not come a neat exam, but I want every surgeon to know this. How many of you want to become surgeons? Say yes, me or thing. Let's say I'm having a skin lesion here, a squamous cell carcinoma here, right? All of you who want to become surgeons will become surgeons, right? All the best from my side. So this is squamous cell carcinoma, right? So when you take a biopsy, if you take from this part biopsy, Will I be able to see a basement membrane? Yes or no? If you take from the top, can you appreciate the basement membrane? Yes or no? No, you can't, right? That's why always it's right. mentioned that biopsy should always free from the edge of the lesion. If you take from the top, I can see dysplasia. I cannot comment on invasion. I will give only dyspatia. Only when you take here, I will see normal as well as abnormal. I can look at the invasion and I can give that correct diagnosis. So for all future surgeons, take biopsy from the corner. If you don't do that, I will report dyspatia only. Right? I'll definitely report dyspatia. I said, don't worry. You, you have done, you have read very well and you will definitely do well in your exam. Right? Why I'm saying this is, if I over-diagnose, the entire management changes, right? Biopsy should always free from the junction. That's why every surgeon in future, I want you to do this, fine? Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, do you guys want to have your dinner or can we complete this question and then we have dinner? It's 8.30, I didn't look at the time. It's up to you guys. Question or dinner? One person for continue. Okay, since no one has replied, I'm going to go with whatever Oki, Okawa said. Okay, great. I'll complete this question because this is an amazing question. It's also related to dinner, right? Super. Why do neoplastic cells need Warburg's effect? We look at this answer after we discuss about neoplast after we discuss about Warburg's effect, right? Amazing. Thanks for the interest. We'll definitely complete this question, fine. Okay, just this question on Alicia, fine. So Warburg is a superb, superhuman. He got Nobel Prize for the Warburg's effect, right? 
but warburg in his autobiography said that people called me uh, people laughed at me when i presented warburg's effort to a group of scientists that's what warburg originally said in his autobiography so why people laughed at him was what warburg said was a tumor cell can consume only glucose see this is not a concern for me he said that a tumor cell cannot consume galactose cannot consume lactose cannot consume fructose he said tumor cells can consume only glucose that's not the concern what he said was tumor cells consume glucose like ansaf said only by aerobic glycolysis it does only by aerobic glycolysis and he said not to electron transport chain because if you remember biochemistry i eat a molecule of glucose glycolytic pathway citric acid cycle then your electron transport chain right that's how it goes if a molecule of glucose goes through the entire pathway how many atp will electron transport chain give approximately approximately i don't know the exact number you should know the exact number i'll put more than 30 some random number right more than 30 atp glycolytic pathway i think it gives two stuff substrate level phosphorylation i don't know exactly but i will definitely say less atps you know the exact number you fill in the blanks fine so now tell me if you are a logical tumor cell which is extremely fastly growing you want more atp or less atp more atp or less atp you want more atp right that's logical but what warburg said was it takes less atp that's all uh, yeah anjali it takes less atp right so warburg said that tumor cell will consume lesser atp so what happens is the by product the by product of the glycolysis the end product of the glycolysis goes to the the carbon in the end product of glycolysis through a group of metabolisms it converts to nitrogen so warburg came back and explained i'm going to ask you a same question warburg asked to the same group of scientists for a cancer cell which divides very fastly you need dna rna or atp which is more important dna rna is more important right the intermediates will give me nucleic acid because my food is not predominantly made of nitrogen my food does not have major quantity of protein with whatever food we eat carbohydrate is more i will grow i will not divide more so the tumor cells modulated that it changed in a way that it will give more dna rna which helps cell division tumor cells are simply amazing they know our food so it changed that and produced dna rna and it took with cell division and there's a gene it's called as myc gene myc proto onco gene which controls warburg effect okay which controls the entire warburg effect now let's take a detour see this is what about warburg effect we'll go back to the question soon there's an amazing concept here it will definitely give you chills let's assume there's one random cancer okay there's a random cancer which has got mutation of this myc gene right there's an myc gain there's a gain of function mutation I'm right in saying that this tumor, which has MVC gain of function mutation, will have more Warburg effect or less Warburg effect. Undoubtedly, more Warburg effect, right? When there's more Warburg effect, can I say there'll be more and more and more cell division? True, more and more and more cell division, right? Perfect. When there's more and more and more cell division, can I also say the amount of cells which are dying also will be more? Compare India and USA. my population is huge so the number of dead people will definitely be huge right so whenever there is more and more and more cell division there will be more and more and more dead cells who will eat the dead cells we know a guy we know a guy who eats the dead cells who is that macrophage right macrophage eat dead cells we just know red cancer cells about the four feeds of dysplasia what do you think will be the color of tumor cells pink or blue high and c ratio pink or blue cancer cell will definitely be blue in color right perfect let's let's talk this like this is a blue color cancer cell background and macrophage what's the color of macrophage color of macrophages 
white because it's made of lipid foam cells beauty right what's his appearance called as starry sky appearance the starry sky appearance of Burkitt's lymphoma is due to the pathogenesis but this should not excite you at all starry sky appearance should excite a second year mbba students you are a doctor right you once you clear clear second year starry sky is not important at all what is important is only one person who's patient my only concern is patience that's all so i'm having extremely high cell division extremely high cell division good for me or bad for me good prognosis bad prognosis good or bad good or bad both good as well as bad because See, yesterday, just yesterday, Dr. Ankit talked about uh, pharmacology, right? Dr. Ankit talked about pharmacology. I'm just going to ask a question. It's bad because it will spread. That's one, right? In pharmacology, in chemotherapy drugs, a chemotherapy will act on a resting cell or a dividing cell. In this Burkitt's lymphoma, the cell division is 100%, right? The cell division in Burkitt's lymphoma is 100%. Okay? So when I give chemotherapy to this patient, you must have read lots of chemotherapy drugs yesterday, right? Can I say all the hundred percent cells will be dead because chemotherapy agents always work on a dividing cell only. Textbooks say Burkitt's lymphoma melts with chemotherapy. It literally melts. Every cell in Burkitt's lymphoma will die. But I should not be happy. I'm going to have millions and millions of cells dying at the same time. That's a concern for me. What's the most common ion inside a cell? We'll go to physiology. Tell me normal. There's no pressure at all. The most common ion inside a cell. Potassium, right? So when millions of cells dies, I will end up in. Potassium will come outside. I'll end up in hyperkalemia. There are two buffers for us. There are two buffers for us. Phosphate buffer, bicarbonate buffer, protein buffer. Leave protein, phosphate and bicarbonate. When phosphate comes outside, it will result in hyperphosphatemia. Phosphate binds to calcium. So what will happen to the levels of calcium? Reduced or elevated? It will result in hypocalcemia. It will become less. When bicarbonate comes outside, right? it will cause acid-base disturbances. Otherwise, I'm killing millions of cells. I'm killing lots of purines and pyrimidines. The breakdown product of purine, uric acid, it result in hyperuricemia. Like many of them were saying, all these encompass tumor lysis syndrome. That's an MCQ here. The problem with most of us is, we try to memorize all this hyper hypo you will forget because there's one hypo three hyper a very good source for mcq don't memorize you know normal you will know normal normal potassium comes outside normal phosphate comes outside phosphate binds to calcium it will become low bicarbonate comes outside uric acid comes outside that's how tumor lysis syndrome is form an algorithm once you form an algorithm you will not forget but it's tumor right one cell is dying if one cell dies also i can tell what it is if thousand cells dies also i can tell what it is right that's tumor lysis syndrome so starry sky is not going to excite you chemotherapy is not going to excite you if you want to be an amazing doctor make sure you can handle hyperkalemia you can handle hypocalcemia because those will cause arrhythmias and will cause heart block that's my major concern rest of them is not my concern at all right so all these are related to warburg's effect now, let's give a different outlook about Warburg's effect. Far from your textbooks. Medicine is a lifestyle. You have to learn it, you have to live it. Right? How many of your grandparents used to fast? How many of your grandparents used to fast? Quite a few. My grandparents used to fast. My mom, occasionally. My grand mom and granddad used to fast for sure. When my grandmom used to fast, she never used to eat rice and chapatis. 
but she used to eat fruits and milk i don't even know which god doesn't want rice and chapatis but can is allowed to eat fruit and milk right i don't know but i'm not sure if my forefathers if my forefathers thousands of years back knew warburg's effect and knew that a tumor cell consumes glyc glucose so fast in a week when you fast a week one one day in a week or once in 15 days without glucose for 12 hours it will kill tumor cells that's the basis of intermittent fasting which became a fad in 2021 i don't know if my forefathers know it knew it hostel we fast because food is not good right so i'm not sure if my forefathers knew it but in 2020 harvard university said that intermittent fasting will reduce the proliferation of tumor cells after that every instagram influencer became a doctor if you have lived 20 years watchfully you know everything in science because i always believe science originated from india and china that's all just india and china in your blood there is science in your way of living there is science your mom must have told don't go outside in the sun it will make you black it will make you dark that is science because uv rays cause inflammation it is science everything here is science don't be worried about a stupid exam exam should not stop you exam is just a passing cloud exam is like a mosquito the knowledge what you have is like an ak47 don't hit the exam with the entire knowledge squash the exam and go away right that's more than enough right now let's go back to the question and we'll break for break uh, food as well after talking about not eating food we'll go and have a dinner right neoplastic cells utilize warburg's effect because it forms metabolic intermediates which are needed for cell growth the dna and rna right okay well, i want to ask about the i actually want to tell about the mosquitoes how many of you like psm no one likes psm right because they ask the flying range of mosquitoes and everything right the flying range of mosquito is actually required because aedes mosquito is where flying range comes as a question the reason why aedes mosquito flying range comes as a question is aedes mosquito transmits yellow fever in india we don't have yellow fever so only when i know the flying range of aedes mosquito i will make sure all the international airports five or 10 times the flying range there is no mosquito to know that i need to know the net lawn size the size of the net lawn so that aedes mosquito doesn't come inside that's how deep psm is right so we we'll learn psm we we'll learn medicine the way it has to be learned and we will definitely uh, do it uh, superbly uh, in short aditya warburg is tumors can consume only glucose tumors consume glucose only by aerobic glycolysis the end product will definitely go into your the carbon will be consumed into nitrogen abhijit if you don't understand anything ask me i'll definitely uh, tell it slow and i'll repeat it fine okay dna and rna that will be used to helping cell division that's all fine okay clear aditya okay it's 8:47 we already almost 20 minutes past our uh, timeline uh, we'll break can we start around 9 is that okay can we reduce the break little bit by 3 4 minutes done go have your dinner i'll also have, grab something to eat and i'll come back and meet you by 9 right we'll read many many things about pathology more right thank you thank you for your time i'll start exactly sharp at 9 see you for, till then Okay, thank you. Dinner time. Class up to uh, whenever I will I will finish it. Okay, synapse. We'll discuss soon. Okay, bye bye. Thank you for your time.
Hey guys, can you hear me? If so, say yes. Uh, Subhash, tomorrow will be forensic medicine. Uh, yes, PJS, I'll try to cover leukemia and a little bit of lymphoma as well. Thank you for your comments. Hope I'm audible. Great. Uh, so let's start. I hope you guys have your dinner. If not, uh, take your dinner and we'll eat to, uh, you eat and we'll discuss and definitely we'll do it. Uh, my iPad is not properly tuned. That's why a black flash. Fine. Okay, let's start. So factory worker presented to the clinic with history of fatigue and multiple infections in the past year. He was evaluated. And what do you think is the answer? Uh, Junaid, uh, books are primary added with notes. Great. Uh, this was a PYQ. If you remember last time when the NEET exam got over, there's lots of confusion whether it was benzene or benzidine, right? It's huge amount of confusion. Some of them told benzene, some of them told benzidine, right? The problem uh, in this question is, it's not about benzene, benzidine. Don't worry about it. See, benzene or benzidine doesn't matter for me. It's a fact. Don't read with facts. Look at the history. Do you think bladder or skin or lungs will present with the history of fatigue or multiple infection in the past year? Do you think history suits bladder cancer or skin cancer or lung cancer? It doesn't, right? I don't want to know about the fact here at all. History of fatigue and multiple infections kind of says that there's anemia and your leukopenia. Anemia, leukopenia, cytopenia is a finding seen in blood cancer only. So you go with that. You always go with the history. See, as MBB students, you guys are very, very strong in history. No one in this world is strong in facts. Right? So don't go with the fact. Go with the history. That's much more easier and you will not make a mistake in future questions also, right? But yes, if it is benzene, it is definitely a blood cancer. Benzidine, it will be a bladder cancer, fine? So this question is for your carcinogens and we'll have a quick look at a few carcinogens. I have already a list made out. So one by one, you're going to tell me what cancer it is quickly. Next two minutes, we'll take care of that. Aflatoxin, what cancer? Just keep on commenting fastly. Aflatoxin, hepatocellular carcinoma, right? Okay. Okay, Mazud. Uh, PVC Toro Trust, what cancer? PVC, polyvinyl chloride, the person who makes the, handles the chemical and Toro Trust was in contrast dye. It causes, it also is a liver, but it's not hepatocellular carcinoma. It causes hepatic angiosarcoma, right? Asbestos. Asbestos keeps on repeating, right? There are two things in asbestos. We'll cover both of them. Asbestos, what is the common co cancer scene? The common cancer scene in asbestos, or if you want to put most common, and the specific one. I'm sure you know both. The most common thing is your adenocarcinoma of the lung. And the most specific undoubtedly is mesothelioma, right? The most common is lung adenocarcinoma. Mesothelioma is not a common cancer. The most specific is obviously mesothelioma. HHV8, one classical disease. One classical disease, HHV8, Kaposi sarcoma, right? Kaposi, I'm sure you will not forget. So I'm just putting a short form. There are two more diseases. There's a disease called as primary effusion lymphoma. It's a lymphoma which also has come in an INACT exam. That's also due to HPV. And there's a disease called Castleman's disease, right? Castleman disease is also HPV related, HHV8 related, fine. HPV, there are huge amount of HPVs, right? Oh, any anogenital cancer, cervical, vulval, vaginal, penile, every cancer, oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal cancers as well, right? I'm just writing anogenital, that's a common cancer related to HPV. One non-academic question. How many of you guys have vaccinated yourselves for HPV? I'm sure you know the vaccines. Gardasil and Cervarix. I'm sure you must have read in the MCQs. Tell me how many of you guys are vaccinated for HPV? Anyone? There are close to 140 people live here. Any one of you have you vaccinated for yourselves for HPV? No. Why? See, there are two things. One is reading. One is applying. If you are not applying what you are reading for you, 
it's very very difficult for anyone to believe how will you apply it for a patient so please go and get vaccinated be it a guy or a girl hpv vaccine is must it reduces 70 70 percent of all the cancers caused by hpv right so please go and get vaccinated okay well, go just once outside get a shot and come and sit back in library right Please get vaccinated. See, age limit is there, but at any age, the protection level will reduce. That's all. Say uh, the vaccine should be given at the time you are not sexually active. It's first before first sexual exposure is when you have to get vaccinated. Fine. HIV, I don't have a vaccine as of now. Hopefully, it comes soon and we'll all get vaccinated. Fine. HTLV. HTLV causes one classical T cell tumor. It's adult. T-cell leukemia by lymphoma. Okay. It causes adult T-cell leukemia by lymphoma. Fine. Okay. Any one, what tumor comes to mind first for EBV? Epstein-Barr virus. The multiple thing which causes Epstein-Barr virus related tumor. Anyone? Yes, there are lots of transplant associated disease for sure. Most of the lymphomas, like uh, I'm not pinpointing Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's, few variant of Hodgkin's and quite a few non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, quite a few of them will have EBV related, right? So in short, I'm writing lymphoma. There's one more thing which is classical astronomy of the EBV. You must have read them in ENT, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Perfect. That's close to 100% association with the EBV, right? That's definitely associated. These are two things, never forget it, okay? H. pylori. I'm not going to type the tumor which it causes, gastric adenocarcinoma and obviously your maltoma. Those, those are two things, gastric adenocarcinoma and maltoma of the stomach is related to H. pylori. What type of gastritis does H. pylori cause? Does it cause erosive gastritis or atrophic gastritis? That's important for us. Erosive or atrophic gastritis? It causes atrophic gastritis right so if i'm going to have an atrophic gastritis due to h pylori the type b atrophic gastritis what do you think will happen to the acid production acid production reduces when the acid production reduces what will happen to gerd reduces when gerd reduces what what will happen to barrett's reduces when barrett's reduces what happens to esophageal adenocarcinoma it will be less again, right? So H. pylori is protective to esophageal adenocarcinoma. And it causes gastric adenocarcinoma, right? H. pylori protects esophageal adenocarcinoma. Okay. It's an indirect link because of the atrophic gastritis. It, causes, it protects esophageal adenocarcinoma, right? Perfect. And our question was based on benzene, benzene. Benzene causes leukemia. Little bit of aplastic anemias as well. Benzidine or aniline dyes causes your bladder cancer. Again, schistosomia also causes bladder cancer. Okay, coal. What type of tumor does coal cause? I'm not saying coal workers pneumoconiosis coal. In general, carbon or coal. One thing which we already know is entire respiratory tree. Your smoking is lots of things from starting from your larynx till your trachea, lung, everything. That's one. Have you, how many of you have had barbecues foods? Barbecue food. How many of you like barbecues? Some of them might love barbecues, right? Be it tandoori paneer or be it tandoori uh, chicken. Everything is barbecue. I'll come to it, RPR. Barbecue food is also black in color. It's covered by coal. So when you eat lots of barbecue, barbecued or smoked foods, smoked foods can cause GI tumors. Not on a day, if you eat on a daily basis, once in a while it's completely fine. But when you eat coal or smoked food on a daily basis, it increases the risk of gastric, it increases the risk of intestinal tumors. I want you guys to remember this uh, because uh, vegetarian also have barbecue, uh, your paneer, right? Tandoori paneer. If you remember Japan, in Japan, there's an extremely high incidence of gastric cancer because of smoked fish. Still, they are not able to reduce it. Food, when you smoke and eat, definitely it increases. I'm not saying it will cause cancer. It increases the risk for sure. Right? 
okay great clarches sinensis what cancer clarches comes in your gallbladder area it causes your perfect it causes bile duct related tumors called as cholangiocarcinomas and uv rays is a straightforward thing it causes skin tumors Great. Coming back to your question, RPR, like uh, we treat H. pylori induced disorders because it causes acute gastritis. Just because it's going to protect me from esophageal cancer, I cannot increase the risk of gastric cancer in myotomas, right? So it causes gastritis, which has to be treated. It has a risk of gastric cancer, which also has to be treated. For MCQs, this esophageal cancer came once. That's why I said, fine. Okay. Got it. These are a few things about carcinogens. Carcinogens do come in an exam once in a while. So these are more, mostly memory based. Read with a friend, you will listen, remember them for a longer time. That's all fine. Next, again, this is a PYQ. Comment your answer. 10 seconds, I'll keep quiet. Okay, answer. 60 year old presented to the OPD with discomfort in the chest, right? And there's a mediastinal mass found, a very, very low retic count, uh, sure BGS, a very low retic count and diagnosed to have a pure red cell aplasia with an mediastinal mass. That's a paraneoplastic syndrome. That's a classical answer of thymoma, right? Can you guys name any one more uh, classical paraneoplastic syndrome of thymoma? One is your pure red cell aplasia. This is your paraneoplastic syndrome. What's the other paraneoplastic syndrome? One more classical paraneoplastic syndrome. RPR both A and B can cause, but A is one more paraneoplastic syndrome as to with thymoma. Myasthenia gravis. Great. Remember both, both have come in an exam. Myasthenia gravis as well as pure cell aplasia. Classical findings seen in thymoma, right? Paraneoplastic syndrome classically seen in thymoma. Okay, great. Right. So we'll see what does a paraneoplastic syndrome mean and few classical paraneoplastic syndrome which might come in an exam. See, this is the definition of paraneoplastic syndrome given in Robbins. I'll try to explain this. There are symptoms which cannot be explained by the anatomical distribution or by elaboration of hormones indigenous to tissue. If I have a patient with Cushing syndrome. Secondary to pituitary adenoma. Is it a symptom or a paraneoplastic syndrome? There's a pituitary adenoma which is secreting ACTH and the patient is having Cushing's. Is it a symptom or a paraneoplastic syndrome? That's a symptom because normal pituitary only releases ACTH. So it's due to the elaboration of the hormones. If I have a patient with adrenal cortical carcinoma, which patient has Cushing syndrome? That's again a symptom. Because adrenal cortex secretes glucocorticoids. So it can be more in a tumor, again symptom. But if a lung cancer, lung has nothing to do with ACTH or steroids. If a lung cancer has Cushing syndrome, symptom or paraneoplastic syndrome. That's a paraneoplastic syndrome, right? So if I have a symptom of sign which cannot be explained by the anatomy of the organ, or by the distribution of the hormones, I call it paraneoplastic. I hope it is clear, fine? As a classical definition of paraneoplastic syndrome. I'll look, have a quick look about few classical paraneoplastic syndrome, fine? Cushing's. I'm just going to name few things which I want you guys to remember for sure, right? There are a lots of lists. I'm not completing the list. Cushing's syndrome, at least remember your small cell carcinoma of lung. Same for SADH. At least remember small cell lung cancer. Again, there are lots of them. Oat cell cancer is the other name for small cell lung carcinoma. At least remember this, right? Hypercalcemia. Again, there are multiple cancers which causes. At least remember squamous cell carcinoma of lung. And squamous cell carcinoma of lung causes hypercalcemia because it produces a protein called as PTHRP. Both of them have come in MCQ. Parathormone related peptide, right? Can anyone tell me which disease can, which tumor can cause polycythemia? This is an interesting follow-up question to that. 
which tumor can cause polycythemia as a paraneoplastic syndrome there are three tumors ideally one thing i want you to remember renal cell carcinoma the other two are, two are cerebellar hemangioblastomas okay fine and it can also be hepatocellular tumors fine now like like i said there's a leading question here renal cell carcinoma arises from kidney am i right in saying that kidney produces erythropoietin is that statement correct that statement is correct right so if kidney produces erythropoietin polycythemia is a symptom of renal cell carcinoma or a paraneoplastic syndrome MBBS synapse what happens is these are cancer cells they don't function normally they'll have very erratic function so a lung cell starts to secrete ACTH that's a very erratic function that's why paraneoplastic syndrome comes so it's a symptom or a paraneoplastic syndrome RCC and polycythemia vera you never thought this way right symptom how many of you have symptoms it's still a paraneoplastic syndrome it's a paraneoplastic syndrome. Otherwise, we, we won't have MCQs behind it and we won't have Robin saying it's a paraneoplastic syndrome, right? Because RCC, the origin of RCC is proximal convoluted tubule. Do proximal convoluted tubules secrete erythropoietin? No, it doesn't, right? Origin is PCT here. Erythropoietin is secreted by the interstitial cells and juxtaglomerular cells. That's why it is paraneoplastic, right? Though it comes from kidney, but not from the cells which secrete erythropoietin, so I call it paraneoplastic. I hope it's clear, right? Acanthosis nigricans. If you see a patient with acanthosis nigricans in your clinic, what will be the first diagnosis? You're seeing a patient with acanthosis nigricans in your clinic. First diagnosis, first thought process. You have to think of insulin resistance or diabetes, right? You are not going to think of cancer. If it's acanthosis nigricans, you have to think of insulin resistance or diabetes as the first thought process, not cancer. In an MCQ, if diabetes is not then the option, I will think of a cancer, right? Like Tropical Capricorn said, so it is your internal organ malignancy. It can be stomach, gastric, and few colonic tumors as well. And also lung adenocarcinoma. Actually, I can explain why acanthosis nigricans exactly comes. <clears throat> in lung adenocarcinoma, have you read a mutation called as EGFR? Have you heard about this mutation? Lung adenocarcinoma has EGFR mutation. I'm sure you must have heard, right? EGFR stands for epithelial growth factor receptor, right? So when there's an EGFR mutation, can I say this EGFR will also increase the skin thickness epithelium epithelial growth factor receptor it does so when skin thickness increases the skin thickness basal layer increases because basal layer is a germinative layer right can i also say basal layer is where i have the melan melanocytes yes so this egfr increases skin thickness by increasing basal layer automatically increases melanocytes so what happens is it produces a blackish discolored thick skin acanthosis nigricans it's related to the mutation not related to the organ or function right most of the gastric carcinomas colonic carcinomas breast cancers lung adenocarcinomas which have egfr mutation has a chance of having acanthosis nigricans that's the relation here fine right? it's a very simple relation okay Rossio syndrome remember see pancreatic cancer was an mcq was a pyq before asked definitely i'll have pancreatic cancer Later on, it's not just pancreas, it is any mucin secreting adenocarcinoma. Okay. Any mucin secreting adenocarcinoma, there is a chance of having Trossier syndrome. Trossier syndrome is nothing but migrating thrombophlebitis because this mucin which comes outside, even lung adenocarcinoma, the mucin will trigger and damage the endothelium. Once endothelium is damaged, automatically you will have thrombosis. That's why I have migrating thrombophlebitis here. Fine. Like we said, PRC and myasthenia for thymoma. Okay. So what you have seen in uh, neoplasia as of now is we have covered kind of a little bit about the uh, microscopy. 
we saw a little bit about Warburg. We had covered a little bit about your cancer causing carcinogens and also your paraneoplastic syndrome. Fine. I'm not able to understand your question, RPR. Can you rephrase it? Why not ACTA secreting tumor in sense for which paraneoplastic syndrome? Okay. So till now, what you have done is we are done with your first chapter cell injury, little bit of it, inflammation, little bit of it, genetics, little bit of it, and your cancers, neoplasia, little bit of it, right? Now let's go to your hematology. How many of you guys like, like hematology? In hemat, we have RBC, WBC. We'll cover most of them needed in RBC and most of them needed in WBC as well. Mr. Jain, I'll go back to the definition. The definition says that it's not due to anatomic distribution or the elaboration of hormones. It never said about the mutation, right? So these are the mutations. That's why I can call it as a paraneoplastic syndrome. Got it? Okay. So let's go to RBC. Hemat is one of the easiest topics. Again, you need to know the normal. Once you know normal, abnormality is definitely a piece of cake, right? So we'll go with RBC first. I have a template for RBC disorders. If you know this template for every disorder in hematology, that's more than enough. You can treat a patient. If you can treat a patient, MCQ will definitely fall into it. Fine. The template is this. This is what I want you to know for almost every disease. Uh, I'll try to do something for leukemia. I would need more time for leukemia. I cannot do it in rapid revision. Uh, I will give you a logical explanation for every CD marker you read in lymphoma. But I need at least one, one or two hours for that alone. We'll definitely do that sometime down the road. Fine. This is the only template which I wanted to know. Etiology, pathogenesis, one or two clinical features, not everything. Lab funding, what will I see? Investigation of choice. Treatment, I'm not going to cover. I will lead to a medicine person or a pediatrician. Right. So this template, if I know for every disease, that's more than enough for us to understand. Fine. Now let's come to this first question. What's the answer? Comment on the answer, then we'll go with the template for three, four diseases and we'll look at few images and more things about hematology. A boy after playing football, fatigue and abdomen pain. He also had a history of hand swelling in the past. Ultrasonography has shown a shrunken spleen. Or in other words, I can put it as ultrasonogram shows autosplenectomy. What is the most likely diagnosis of the patient? It's a very simple question, right? The classical question. Abdomen pain is also due to the infarcts because infarcts can happen due to the sickle cell plugging, plugging the arterioles. Swelling of the hands and feet is your dactylitis. And ultrasonography has shrunken spleen, your autosplenectomy. So the classical uh, thing fits into your sickle cell anemia, right? Perfect. It's a very, very simple thing. Like I said, I'm going to do the template. To know the template, the first and the foremost thing is I need to know how a normal RBC looks. If you know how your normal RBC looks, most of the thing can be sorted. What is the shape of a no normal RBC? Anyone? A shape of an RBC. It's your biconcave shape, right? It's a classical biconcave shape. If it's biconcave like this, where do you think the hemoglobin will be? It will be in the center or the periphery. The hemoglobin in a biconcave will be in the center or periphery. It has to be in the periphery because in center it's compressed, right? It's compressed in center. So automatically hemoglobin goes to the periphery. But in the microscope, I cannot see the biconcave because in microscope will be from the top. I don't see from the side. I'll see from the top. So from the top, my RBC looks like this. RBC is a round. If it's a round, the periphery of the cell will have hemoglobin. And the center of the cell does not have hemoglobin. So can I say central pallor is normal. One third central pallor is, in, is normal in an RBC. This I want you to know. If you know this and how an RBC looks, most of the other things can be easily sorted, right? This is how a normal RBC looks, fine. Now, if I am having any cell, any cell, if you have to maintain this biconcave shape, can I say it requires some amount of energy? Because the round is the round is a normal uh, easiest form, right? If you have to stretch a rubber band, also I need energy, right? So can I say to stretch an RBC to maintain the biconcave shape, I need some energy or some proteins. 
those proteins are your spectrin, anchiron, you have band 3, band 4.1 and 4.2, fine. These are the proteins which helps me to stretch the RPC and to maintain the biconcave shape, right. So now tell me, if I lose any of these proteins, I'm going to lose any of the proteins, fine. Okay. If I lose any of the protein, is there a chance that the biconcave shape will become round? There's a mutation in any one of the protein. Will the biconcave become round? Because round is an energy independent state. Yes. That is the reason for spherocytosis. Simplest reason for spherocytosis. So first disease, what you're going to see is hereditary spherocytosis. It's a mutation in any of the four protein, but the important one, the common one is anchiron, right? I'm just writing anchiron alone. I'm not writing everything, right? It's anchiron mutation causes spherocytosis. Because of the spherocyte, because of the uh, mutation, the cell becomes spherical. It becomes spherical like this, right? If it becomes spherical, will I have this distribution of hemoglobin in the periphery or it will be uniform throughout? If it becomes spherical, it will become uniform throughout, right? So a spherocyte will have a central pillar or no central pillar? No central pillar, right? Simple. Spherocyte will not have a central pillar. It's a spherical RPC where hemoglobin is distributed uniformly, right? So this spherical RPC, when it goes via spleen, it cannot go between the sinusoids. So what happens is they get trapped in the spleen. What type of organ is spleen? Which group of organ system spleen comes under? If you remember your anatomy, uh, you must have a divided system like hematology and your reticuloendothelial and your endocrine system. Which uh, group does spleen come under? Spleen comes under reticuloendothelial system, right? Every reticuloendothelial system has few basic things. They will have sinusoids they will have reticular network and inside the sinusoids they will have macrophages that's the perfect thing for reticular endothelial system spleen has sinusoids liver has sinusoids bone marrow has sinusoids lymph node has sinusoids in every sinusoid there will be macrophages so if anything gets trapped in spleen or liver or lymph node or bone marrow macrophage will eat it will macrophage eat this also it will so the hemolysis here like you guys said is intravascular or extravascular in the blood vessel or outside the blood vessel it is extravascular it's happening outside the blood vessel right it's happening outside the blood vessel right that's one extravascular hemolysis in mcq salient clinical features i'm just telling one thing this presence in adults and a very very low grade hemolytic anemia Okay, presence in adults. If it's going to present in adult with our concepts of genetics, tell me it's a dominant disorder or a recessive disorder. It's going to present in adults, dominant or recessive. We know the concepts of genetics. I'm sure you are amazing and you will definitely must remember it. It's presenting in adult, so it's dominant or recessive. It's an autosomal dominant disorder. Perfect, right? Again, I need not memorize. I know things and the proteins are there in the autosome. So it's an autosomal dominant disorder. It causes very, very low grade hemolysis. Hemoglobin will be in the range of 11 or 12. 11, 12 hemoglobin. Do you think the patient will have any problem? Or the patient can live, lead a normal life. Most of the women in a country has 11 and 12 hemoglobin, right? So it's completely normal. They won't have any symptoms of fatigue. They look completely normal. But Every day, RBC lysis. Every day, spleen destroys more RBC than it should. What is the breakdown product of heme? What's the breakdown product of heme? Heme breaks down to give, must have read in biochemistry, bilirubin, right? So can I say, in these patients, every day, there will be a little bit more and more and more and more bilirubin? There will be, right? If there is more and more and more bilirubin, over the period of years, like 10, 20, 30 years, is there a possibility 
and excess bilirubin can form a gallstone patients present as gallstone and not as anemia as a very classical symptom of spherocytosis right they present with what type of gallstone pigmented or cholesterol they present with pigmented gallstone because it's bilirubin related right they have to present with that pigmented gallstone that's second adult hemolysis pigmented gallstone and it's extravascular hemolysis if it's extravascular what will happen to the size of the spleen reduced or elevated it has to be big right so there'll be splenomegaly okay there'll be splenomegaly all these are classical symptoms of your hereditary spherocytosis perfect now cbc you're going to tell it uh, first we we'll look at ps then we we'll look at cbc right we we'll look at peripheral smear same logic you have a rubber band you have pulled the rubber band like this you have left the rubber band it becomes spherical normal when you pull the rubber band it will have more volume or when you leave the rubber band it will have more volume i am talking about volume not size right i am going to pull it i left it when it will have more volume or more space the pulled one or the normal one it's rubber band right not signs you must have played with rubber bands obviously the pulled one right in other words can i say a biconcave rbc will have little bit more volume compared to a norm uh, compared to a spherocyte it will be smaller right perfect so in a peripheral smear the spherocytes will be smaller there will be no central pillar we know why no central pillar okay the next part is the most important part in spherocytosis do you think hemoglobin is reduced or the amount of hemoglobin is normal there is no problem in hemoglobin right hemoglobin is absolutely normal if hemoglobin is normal but slightly smaller rbc will it be darker or lighter it has to be darker a smaller rbc no central pallor and a darker rbc that's a classical finding of spherocytes now let's go to your uh, uh, mcv mch and everything if it's a dark rbc the concentration is more or less that's a very very important finding very important mcq it's a dark rbc so the hemoglobin concentration is more or less simple thing right it has to be and it is more only disease with elevated mchc is spherocytosis same thing sham just just that's what we are discussing here right it will have an elevated mchc there's a classical finding seen in spherocytosis you see this finding in any question in any time in real life also it's spherocytosis that's all okay great investigation of choice how do you confirm spherocytosis flow cytometry we'll not go into the depths of it now maybe we will go when we go to prof five passes or entire thing we'll go to the depths of flow cytometry also fine i know the problem it's a very low grade hemolysis i am not going to do anything most of the time if at all i have to do something i am going to remove the spleen because that's where all the rbs are dying so i remove the spleen maximum treatment i can do is splenectomy this once a question came post splenectomy you have removed the spleen in a patient with spherocytosis do you think spherocytes will appear or disappear or still will be persistent it's a simple question think and answer you have removed the spleen spherocytes will disappear or it will be persistent they will be persistent right because i am not changing the pathogenesis i am just removing the spleen right spherocytes will still be present even after removing the spleen because i am not doing anything to the disease right if you can have a flash card kind of thing or in a note or in a sticky pad right like this for every rbc disorder quickly revise that's more than enough if you know this you can easily solve a patient and definitely can take care of an mcq G6PD deficiency will go the same thing a little bit faster because we know how to do it. Definitely, when you repeat it, you can be easily faster. G6PD glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase dominant or recessive. It's an enzyme. Glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is an enzyme, so it's dominant or recessive. 
it is recessive. G6PD is there in X chromosome, so it is X link recessive. But perfect. Next one, etiology. The deficiency is the problem. If when G6PD is deficient, right? When G6PD is deficient, automatically what happens? There'll be more reactive oxygen species induced damage to RBCs. That's the main problem which happens in G6PD deficiency. More reactive oxygen species induced damage. If reactive oxygen species are the one which is going to destroy the RBCs, tell me the first condition which comes to your mind which will have more reactive oxygen species. Anything which comes to your mind. Any this anything where free radicals will be more. Can I say infection? That will be the trigger. If you have any question with trigger induced hemolysis, G6PD, the trigger most commonly is infection. It can be any infection or drugs. Few drugs also release free radicals because it will take care of the infection, it will release a free radical, right? These are the triggers. If there's a trigger after that hemolysis, G6PD. It's classical, right? That's going to be a feature. And since it's X-linked recessive, it's more commonly seen in men. That's all. Fine. Lab finding. CBC except for reduced hemoglobin, I don't have any classical finding. Let it will smear. There are two classical findings. I will try to explain that a little bit. This is an RBC, fine. This RBC has your hemoglobin here, fine. It has your hemoglobin. This RBC is exposed to reactive oxygen species. If you remember your first chapter of Robbins, you must have definitely read that reactive oxygen species causes your protein denaturation, DNA damage and lipid peroxidation, right? So when protein is denatured, any protein in my body, will it become a precipitate? It becomes a precipitate, right? That precipitate is what, like Keshav said, teens bodies, right? So what happens is the DNA, so the hemoglobin becomes a precipitate. There's nothing but denatured globin. The denatured globin is your teens body. Teens body is not seen in normal stain. It's seen in new methylene blue stain. Okay. It's seen in new methylene blue stain. It is not seen in normal stain at all. This Heinz body, when you use a Leishman stain, Leishman will not stain the denatured hemoglobin. So what it looks is, it looks like this. What is this called as? In Leishman, the globin is not stained because the denatured destroyed globin, which will not be stained in Leishman. So that's called an white cell. How many of you have read this statement in Robbins that uh, spleen plucks the Heinz body so it appears like a bite, so it's got a bite cell? Have you read this in Robbins? Might have, some of them might have taught you as well. The reason for bite cell is not due to spleen removing Heinz body. The reason for bite cell is in Leishman, Heinz body is not stained, so it looks like a bite. Textbooks also can go wrong. Find mistakes in textbook. Tell them. Write to the authors. If it's a genuine mistake, they should correct the mistake and they should give you credits in the next edition of the book. Imagine your name in Harrison or Robbins. Neat PG first time is not useful at all. That's amazing, right? I've told the author of Robbins. Hopefully, sometime they change it and I will fight for my name if they change it. Fine. Bite cell is not due to spleen. Bite cell is nothing but unstained portion of the hemoglobin coagulum seen in Leishman. That's all. Spleen does, does nothing to bite cell. It's just the unstained uh, part of hemoglobin coagulum. Fine. That's a wrong ideology. The spleen removes Heinz body and gives bite cells. Fine. <clears throat> Hopefully, some of your names will come sometimes in your books and I'll be the most happiest person. Any of the young doctor's name comes in a textbook. Fine. <clears throat> okay. Investigation of choice. It's an enzyme deficiency. Investigation of choice is simple. You're going to have to do an enzyme analysis. Okay. Treatment. Just tied over the crisis. Supportive. If there's any drug like primaquin or dapsone causing it, just leave that. 
try to uh, don't take those drugs so that it will not trigger more hemolysis that's all right support to management is more than enough for g6pd deficiency fine got it great this is how you're going to create the template for everything i have done for two what i'm going to do is i'm going to leave sickle cell anemia and thalassemia for you as homework when i give the pdf to you i'll give the entire annotated pdf and that will take care of it past i have completed pathology so i have uh, for every chapter book the size of robins Winthrop's hematology talks about this fine it's also there in the book only don't worry okay now we'll look at few images rbc is equal to images right you know you know normal image anyway so if you know normal rbc we're going to look at one by one abnormality put your fingers on your keyboard i'm going to mark our rbc things i'm going to circle few things you're going to tell me what they are faster right we'll go a little bit more faster what are these they are very classical you tell me what they are and i'll tell you where i see them i want you guys to tell where where is what are they what are these they're classical what are these you should know it and i'm sure you will know it as a classical target cell right okay it's a classical target cell it looks like a target or a dart right so target cell has one more name called as codocytes that the other name is codocytes whenever you see target cell like amai said i'm going to think of a thalassemia my first possibility undoubtedly is thalassemia but it's not just seen only in thalassemia i can see target cell in sickle cell anemia you can also see target cell in a very very severe case of iron deficiency anemia okay you can be seen all the th three things sickle cell anemia iron deficiency anemia as well as thalassemia but single option go for thalassemia there's actually a reason why target cell is formed Again, when we have lots of time, we'll discuss each and every reason why it is formed. Okay. Severe case of IDA causes target cells, uh, BGS. Not just microcytic, severe case of IDA and thalassemia causes target. Fine. Okay, next. What is this? This particular cell. What is particular cell? It's a very classical cell. I'll write how they look and then you can answer. They are they the cell do have irregular projection and they are blunt projection if you have something irregular and blunt i have something irregular and sharp i have something regular and blunt see these are the projections which can happen in rbc's regular and blunt irregular and blunt irregular and sharp because it's codocytes if it's irregular and blunt like this image okay i'm going to call it an acanthocyte that is a neat pg class so i don't think so it'll be helpful for neat ug ankit okay if it's irregular and sharp it's schistocytes or your fragmented rbc If it's regular and blunt, that's your bursal like Jane said. It's your echinocyte. The other name for acanthocyte is bursal. The other name for echinocyte is bursal. Please write this down or at least take a screenshot when I send you a PDF. This is important because they are very, very closely look irregular, sharp and blunt, regular blunt. Plus you'll have a history. Acanthocytes, there are two diseases. I am sure you will know one disease, A beta lipoproteinemia. But the common disease in acanthocyte causing thing is liver disease. Okay. Liver disease is the first one, and then you A beta lipoproteinemia and everything. Cystocyte, I want you to remember one, DIC. DIC, don't forget because it's an emergency. That's one of the important emergency what our pathologists have. Blunt and regular echinocyte, you see them in uremia okay these are the three things now i will show you the image you tell me whether it's an acanthocyte or a cystocyte or an echinocyte fine i'll show all the three images let's see who uh, says everything correctly fine okay this is irregular blunt or irregular and uh, sharp this is Irregular and blunt, right? That's an acanthocyte. What is this? 
this regular or irregular this one this one this one this is regular and blunt right this is your echinocyte i'll zoom it out this is echinocyte if it's regular and blunt that's an echinocyte perfect irregular and blunt it's a cysteocyte i'll show you sharp so that you don't have a confusion between acanthocyte and cysteocyte fine great uh, just a second this is blunt or sharp i'm sure you will accept this is sharp right you just have to compare that's all this is definitely sharp this is a broken rbc this is a cysteocyte fine compare this with this can i call this blunt this is definitely blunt right so it's just about comparison this is blunt acanthocyte this is regular and blunt echinocyte this is irregular and sharp this is your cysteocytes fine so these are the classical differences once you know the difference in microscopy history will help you for sure definitely you can easily come to a diagnosis fine next one these are classical ones what are these what's that that's a sickle cell perfect what is this can anyone of you tell me what i have circled the circled one is your the circled one is your codocyte or your target cell right so i have sickle cell anemia here that's why i said even in sickle cell anemia i can see a target cell there's one more name for sickle cell which is also called as drapanocyte okay it's also called as drapanocyte that's the other name for sickle cell fine we have codocytes as well as sickle cell that's a classical finding seen in sickle cell anemia right so these are few variations in the rbc you have your target cells acanthocyte echinocyte drapanocyte and your cysteocyte five different variations and next one more thing what we have is inclusions we look at the inclusions also okay because inclusions also is important before going to inclusion all the inclusion can be systematically followed okay i hope you are over your uh, dinner post dinner som lessons now let's come back to your active phase i want you guys to write this because this is very very important if you follow these two flow charts you can diagnose almost every inclusion when i say inclusion whole jolly body heens body all those inclusions can be easily picked up when you know this flow charts fine to know this inclusion first i need two information there are two strains done in hematology one is leishman a bgs helmet cell is also like a cysteocyte if there are two projection it's a helmet cell if there are more than two projection projections it's a cysteocyte it's fine next is your supravital stain or your new methylen blue stain see these are two things which we do in hematology leishman and your supravital leishman stain rbc will be red in color like whatever we have seen till now everything is a leishman stain in new methylen blue stain like the name says it's bluish it will be bluish green in color okay it will be bluish green rbc fine that's the main difference between leishman and new methylen blue you will have to pick it up i will show you images you tell me whether it's leishman or new methylen blue so that we will not have this confusion again right what stain is this leishman or new methylen blue i want everyone to comment leishman or new methylen blue good evening chitranjan this is new methylen blue right what is this leishman or new methylen blue this is leishman right i hope you know the difference here there are two things here i'll put both of the images in same thing the top one is new methylen blue and the bottom one here is leishman fine if you know this difference that's more than enough we can easily tide over the crisis here fine let's go so like i said there are only two flow charts very very simple flow charts if you have a leishman stain you're going to look for inclusions right it can be a single inclusion or it can be a multiple inclusion every inclusion will be blue in color only if it's multiple inclusion i anish there are two possibilities it can be uniform inclusion or it can be non uniform inclusion okay be either uniform or non uniform let's say it's like this 
let's assume these are the three rbc's here single inclusion will be like this multiple and uniform will be like this multiple and non uniform will be like this towards a corner right i hope you know the, uh, you can identify the difference i'll show the images of all of them so that you can easily identify in a slide as well single multiple uniform multiple non uniform i'll use the same template for new methyl blue also single multiple uniform multiple non uniform right so if it's a single inclusion it is whole jolly bodies okay if it's multiple and uniform inclusion we have something called as basophilic stippling if it's multiple and non uniform inclusion we have something called as pappenheimer body pappenheimer body is seen in sideroblastic anemia right? it's seen in sideroblastic anemia pappenheimer body in new methylen blue also i have the same thing if it's new methylen blue the only difference is rbc will be greenish blue in color right that's the only difference here fine okay so in new methylen blue if it's a single inclusion if it's new methyl blue single inclusion that's heen's body if it's new methyl blue multiple inclusion and uniform throughout the rbc i have something called as golf ball inclusions golf ball inclusions are seen in hbh disease of alpha thalassemia okay uh, three alpha deletion hbh disease if it's multiple and non uniform it's a normal reticulocyte i'll just zoom out a little bit the very simple thing to identify if it's leishman single multiple uniform non uniform new methyl blue single multiple uniform non uniform fine now we are going to look at the images now let's comment i want you guys to comment i will show you one by one we will go systematically tell me whether it's leishman or new methyl blue first single or non uh, multiple next uniform or non uniform then answer you need not comment everything you can just go ahead and go ahead with the final answer itself fine okay let's start leishman or new methyl blue new methyl blue right single or multiple multiple uniform or not uniform non uniform diagnosis what i'm going to call this as that's your classical golf ball inclusion right it's new methyl and blue it's multiple and it's uniform so it is golf ball inclusion right perfect that's how you pick up all the inclusions please remember that flow chart it's just it's just few informations we can easily diagnose all of them right leishman or new methyl leishman single or multiple multiple uniform or not uniform uniform so this is perfect that's your basophilic stippling okay that's how basophilic stippling looks right multiple leishman uniform basophilic stippling i hope it's clear you can see the uniform inclusions as well right great leishman or new methyl blue leishman single or multiple multiple uniform or not non uniform this is pappenheimer body okay you can easily diagnose if you remember the flow chart i'll give it to you in the pdf please read them this also the day before exam i told you to remember pedigree chart the day before exam this also read day before exam so that you won't make a mistake fine this actually a very faded new methyl blue a single inclusion you can see a tiny inclusion in all the rbc's that's how an heen's body looks okay that's a heen's body it's a very faint dot here right right next same thing leishman single inclusion diagnosis whole jolly bodies you go with an algorithm algorithm is always easy to remember right heen's body whole jolly body basophilic stippling golf ball inclusion everything can be picked up only one problem don't interchange leishman and new methyl blue if you interchange everything is gone leishman it will be red in color new methyl blue it will be greenish blue in color right i hope you won't make any mistakes in any of the rbc inclusions from now onwards 
there's something called this cabo ring it's just a bonus for you this is also an rbc inclusion looks like a ring form you can also see one more thing here along with the ring form you actually have in leishman multiple uniform inclusion what is it along with cabo ring you have one more finding here multiple uniform inclusion this is your base of elixir playing right uh, shubhas i hope you won't make it any more atypical medico oval jolly is in leishman his body is in pneumothelium loop right that's base of elixir playing right perfect ah uh, shubhas i have come in to rbc i need to have a little bit fun time for wbc and few more things in systemic pathology fine okay next question this is my favorite question this also is a pyq which came in the last neat if i'm not wrong Twenty-eight year old software engineer ordered food outside online for a month, which which almost most of us during the entire COVID era, right? Complete lack of fruits and vegetables. That's an important clue here. And the patient has fatigue. CBC is low. MCV is high. And rest of the parameters are normal. Examination is normal. Classical case of folate deficiency, right? It's a dietary deficiency. Dietary deficiency of folate is more common than B12. B12, there's only one place you can have a dietary deficiency if the person is in vegan. Okay, the person is a vegan. Dietary deficiency of B12 is possible for sure, right? Perfect. It's a very simple question. I'm going to discuss about B12. I love this vitamin. Put your pens down. Uh, I always feel that medicine is not. reading books and treating patients medicine is understanding science and understanding the way of life b12 is uh, it's something which changed my outlook of medicine when i was in first year of md one senior student gave me an article five ten pages only about b12 that's when i thought okay whatever i've been done in mbbs for four years it's not right so i have to read more to understand more things right let's look at b12 b12 will blow your mind like anything How many of you have gone to foreign countries? Any of you have gone to Russia, China, um, America, or Europe? Any countries above the equator, close to the poles? Any one of you? If you have gone to any of these countries mentioned, or the colder part of the nations, the staple food is beef and pork, right? Beef and pork is staple food. Red meat. Both this beef and pork are extremely rich in B12. so b12 does two jobs one of the job is b12 increases synthesis of thymine by thymidylate synthase and it helps in dna it helps in the formation of dna right that's what it does so b12 increases dna so can i say b12 increase or is required for is required for uh, more cells with high proliferation rate b12 has helps in increasing dna b12 is needed for cells which are proliferating all the proliferating cells in my body need b12 because they need dna right perfect okay now tell me which cells in my body are highly proliferating whatever comes to your mind which of cells comes to your mind which is highly proliferating daily it proliferates any cells or labile cells any labile cells any labile cells come out of your post dinner thing what cells can highly proliferate mucosal hematopoietic skin perfect so if you feel the skin of a foreigner russian european compared to an indian skin it will be thick because microscopically the layers of skin of a foreigner is more than an indian bone marrow if bone marrow proliferates more in a foreigner that's why harrison says 15 16 hemoglobin is normal in india it's not normal 13 also is normal intestine that's also important right when intestinal proliferation is more there'll be more villi when there's more villi absorption will be more that's why european russian american are well built 6 foot is normal height here here 6 foot is tall if you compare andrew flintoff and sachin tendulkar you know the difference 
because of B12. Not just that. The entire G, G, if I take GIT, it's not about intestine alone. Can I say tongue is also a part of GIT? The cells in tongue are your papillae. What's the function of papillae? The function of papillae is to take, uh, to help taste, right? So in a American, in a European and in a Russian, the tongue will have lots of papillae. That's the only reason a Russian, European, American likes salads. Indians don't like salad because an Indian cannot taste salad. My diet is not rich in B12. So it will not have such dense papillae. So I cannot taste salad. That's why Indians need spice in the food. Be it a gopi manjurian or a paneer makhani or a biryani. I need spice. Without spice, I will not be able to taste it because anatomically, I don't have enough papillae because of my food doesn't contain B12. That's, that's how B12 is in, in, ingrained into our uh, culture and in our life. Now let's take B12 outside the diet. Megaloblastic anemia. If whatever I have said is true, if whatever I have said is true, it should exactly fit into deficiency and it should fit into excess. Always ask for your evidence. You need evidence for sure, right? Let's take B12 deficiency. My bone marrow will not be proliferating. So can I say in B12 deficiency, there will be pancytopenia, hemoglobin comes low, WBC comes down, platelets also comes down. In B12 deficiency, what will happen is you will have very thin skin. When there's thin skin, there is easy bruisability. These knuckles, elbow, malleolus, they're stretched. The thin skin in B12 deficiency, if they're stretched, they'll have more trauma. Whenever skin undergoes trauma or inflammation, have you read in your uh, dermatology post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation? And also it came in your MCQ. Knuckle hyperpigmentation is a classical finding seen in B12 deficiency, right? B12 deficiency. Not just that. B12 deficiency, the intestinal mucosa will not be proper. You will have altered diarrhea and constipation. Altered bowel habits. Sign of B12 deficiency. Not just that. Top of the thing. The tongue. Tongue will be smooth. In B12 deficiency, you will have a red beefy tongue. Everything when B12 is gone, entire thing will be gone. Now, let's see what will happen when B12 is in excess. How many of your parents or relatives, uncle, aunt who is diabetic or hypertensive, takes B complex tablets. Jayalakshmi, whenever skin is inflamed, it produces pigment. How many of your friends, family, relatives daily takes tablets like B cosules, B complex tablets? That's actually an abuse. You should not take B complex tablets unless and until it's required. That's what science teaches us, right? Let's assume for an instance, daily from today onwards, I'm taking extra B12 every single day for the next 10 years. Is there a chance there'll be more and more and more and more proliferation of the GI epithelium? Is there a chance? There is a chance, right? Is there a chance it can increase the risk of colonic adenocarcinomas, gastric carcinomas, skin cancers. It can and it will. This will not be there in textbooks. B12 abuse is one of the causes of cancer. Medicine, for us it is medicine. For us it is science. But medicine in the world is business. So you have to know which is true, which is wrong to learn it. No, uh, for mouth ulcers, taking B12 is wrong. You don't want it at all, right? Uh, Shankul, patient on metformin, if the patient has B12 deficiency, give B12. Because B12 deficiency will present with anemia. When there's no symptom, don't treat. Symptom is there, you have to treat. You have to stop using this, right? Thank you, Ashwin, sir. You have to stop using this. When you... Keep on doing this again and again and again. At one point of time, we are going to go beyond medicine and we are going to destroy medicine. Please don't treat any patient who is not symptomatic. I don't treat medical tests. I treat a patient. Right? So when there is requirement, treat it. Now let's take an oath here. You will not give any vitamin or calcium or mineral when it's not required. 
we will oppose the people who are selling drugs right we have to oppose it because b12 abuse causes cancer it will not be in textbook like i said but google it will give you lots of information lots of information will be there right google will tell you lots of articles of b12 related and cancer related right please don't do that and now let's go and understand about b12 right okay so we know everything about b12 same thing b12 has one more function also which increases myelin synthesis this is not there in folate folate does the same thing whatever b12 does in thiamine but folate is not involved in neurological center so the way to differentiate b12 and folate deficiencies will will compare b12 deficiency and folate deficiency dietary deficiency of b12 is extremely rare unless and until you are a vegan okay How, is any of, one of you vegan here answer uh, the thing is i said there will be a risk i am not saying it will definitely cause but definitely there will be a risk none of us will be vegan right vegan means you have to eat uh, what uh, all the green leafy vegetables which means we are goat you are not human beings you should either eat meat or you have to eat milk if not both then you will become an herbivore and herbivore will definitely have b12 deficiency right okay so folate deficiency is common if there is less consumption of fruits and vegetables folate is little bit tricky okay folate is little bit tricky because folate will also be present in many food substances but biggest problem of folate is if you cook the food okay if you cook the food it gets destroyed that's why fruits and vegetables are more important for us fruits and vegetable a uh, green leafy vegetable i don't cook it because heat destroys folate okay heat destroys folate so even though it's there in meat even though there are many things heat will destroy it fine next one other problems of b12 deficiency is for b12 deficiency i need intrinsic factor so pernicious anemia is a cause okay greater in them next for b12 deficiency again like i said b12 is absorbed in ileum so surgery if there is a surgical restriction of ileum if there is surgical restriction of stomach because stomach produces intrinsic factor again i have a deficiency for b12 uh, absorption you need pancreas so patient who is having chronic pancreatitis again have a problem and all of these are cause of b12 deficiency dietary deficiency is very rare but on the other hand folate dietary deficiency is common folate can is very very common in alcoholics because alcohol interferes folate metabolism we'll talk about alcohol also very soon wait just give me a second next when there's increased requirement pregnancy that's why we give folate for pregnant women even before uh, while planning for pregnancy itself we start whenever there's an increased requirement folate also is required for me right because stores of folate is very very less and there's a drug methotrexate you must have read about methotrexate yesterday right methotrexate definitely is dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor so when i give methotrexate folate doesn't work so what drug do you give to circumvent the deficiency you don't give folic acid what do you give you give something called as folinic acid right so folinic acid helps in the methotrexate induced uh, drug deficiency fine so these are about folate okay like i said symptomatology some of the symptoms are extremely common i'm just going to repeat whatever we discussed you'll have an red beefy tongue red no papillae that's red beefy tongue you'll have knuckle hyperpigmentation that's a classical signing okay you'll have easy bruises because the skin is very very thin you'll have altered bowel habits again because of immature villi right okay apart from that anemia will be there for sure anemia is there that's definitely a common finding in addition to this which of these two deficiency will have like ans have said subacute combined degeneration of spinal cord or neurological deficit 
which of these two will have neurological deficit? B12 or folate? Sure, RF, I'll do it. Neurological deficit will be seen only in B12 deficiency. It is not seen in folate deficiency, right? It's definitely not seen in folate deficiency, okay? Just one word about treatment. I'm having an isolated B12 deficiency. I'm having B12 plus folate deficiency, okay? For an isolated B12 deficiency, how do you treat? Do you give only B12 or give B12 plus folate? How do you treat isolated B12 deficiency? Only B12 or both B12 and folate? This is a question which came in INICT. And when I was in MBBS, the answer was different. Now we have changed a lot. For an isolated B12 deficiency, the treatment is only B12. Never give both. I'll definitely do it RF. After this, I'll go there. Right? Never both. Right? In case of both B12 deficiency, you give both B12 and folate. Right? This is very, very important. Don't make a mistake. I'll tell you why. When you let's assume I'm having B12 deficiency. I'm taking both B12 and folate. What will happen is both B12 and folate will take care of my bone marrow, skin, GIT, tongue, everything. But it will miss neurons. Since both are there, it will take care of the reactions which both are a cofactor, right? So if you give both B12 and folate deficient, both B12 and folate in case of isolated B12 deficiency, if you use both, there will be an abnormal redistribution and it will worsen neurological symptoms. Anemia will be corrected, but neurological symptoms will become worse, right? That's one of the important thing for important factors in treatment. When I was an MBBS, the mode of treatment is give both. After that, they change. It's only B12. Remember, it's only B12. It should not give both. Fine. Just make this change. Fine. So coming back to this question. It's complete lack of foods. B12 is not a concern because B12 is seen vegan. Right? When you eat meat, it will take care of that. Right? Folate, when there's no fruits and no green leafy vegetable, folate is gone. It's nothing to do with spherocytosis because spherocytosis, I don't, it's not a macrocytic anemia. It's not spherocytosis. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia also is not a macrocytic anemia. So it's not the answer, right? You have a macrocytic anemia here. MCV of 115. Normal MCV is 80 to 96. So definitely it's macrocytic, fine. Uh, yes, Asutosh, you can ask. Uh, Keshav, is, if it's one leaf folate deficiency, give one leaf folate. Like I said, Deficient in one, don't overload. Replace that alone. If you give both B12 and folate in only folate deficiency, there's nothing wrong. But why to overdo something? Right? Alcohol part. Yeah, I'll come to it. Okay, this, uh, this is a finding seen in B12 as well as folate deficiency, the hypersegmented neutrophil. When you have more than five lobes in a neutrophil, in five percent of the cells, or more than six lobes even one cell. Okay. That's diagnostic of this. Fine. Okay. Uh, that's a little bit outside the topic uh, regarding alcohol part. Uh, who drinks more? Indian or a foreigner? Just let's take it light before we go to the next topic. Who do you think drink more? Indian or a foreigner? Definitely foreigner drinks more, right? Than an Indian. Who do you think will have more uh, cirrhosis? Indian or a foreigner? Uh, no, I search this for PG. Please don't take this class. Go back to your books. Indian has more chance of cirrhosis, but a foreigner drinks more, right? The problem here, and right? there's a problem here. The problem is Indians don't know how to drink. You read about all the first pass, second pass, zero pass metabolism yesterday, right? I hope you must have read it. So alcohol is absorbed by zero pass metabolism. So can I say alcohol will not be absorbed when there is something in the stomach? Yes, it will not be absorbed, right? So foreigner always eats and drink An Indian buys a chips packet and drinks. That's a major problem here, right? So we copy everything, but don't copy fully. So if you eat fully and then you have alcohol, Alcohol will not be absorbed because alcohol is based zero pass metabolism. 
it's not like zero absorption absorption will be reduced so that i don't have a problem for the liver or any organ it will be excreted first don't drink if you want to drink eat fully and drink yes ibrahim tell me okay so you have to know everything right science will help you in each and every corner of it right so first like i said don't drink don't say that i i told you this how to drink i am telling you ways to escape that's all fine okay okay let's go to it yes ibrahim you can ask me a question okay this is an important thing i'll talk about iron profile an easier way to remember iron profile now tell me the answer No comments on the Doikawa. Which of the following is increased in case of iron deficiency anemia? Except all of the following are increased except. Okay, Praveen has gone with TABC. Anyone? A. A, fine. TABC and A, right? A typical medical, the idea is not to drink, right? Okay, now let's go and discuss about iron profile. C. If you look at these two, these are a bit of an high fight test. We don't use it on a daily basis. But transference saturation, ferritin, serum iron, everything is done on a same. It's done routinely as well. Fine. Sure, I said I'll do it. So when you take iron profile, there are four things, four common things in iron profile. The first is serum iron. The second is transferrin saturation. Next, you have your serum ferritin. Next, you have TIBC, right? These are the four common ions a test done, right? Apart from that, your RBC, protoporphin, everything is there. We'll see it also. But these are the four common things done, right? Now, let's, I'll give you an example. Let's assume your, your classroom. Your classroom has 100 seats for people to sit. Only four people come inside the classroom. Can I say the classroom will be predominantly empty? Yes. If there are 150 people coming into the classroom of 100 seats, which means it will be overfilled, right? So the seats are, if the classroom is transferring, the seats are the place where iron can come and sit. So now tell me, if serum iron is less, the seats will not be full. If the serum iron is more, the seats will be completely full, right? So in other words, these both, serum iron and transferrin saturation they are directly proportional or indirectly proportional think carefully and answer because that will help me in a very long way serum iron transferrin saturation directly proportional or indirectly proportional they are directly proportional right or directly or inversely fine they are directly proportional perfect so whenever serum iron increases transferrin saturation increases whenever serum iron reduces transferrin saturation reduces clear i hope this relation between these two is done i'll go to the next what is ferritin what does ferritin mean ferritin is storage form of iron right ferritin is in storage form of iron right let's assume tibc is affinity for binding iron it's it's just an affinity to bind with iron right that's tibc okay now let's say um, you just now ate dinner if i'm going to give you more and more and more food will you have more affinity now just now i ate so i won't have that much affinity right but if i am not not had dinner at all if i'm going to give you even your hostel food many of you hated hostel food even if it's hostel food, you will eat when you are hungry. I starve you for two days. I give you food. You will definitely eat. So where I am coming with this analogy is, if my stores are full, will the affinity be more or less? If my stores are full, what will happen to the affinity of binding to iron? Will be less. If the stores are empty, my affinity to binding iron will definitely be more. Right? So if this is true, and if you got the analogy, serum ferritin and TABC is directly proportional or in inversely proportional. These two are great. Right? Like life set is 
inversely proportional. Okay, I hope it's clear, right? So serum iron transfer association, serum ferritin TABC, they are inversely proportional. Great. So these are the two things which I want you to remember forever for iron profile. See, if you remember this, diseases are very simple. Let's take for an example, IDA. What will happen to serum iron in case of iron deficiency anemia? That's there in the name, right? It will be reduced. If iron is reduced in IDA, what will happen to transfer and saturation? That also will be reduced. Directly proportional, right? What will happen to serum ferritin in case of iron deficiency anemia? It will also be reduced because ferritin is storage form of iron. It will be reduced, right? What will happen to TABC in case of iron deficiency anemia? Since ferritin is reduced, TABC is inversely proportional. It will be elevated. You should never have a doubt. It's very simple. It's logical, right? Next disease. Let's compare anemia of chronic disease. AOCD is anemia of chronic disease. Fine. Okay. Clear. We just now finished COVID and came, hopefully, right? During COVID, we all must have done serum ferritin as a test. Can I say ferritin is definitely an acute phase reactant? I'll come to it, BGS. Yes, ferritin is an acute phase reactant. So in anemia of chronic infection or inflammation or chronic disease, what do you think will happen with ferritin? I am starting with ferritin because that's the most trickiest thing to remember. In anemia of chronic disease, ferritin will be elevated, right? Because ferritin is an acute phase reactant. So if that is elevated, what happens to TIBC? It will be reduced. Now, again, I'm going with the same person. Ferritin is elevated, right? I'm having more and more and more things in storage. So what will happen to serum iron? Serum iron will be reduced. When serum iron is reduced, transfer and saturation is also reduced, right? I hope the logic makes sense. It's a very simple thing to remember, right? So for us, this is how you remember. These are the major things where you always have a confusion. Other th diseases, they don't ask much for iron profile. If at all, they ask. Let's take hemochromatosis. Serum iron is elevated. Transfer and saturation is elevated. I don't care about the rest because these two are enough to diagnose hemochromatosis. Only disease with elevated serum iron is hemochromatosis. Right? So remember this part. Don't forget this part. Whatever comparison you want to keep, keep it. Whatever analogy you want to keep, keep it. But iron and transfer and saturation are directly proportional. TABC and ferritin is indirectly proportional. With this, we'll go to the top. The question is, all of the following are increased except. So, which means the question is asking, which decreases? That's a direct question, right? Transfer and saturation decreases in case of IDA. Just now we saw. TABC will be elevated in case of IDA. Just now we saw. Yeah, sure, Abdullah. Uh, RBC protoporphyrin, right? So RBC protoporphyrin. Let's come to a logical conclusion for RBC protoporphyrin. Uh, when you have heme metabolism, in iron deficiency anemia, the end product heme is not properly formed because I don't have enough iron to form heme. If the end product is not properly formed, what will happen to the products before that? That's a simple biochemical question, right? I don't have the end product. So the reaction keeps on continuing more and more and more. So protoporphyrin, which is an intermediate in heme metabolism will be elevated. Yes, that's how it is. It will be elevated for sure, right? Then soluble iron trans, uh, it will be elevated Rudra, right? I'll come to the chivam just a second, right? So soluble iron transferrin receptor is, transferrin is not having enough iron to bind. Transferrin is not having enough iron to bind. When there's no enough iron to bind, so the transferrin will be produced more. Transferrin receptor will be produced more in search of iron. So again, a response to it will be increased soluble transferrin receptor. Right? Okay. So I'm coming back to your question. I though I call it a chronic disease. Let's take tuberculosis. Can I say though tuberculosis is a chronic disease, it's always having inflammation? 
Yes, right. So I name it acute phase reactant, but it will be seen in inflammation for sure. Protoporphine. Okay. Say so I don't know the exact steps of your heme synthesis, your ALA synthesis, levulinic acid, everything comes, right? So here, so the end product is heme meta heme, right? Okay. End product is heme. So this heme, if it is reduced, what happens is the entire reaction will be increased. That's how the compensation with the end product is not there. So all the reactions will be more so that in an attempt, I need to form heme, right? That's why all the earlier products will be more. That's for every everything. Phenylketonuria, the end product is not formed. The substrate becomes more, right? The same thing here, RBC protoporphyrin, which is kind of a substrate, becomes more in heme when heme is not formed due to iron deficiency, right? Okay. Let's come back. A limo and shankul don't worry i'll let them say it's fine it's completely fine right so everyone will see i always believe that every teacher who is there is here to teach we are here to convey our knowledge to you so whichever teacher you like go ahead with it that's that's not a problem at all at the end of the day if you become amazing doctor if you read from any person in the world i am happy because like i said in the start you're my colleague if you are good i'll also become good that's all fine Let's go to the, this image. This is how microcytic RBCs looks. Okay. That's tiny RBC, very, very small. The way to identify microcytic RBCs in a peripheral smear is if they are smaller than lymphocyte. Okay. If they are smaller than lymphocyte, that's in microcytic RBC, fine. They are very, very tiny, tiny RBCs here, right? I don't have a lymphocyte, you have a neutrophil in the corner, but it's extremely small. That's how microcytic RBCs look. Okay. Fine. I will ignore, I will do this as well. There's lots of questions in RBC. Uh, let's see. And we are close to 1030. A child presents with recurrent chest infection, abdomen pain. There's history of one blood transfusion in the past. Okay, thank you, Abdullah. And on examination, he had ictus and mild splenomegaly. Uh, electrophoresis shows increased HPF and S spike. And what's the likely diagnosis? Nikoj, I'll take you, uh, I'll answer your question very soon. Fine. Diagnosis, answer. It's a simple one, right? HBFF, HBSS. To solve hemoglobin electrophoresis questions, it's a very, very simple way to solve, right? Just remember this alone. Whenever A2 is elevated, the disease is somewhere related to thalassemia. Okay? I'm simplifying it very much, somewhere related to thalassemia, okay? Whenever hemoglobin F is elevated, I'm talking about a severe hemolytic anemia. If you remember this both, you can solve any question related to hemoglobin electrophoresis. Okay. Always electrophoresis by comparison. We have to compare things and we have to identify. A2 elevated thalassemia, F elevated severe hemolytic anemia, right? This I'm going to show you an image which came in a Lancet article. It's an easiest image to identify electrophoresis, fine. This is normal. Always if your image is given for electrophoresis, normal will be given for comparison, right? A2, F, A. I'll just name rest as 1, 2, 3, and 4. Right? Look at the first case, compare. What are, which are prominent in uh, compared to the normal thing? Can I say A2 is prominent here? Yes. Is F prominent compared to the normal or not in the first case? Is F prominent compared to the normal? It's not prominent, right? So severe anemia or less severe anemia? Just answer that. In the second case, the anemia is severe or less severe? It is less severe, right? Perfect. So it's a less severe anemia with A2, which means I'm having something related to thalassemia but it's less severe, so it is tolerated. I hope you understood the logic behind solving electrophoresis question, right? The less severe thalassemia, thalassemia trait, 
but thalassemia minor the second second patient i do have a2 at the same time i have f the so f means more severe anemia and there is a2 so this is tal major it's tal major here but the third one third one is even more simple i have hemoglobin s and then i have hemoglobin a there's yes as well as there is a so my hemoglobin here is hemoglobin as so this is full blown sickle cell anemia sickle cell trait sickle cell trait right uh, deepak and others batch prof wise will announce soon just wait for some time right this sickle cell anemia trait this is for your seniors wish them good luck they have exam coming close so we are going it in a fast way right the last one there is hemoglobin f again for comparison there is f here and there is very good amount of hemoglobin s when there is f there it's a severe anemia and there is hemoglobin s this is hb ss if you carefully note there is no hemoglobin a at all right so this hb ss which is sickle cell anemia hb is a sickle cell anemia right okay so this is the simplest way to solve your hemoglobin atrophosis whatever comes same logic just don't forget this too a2 elevated thalassemia f is there severe hemolytic anemia and always compare with the normal when you compare with the normal you can easily sail through it right i hope you won't have any confusion henceforth in hemoglobin electrophoresis related questions fine so in this question it's elevated increased hbf and is which means it's sickle cell anemia it's not a trait here right great perfect i'll just finish this question uh, we saw this image already so tell me what this is we have seen the image in the list of rbc images what we saw again this is a pyq it's a cystiocyte the irregular sharp edge that cystiocyte so you have give me a second limo and tell you right the so cystiocyte will be seen in mechanical heart valve splenomegaly no mechanical heart valve is one of the cause of cystiocytic anemia right limo beta 4 and gamma 4 are, is also extremely easy to remember right yeah, i'll show you a simple way see in thalassemia alpha you have four different types first two i will leave the third variant where there is three alpha deletion so these kids are thal major they will present after birth okay if they present after birth what type of hemoglobin will they have hemoglobin f or hemoglobin a a thal major three alpha deletion presents after birth they'll have hemoglobin f or hemoglobin a they'll have hemoglobin a right in hemoglobin a i have alpha 2 and beta 2 so when i replace this i will replace with beta 4 tetramer got it in the fourth type of alpha thalassemia where there's four alpha deletion if you remember the classical presentation of this patient is hydrops fetalis right so they present in the intrauterine life when they present during intrauterine life i am going to have hemoglobin a or hemoglobin f you have hemoglobin f hemoglobin f is alpha 2 gamma 2 there is no beta at all the kids doesn't they don't know the fetus don't know how to produce beta yet so it cannot produce beta it will be replaced by gamma 4 tetramer clear it's a very simple logic one presents after birth so it's adult hemoglobin beta 4 one presents intrauterine life fetal hemoglobin gamma 4 fine uh, utran how to diagnose hbc if you are asking via electrophoresis c forms a separate band here so it will be written hbc here it forms a separate band fine okay sure shauravir uh, shauravir shauravir sorry the pdf will be there in telegram channel okay okay i'm done with rbc disorders uh,
can i go to systemic pathology and then come to wbc disorders or you want to go to wbc disorders first which one you want to complete first have few things in the uh, systemic pathology left and few things in uh, wbc disorders also what do you want me to take i'm going to take anyway but tell me what do you want me to take great rf systemic path hepcidin sorry bjs uh, see uh, uh, docstar first batch foundation will be announced soon wait for some time uh, hepcidin is not useful for diagnosis Hepcidin is a protein, that's all, right? Okay, I'll go to stomach. And if you guys are still awake and attentive after stomach pathology, we'll go to WBC as well, fine? See, hepcidin is a protein which is produced in the liver, which regulates heme uh, iron metabolism, that's all. Whenever there's hepcidin there, hepcidin down-regulates ferroportin. That's all as a function. When down-regulates ferroportin, the iron does not come outside into the serum, fine? Okay. I hope you got it. Fine. I'll go to stomachs. I think since the majority of them told systemic, uh, like I said, if you guys are still awake and attentive after systemic, I'll definitely do WBCs as well. Fine. I have a few things in leukemia and a few things in the rest left. I'll go to stomach path. Okay. Come. Answer this question. That's a very tricky question. Read carefully and answer. Thank you, Arif. C. Anyone else wants to have a different take? So we have two people who have answered C. Arindam has gone with Takaya Sartreitis. Neelam has gone with Marfan. Okay. Okay, let's take this. Okay. See, Mowart stain is like VVG. It's like VVG. It's a stain which highlights elastic fibers again of the temporal artery. That's one more clue of a 33 year old person who died in motor vehicle accident, which is shown in this image. What's the finding here? I'll zoom this image. Tell me what's the finding you are seeing. What layer is this? Like I said, it's like an elastic tissue stain. The layer which is highlighted is your internal elastic lamina. Am I right in saying that at this part, internal elastic lamina is broken can you see the broken internal elastic lamina here you can see the broken internal elastic lamina right so broken internal elastic lamina is one of the classical findings of both giant cell arthritis and tachyas arthritis it's not just giant cell arthritis so both giant cell arthritis and tachyas arthritis we'll discuss the disease and then we'll come back to this soon fine okay the systemic pathology is the most easiest part it's generally ignored. That's all. Like some of you said, MAD generally takes the upper hand, then they ignore systemic pathology. Jain cell arthritis and Takayazo arthritis. Can I call both of them as uh, chronic inflammation? Yes, I know. Can I tell both of them are chronic inflammation? Am I right in calling them chronic inflammation? Yes. What's the hallmark of chronic inflammation? Sorry, what's the hallmark of chronic inflammation? We just now saw in the first thing one hallmark of chronic inflammation is tissue destruction, healing by fibrosis, right? Tissue destruction, healing by fibrosis. I'll just write TDHF, fine. So, hallmark of chronic inflammation is tissue destruction, healing by fibrosis. Here, it predominantly happens in temporal artery. Here, it predominantly happens in iota. I'm not saying only happens here, it happens in large vessels, right? Let's say temporal artery, again put your pens down, just listen and then we will write it. Temporal artery is having tissue destruction healing by fibrosis. So can I say the lumen of the artery will become smaller? It will become smaller, right? Once it becomes smaller, the temporal region will have less blood supply, right? When it has less blood supply, can I say the patient presents with a headache? 
yes the commonest symptom of jain cell artery is headache that's first symptom jain cell artery is an inflammatory disorder let's assume the inflammation goes to your maxillary artery can i say same tdhs happens in the maxillary artery also it will when the maxillary artery is smaller it supplies your muscles of mastication so you keep on talking you keep on chewing you'll have pain pain on movement is called as claudication you'll have a classical symptom a very specific symptom of jaw claudication i have not picked up there it will progress it will go to ophthalmic artery once it goes to ophthalmic artery causes tissue destruction healing by fibrosis of the ophthalmic artery causes stenosis of ophthalmic artery and it will cause blindness three classical symptoms blindness headache and jaw claudication most of you will know jaw claudication because jaw claudication comes in mcq the simple reason being headache has multiple causes one might be in this class that also can cause headache right but jaw claudication is very specific there are very few diseases which cause jaw claudication temporomandibular joint problem or your jain cell arthritis it's a very classical symptom now my goal is i have to diagnose them to take a biopsy of the temporal artery in microscopy like you guys said it's a chronic inflammation so i need to see granulomas jain cells and tissue destruction we'll go back to the image internal elastic lamina is the strongest layer in the blood vessel if that is destroyed can i call it tissue destruction has happened yes right if elastic fiber is destroyed there's definitely tissue destruction right that's all that's what happens in your temporal arteritis it's a very simple thing temporal artery involved you'll have headache maxillary artery involved you'll have jaw claudication your ophthalmic artery involved you'll have your blindness since the tissue destruction healing by fibrosis in your microscopy i'm going to end up in broken internal elastic lamina that's like a pathognomonic finding it's a very classical finding then you'll have jain cells and ill form granuloma will will i have fibrinoid necrosis here will that be fibrinoid necrosis seen or not you will see fibrinoid necrosis that's a classical finding seen here fibrinoid necrosis will definitely be seen because it is seen in every vasculitis now let's take tracheal artery on the other hand tracheal artery is the most common artery involved is the aorta's branch subclavian artery right subclavian artery is most commonly involved same problem tissue destruction healing by fibrosis that's all right subclavian artery follows as axillary artery follows as brachial artery follows as radial ulnar artery when this gets fibros when subclavian artery gets stenosed can i say the entire limb will have less blood supply yes so the patient presents with pain in the limb if a patient presents with pain from shoulder till the tip of the finger there's weakness there's pain can i also say that cervical spondylosis will also cause the same problem pain in the limb from here to here yes it will also right that's differential diagnosis don't memorize pulseless disease i want you to understand why that is important because there is cervical spondylosis which is a neuropathic pain that also has the same symptom and there's a vascular pain tracheal arteritis which also has the same symptom but vascular pain will have less pulse that's why pulseless disease is important it's a clinical examination for me to differentiate a neuropathic pain versus a vascular pain right you are right in calling it pulseless disease so history is fatigue in the arm or pain in the arm on examination it will not be an absent pulse it will be a very low volume pulse how will you identify low volume pulse the only way to identify low volume pulse is palpate both the radial pulse simultaneously if one is more other is less you can identify low volume pulse right right so that's a classical presence of subclavian uh, your tracheal arteritis that also microscopy has the same finding it has the same finding right now i am right in saying that both these are jain cell arteritis so both these are large vessel arteritis yes both jain cell arteritis as well as tracheal arteritis they are large vessel arteritis right so since both are large vessel arteritis is there a possibility 
Tracheoarteritis arteritis can involve temporal artery and Jain cell arteritis can involve subclavian artery because they are large vessels, that's all, right? The common presentation is this. But having said that, anything can involve anything because Jain cell arteritis doesn't read Robbins and Harrison, right? They will involve what they want to. They will involve large vessel. So the only way to differentiate is clinically I cannot, microscopically I cannot. The only thing I can differentiate is age. Age is the most important clue. If it's greater than 50 years, Jain cell arteritis. Less than 50 years, Takia's arteritis. Don't ask me what to do if it's 50 years. Wait for a year and diagnose as Jain cell arteritis. Like AR said, it will rarely be seen above 40 years. That's why we have kept 50 as a cutoff, right? So it's less than 50 years, Takiasu, more than 50 years, Jane Arteritis. Yes? Yes, I am distilled poison. Now look at this. Now tell me the answer. So this is not important for me. This is not important for me in this question. The only thing important for me in this question is 33 year old. Now tell me the answer. 33 year old. It's a very simple answer now. It's Takayasu disease. It's not Jain cell arteritis. Though it's a temporal artery, my answer is based on the age group. It becomes your Takayasu arteritis, right? I hope it's simple and I hope it's easier now. Fine? Great. Answer? Again, it's a very simple question. Irregular bulky friable vegetations are seen in which of the following disorder? Islamic video. Everyone is asking in different, different languages. I wish I know everything. It's a classical uh, thing for infective endocarditis, right? Great. There are four vegetations which classically will come in disorders like um, in MCQs. We'll draw the valves like this. Okay. But this is quadra tendine, it's just a line diagram, right? And this is your valve. This edge of the valve, right? This edge of the valve, we're going to call it an lines of closure. Okay, it's called as a lines of closure, right? That's the edge of the valve, right? Okay. So now we'll have four different things. So like I said, I have four different types of vegetations. We'll try to compile everything in the same uh, page so that you can read this and you can recollect whatever is required for you. The first is rheumatic heart disease. The other one is your infective endocarditis. We have something called as NBTE. We have something called as Libman sex. Everyone knows, right? Libman sex is the most useless thing which every doctor knows. Lipman sacs endocarditis seen in which condition? SLE, right? You will never see Lipman sacs endocarditis in your life. But because of the MCQ exam, everyone knows Lipman sacs endocarditis, right? Now let's compare all of them. Rheumatic heart disease is the smallest vegetation. This is the large vegetation. Okay? Rheumatic heart disease is extremely small and it will be seen along the lines of closure. When I say lines of closure, let's say this is your valve, it closes. This edge of the valve, right, that's called as line of closure, right? In your NBT also will be seen along the lines of closure. Again at the edge of the valve. Lipman sacs is seen on the leaflet. It's seen both on atrial and ventricular side. It's seen on both sides of the atrial and ventricular. That's a very classical finding for Lipman sacs. Rheumatic heart disease vegetation. Do you think they'll be infective or sterile? Rheumatic heart disease, infective or sterile? It'll be sterile, right? It'll be a sterile vegetations. Okay. Put a star here. The reason why I want you to put a star is if you read rheumatic heart disease, there will be one bacteria which will always be in the back of your head. You might miss and call it infective, but it is due to immune destruction. 
it is sterile nbt the full form stands for non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis this is nothing but thrombus this is made of thrombus fibrin thrombi it's non bacterial it's also sterile nbt is generally seen in in stage of cancers in end stage of cancers like your pancreatic cancer or your apml acute polymeristic leukemia we see them it's seen in end stage of cancers right lipman sacs like i said atrial ventricular it's sle related so it's made of antigen antibody complex again it's sle it's non sterile so it's non infective it's also sterile the only person who is infective is infective endocarditis that's in the name it's the largest of all they are very very friable if they are extremely big and friable what is the side effect if they are extremely big and friable what is the side effect it will break right it can undergo septic embolus they form septic emboli if the septic emboli goes to your brain it causes a brain abscess if it goes to a vessel it causes mycotic aneurysm it goes somewhere and it causes infections right that's all it does it's friable extremely friable right and they are obviously infective okay. this table if it if one question comes out of it i'll be the most happiest person right so this is the place where you might miss you might make a mistake rhd it's bacteria but in heart there is no bacteria it's the immune mediated damage so it is sterile rest everything i'm sure you will answer it and the everyone will answer with 100% certainty is lipman sacs endocarditis right it's seen in sla i have missed that i am sure everyone knows it there's no point in writing that right great so we know about all the four vegetations required for us right great okay next what is the structure a different color what is the structure lima i have not read golgen i have done my md pathology so i have read books bigger than golgen right but i have heard golgen is a very very good book i have to read it that's your quadra tendine right this is your valve okay it's the edge of the valve this is the edge of the valve can i say that this edge of the valve is extremely irregular it's extremely irregular right there are very tiny 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 projections these tiny projections is what is rheumatic heart disease projections and these are called as verruca okay very tiny it looks like the wart verruca vulgaris so we call them a verruca right papillary muscle will be way below the quadra tendine so i'm i'm we're not seeing it maybe in the background there okay Great. answer Ten seconds. I'll keep quiet. Answer. Contraction band necrosis is a classical finding seen in reperfused myocardium. Right. Answer is contraction band necrosis. We'll see what does contraction band necrosis mean, and we'll also quickly go through the post mortem changes in MI in heart. that's also an important topic i don't know at one point of time i feel that pathologists should stop asking questions in heart in reality i have seen one endocardial biopsy in 9 years one biopsy of heart that's all it's extremely rare they should let it go but they're not letting it go say so they are asking post mortem findings and everything ego problem that's all heart is for general medicine leave it i have many other systems i have to go ahead and target with that right let's take How many of you have thrombolysed patient? Any one of you have given thrombolysis? Not given thrombolysis. There's only one important thing in thrombolysis: the critical time. That's very very important for thrombolysis, right? Uh, when Santosh Patel takes medicine, he'll talk about critical time, right? So critical time for MI is very very important, right? So when there's MI, you have to give thrombolysis. 
one of the modalities of treatment either percutaneous angiogram or a streptokinase or altiplase fine so let's say there's a vessel which has been occluded by the thrombus and this is the area of myocardium which the vessel supplies which is dying or dead right dying or dead so this thrombolysis if i give before your critical time Yeah, critical time for thrombos, uh, thrombolysis for MI and this one for stroke, right? Uh, Niksha, I, I hate examiners for the only reason. Uh, see, I believe the students who are here, you are extremely smart than me. You are extremely knowledgeable. You have access to everything. But this exam is not making you do the fullest of your potential. That's the only reason I hate the exam. There's no exams. I'm sure you guys will perform way better than with exams. That's my opinion, right? So if I give thrombolysis before I mean, what will happen is I will save them, save from infarction. Save the MI from infarct. Okay. But if I give thrombolysis after the critical time, that's my concern here, right? Okay. If I give thrombolysis after the critical time, what happens is Let's assume I have crossed the critical time. I'll take whatever limosid 4.5 hours in stroke or something in your heart, right? The thrombolysis, I have removed the thrombus. But at this point of time, when it goes beyond the critical time, this myocardium will be already dead. And there'll be few more areas of myocardium which is in the phase of dying. Okay? So to this dead myocardium and the penumbra region of dying myocardium, I am letting the blood go inside. You must have read about penumbra and stroke, right? So I am going to let the blood go inside to a dead myocardium and to the dying myocardium. A dying myocardium will not have its full functionality. This statement is right. So can I say a dying myocardium will not have enough amount of catalase, superoxide dismutase? Yes, what are these? Catalase, superoxide dismutase. What are these? What is the function of these? They are all antioxidants, right? Free radical scavengers. So this dying myocardium will already have less antioxidants. All the enzymes will be less, right? But when the blood enters here, the blood will go there and the blood will have more free radicals. So can I say, now the blood has become the villain because the blood has lots of free radicals and the dying myocardium doesn't have antioxidants so it goes and destroys everything, right? So when I reperfuse or when I thrombolase beyond the critical time, what is more important for me is it causes death of more myocardium, more cells. That becomes detrimental for us, fine? Uh, now man, give us a month, we'll definitely announce it, okay? Not only that, free radical induced injury is the most common reason for reperfusion injury. We call them reperfusion injury. Okay. There's one more problem as well. When I infuse fresh blood, am I right in saying that there'll be fresh calcium ions? Yes, there'll definitely be fresh calcium ions. When calcium goes to a muscle, I'll come to a thema, a hikmat. When calcium goes into a muscle, what does it do? It will cause contraction. So when the reperfusion, there will be increased calcium as well. This calcium will cause hypercontraction because there is more calcium, right? This hypercontraction is what in microscopy I see them as contraction band. You can easily appreciate a contraction band. So whenever I see contraction band, which means lots of calcium has come into a dying myocardium, which is hypercontracted, which means I have reperfused after the critical time, right? Reperfusion in sense, you are too young to know this. For a dead tissue, I am giving the blood back. That's what reperfusion means, fine? Okay, so I'll show you contraction band necrosis. Can you... Notice the fibers, they're extremely thick, dark fibers. These are contraction band necrosis. Okay. 
the classical finding for mi so it's very very important to know this right see the first onset of chest pain is generally considered the point of injury so whether it's ongoing chest pain or not the onset of chest pain is more important because it could be multifocal in fact so in a thrombolysis everything is going to be taken care of right the first onset of pain is a starting point and when you start thrombolysing that's a starting point and you calculate it fine okay clear and now let's go to your post mortem appearance of mi post mortem findings in mi pathologists do post mortem i don't know how many of you guys know this forensic people do post mortem for medico legal cases i have done post mortem when i was in jibma central ncus primarily they do post mortem for medical cases like icu related deaths or a perinatal death abortion i have to do post mortem and tell the cause of death right so in that way yes post mortem is being done by pathologist but very rare for mi right so once it's done i'll get a heart like this by looking at the heart in naked eye is there a possibility you can identify its normal myocardium or infarcted myocardium you cannot it's very very difficult right so what we do is we cut them we cut them like a stick right we just cut them and then we do a gross stain it's not microscopy i just pour it on right so this stain is ttc ttc stands for triphenyl tetrasodium chloride and the stain is red in color it's a normal color stain once i add it there are two possible colors one the myocardium stays in red color the other the myocardium changes to pale appearance i'll tell you the reason for pale pale color happens because of extra cellular ldh okay. just listen carefully in answer when do you think ldh comes in the extra cellular way sure international affairs when do you think ldh comes to the extra cellular space normal myocardium or a necrosed myocardium only in a necrosed myocardium right because in a necrosed myocardium the fluid the intracellular enzymes comes outside right so red color means that's a normal myocardium since the enzymes came outside right that's when i'm going to call it a necrosed myocardium Okay, so that's the concept of gross staining. I'll show you an image which is from Robbins. I'm sure you must have seen the image, right? There are two colors here, three colors ideally. Let's say one, two, and this person three. Extremely white. Which you think is necrosed? One, two, or three? Which is necrosed? Definitely the second part, which is pale, is necrosed, right? So this part is necrosis. this is completely normal extremely white one it's a scar it's a scar tissue that's all one is normal two is necrosed and third one which is extremely white is an old scar tissue fine i hope you can see the difference this is how ttc will look right pinel tetrasodium chloride clear great now let's go to microscopy so what is my job is take a section from this look into the microscope and tell the probable time of infarct i'm sure you must have read a table from robbins that'll be a huge table i don't like the table because it's practically not applicable i won't follow the table i'll give you a different a combined time then i'll tell you why as well because if you look at the table what it have given us is scar will be fibrocentral what it have given us that be points which says starting of neutrophils peak of neutrophils disappearance of neutrophils starting of macrophages peak of macrophages disappearance of macrophages right i'll come to it limo when i see macrophage in a microscopy can i tell it is starting or in the peak or disappearing i cannot so the huge entire page consuming table is when i have a series of events i cannot take biopsy seriously in a series of events in a dying person or in a post mortem right so i cannot apply that what i can see is neutrophil scene so and so date macrophage scene so and so date so it becomes much easier for me right 
the timeline of infact is extremely simple less than half an hour uh, yes limo any scar any scar be it 10 years also it will have the same appearance right? less than half an hour there will be no light microscopic finding okay half an hour to four hours of infarct what you'll have is waviness of fibers there are two schools of thought we'll see that later on right the myocardium will be wavy you must have seen a normal myocardium this is going to be wavy right four to 24 hours that's till a day you will see necrosis only what will be the color of necrosis i've taught you almost four and a half hours of pathology you must tell me what will be the color of necrosis if you don't tell i'll be extremely sad the color of necrosis pink or blue i'm sure you will tell it like i said you are extremely smart what's the color of necrosis pink or blue great necrosis has to be and will be pink in color because blue is for nucleus necrosis is a dead cell will not have a nucleus it will be completely pink in color right perfect so once necrosis is over you must have read in the first chapter necrosis is associated with inflammation what is the first inflammatory cell who comes inside any disease is one inflammatory cell who comes inside which is neutrophil so one to three days okay one to three days what i'll see is i will see necrosis plus i will see neutrophils what robin says is if i have to say the first day more necrosis less neutrophils last day less necrosis more neutrophils one to three days i'll see ne necrosis plus neutrophil and i'm sure you will know how to identify that i am good sir okay uh, BGS, this time period is the time of death. Okay, a person, if I am seeing this, I will tell to the doctor or the court that this patient had MI one to three days back. Fine. Right? Okay. Great. So, neutrophil, I am sure you know how to identify. It will have a bent nuclei, right? It will have an extremely bent nuclei. That's how you pick up neutrophils, right? Great. Next, after neutrophils, What's the next inflammatory cell that comes in? There's neutrophil. After that, one more person enters who will remove neutrophil, who will take care of everything. That's a person who eats, who's like us, who is macrophage, right? So four to seven days, what I'm going to have is, I'm going to have only macrophage. There are two things here. You are going to tell how it looks. Okay, you're going to say how it looks macrophage color in microscopy you know how to identify it's just based on colors and i have only three colors what will be the color of macrophage in microscopy for me perfect right so in microscopy when i see clear areas lots of clear areas i'm going to call it a macrophage that's what in microscopy i have one more important clinical correlation here great like whatever limo said when macrophage clears everything it removes the dead tissue, it removes the neutrophil, there is only macrophage. So can I say between 4 to 7 days, the myocardium is kind of weak because no tissue is there, only macrophage is there. Yes, myocardium is weak. So is there a possibility between 4 to 7 days, the myocardium can undergo rupture? There is a possibility, right? This is the timeline for myocardial rupture as well. So if I can extrapolate this fact, if I can extrapolate this, can I say any surgical wound which heals by secondary intention, 4 to 7 days or 5 to 8 days is the time it will be extremely weak. Is that right? Because that's time when I'll have lots of macrophage, right? So if you can correlate this with a surgery topic called as burst abdomen, laparotomy, the scar will just burst to eight days right or four to seven days it will happen only at this point of time so if you're a surgeon if you're doing extremely complicated intra-abdominal surgery this timeline take care of it if it's a you are a cardiologist there's a massive mi this timeline take care of it 
because this is the time the area is extremely weak and there is definitely a chance of rupture right it will rupture in some of them it might not rupture in everyone but definitely there is chance of rupture in this time right great so now macrophage has two roles one is to clear everything the other role of macrophage is to make sure the healing starts seven to ten days i'm going to have the healing tissue i'm sure everyone must have seen the healing tissue all of you must have cleared uh, diabetic foot right you must have put dressing for diabetic foot what's the color of it reddish color and that's called as granulation tissue right the healing tissues other name is granulation tissue it's extremely red in color it's fully red in color right so if something is red in color, that should be rich in blood and blood vessels. So in microscopy, I am going to see two, two things here. One is blood vessels. The blood vessels form are extremely tiny capillaries. The way to identify capillaries, look at the RBC. Don't look at intima media, you will not see them. RBC in a round space, capillary, that's all. And it's a granulation tissue, it's a healing tissue. It will also have collagen. It will have collagen like three that's also a question type three collagen is an mcq in granulation tissue fine right? after 10 to 14 days limo york answer to your question anything after 10 to 14 days it will be a complete collagenous scar see scar should be stronger it should not be weak type three collagen is not the strongest collagen which is the strongest collagen in the body in other words, which collagen is seen in bone? Because bone is very, very strong, right? That collagen, it will change to. When it becomes a scar, a type 3 collagen changes to a type 1 collagen. It's a scar tissue. It has to be strong. So automatically changes to type 1 collagen. That's a concept between change of type 3 to type 1 because it has to become stronger, right? And the stain for collagen is Mason strike room. Okay. That's the same for collagen, Mason strike round, right? Perfect. So we know everything. We know the theory of it. I'm going to show you images. You are going to tell me the timeline of infarct. You know how to identify necrosis. You know how to identify neutrophils. You know how to identify macrophage. You know how to identify blood vessel. And Mason strike you will be able to identify for sure. Right? Eight. What is this? Tell me the finding you see in this image. What's this finding? That's your waviness of fiber, right? That's your wavy fiber. That's a classical waviness of fiber seen half an hour to four hours after impact, right? You should be able to easily identify a waviness of fiber, right? Great. Just answer my leading questions. This, all these muscle tissue do they have nucleus what have i put box is there any nucleus there's no nucleus right everything is pink in color i don't see a nucleus at all when there's no nucleus at all it's a necros tissue at the same time i'll zoom it a little bit what are these things in between the muscle can i say the cells have bent nuclei yes can i call them neutrophil yeah so i have neutrophils plus lots of necrotic tissue so i'm going to call this an neutrophils plus necrosis tell me the timeline it's around one to three days post in fact right it's around one to three days post in fact got it Great. a four to 24 hours will be only necrosis will not have neutrophils since it has both so i'm going to say one to three days after in fact what is this Again, it's everything is about color and I have only three colors, pink, blue and clear. What do I have here? I have lots of cells with clear cytoplasm, right? Lots of cells with clearing of cytoplasm, lots of clear areas. So this is nothing but macrophage. If this macrophage, what's the timeline of infarct? It's four to seven days. It's very simple, four to seven days. Lots of clear areas. Macrophage four to seven days, most common time when a rupture can happen, be it my uh, pre-wall rupture or a septal rupture. Right? Okay, what are these? What color is this? 
tell the color color is the first thing which will help us to diagnose many many things i have some reddish one tiny 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 round round red structures can i call them as blood vessels the blood vessels right in the background can you see some fibers actually this is not a normal stain it's mason trichrome this mason trichrome can you see bluish fibers in the background yes red color tiny blood vessel with bluish fibers in the background that's your new angiogenesis and your granulation tissue age of infarct 7 to 10 days post mi right so this is what age of infarct is about if i don't see blood vessels at all and it's completely blue in color it's a scar tissue okay great right so we know almost everything required for understanding post-mortem appearance of an mi i hope you won't make a mistake in mi or in your uh, vegetations or in vasculitis fine little bit of it we have read it okay okay let's go to the next thing read the question and comment <clears throat> and so it's a very big question first thing take it out of your mind if the question is big it's not difficult it's easy I don't know DK, I have lots of things to discuss, so I'll try to finish in some time and maybe we'll uh, read it again something, sometime later. Priyanka, postponement mortem of PG, I'm not going to talk about, you have your NEET exams, unless and until N NMC or MC announces something, then we'll think about postponement. mortem fine. Great. See, I'm going to take about, take clues here. It's a five line question. Whenever I have five line question, I have lots of clues there, right? One, the first line, chronic non-productive core performance along with loss of appetite and 6 kg weight loss. Inflammatory, benign or malignant? With this history alone, what will you think of? See, I have to group the disorders. Lung only is inflammation or benign or malignant. I think more towards malignancy because loss of appetite and 6 kg weight loss, right? Is more about malignancy so i'll remove this person there's no remarkable findings fnac shows uh, some cancer and a light lobectomy was done microscopic appearance is so as below right so the classical appearance seen here is this can i call this a gland does it look like a gland it does look like a gland i have one more important finding here i'll talk about that soon subplural mass Right. So I have glandular appearance here. So the only tumor which can have glandular appearance is adenocarcinoma. A few more clues like JLX may said, there's no history of smoking. That's one of the tumors in non-smokers, right? EGFR positive. That's also seen in adenocarcinoma, right? That's also seen in adenocarcinoma. Those are all additional clues. But what tells me exactly it's adenocarcinoma is the gland, right? Let's look at lung cancers. Lung cancer is one important topic which can come from the lung chapter. Okay. Again, I'll try to cover everything required in a single page. Before that, we'll uh, give reasons to most common. Because, like I said, you shouldn't memorize anything in medicine till it has a reason. If it has a reason, remember the reason. If it has no reason, then memorize. Fine. If you look at, uh, see, I've been teaching for 8-9 years. Over the period of years, what happens is, uh, some point of time they will say that this disease is common in India. This disease is common in the world. This type is common in India, this type is common in the world. A disease does not know it's affecting an Indian or an American. The only reason there's a difference is, Indians don't care about epidemiology. Americans care about epidemiology, that's all. That's the only reason there's a difference. Otherwise, there's no reason there's a difference. When you look at lung cancer, the previous school of thought was, in India, squamous cell customer is more common. In the world, adeno customer is more common. In smokers, squamous cell customer, non-smokers, adeno customer. That was not the case at all. Everywhere, it is adeno customer only. If you read medicine properly, it's very simple for me. The most common cancer in India, in abroad, in men, in women, in smokers, in non-smokers, 
everything is only one adenocarcinoma why there is a change previously what you read was right smokers had squamous cell carcinoma non smokers have adenocarcinoma now everything is only one person adenocarcinoma bit simple for us right because the smoking habit changed smoking is a major concern here smoking habit changed that's why the cancer also changed you have to look little bit in detail and understand many more things in depth right so let's take a crude variant of smoke bd when the crude variant of smoke was smoked what happened was the big particle size stayed in the bronchus when a particle carbon particle or a neoplastic particle stays in the bronchus it will irritate the bronchus what metaplasia will it cause uh, whatever is comfortable for you k what metaplasia will it cause squamous or columnar it causes squamous metaplasia right cause squamous metaplasia when it causes squamous metaplasia it will result in squamous cell carcinoma on the other hand when you use filtered cigarettes these days bds are very rare filtered cigarettes are very common the reason is tobacco companies came up with a solution when you put a filter the bigger particle size will be filtered when the bigger particle size are filtered where will the smoke go the smoke goes to the alveoli when it goes to the alveoli it will form cancers which will be like an alveoli it causes adenocarcinoma why did they put a filter is the reason for putting a filter is just so that the person will not cough during smoking to improve the user experience tobacco companies did for a different reason cancers changed for a different reason right so that's how in depth science is when you change your way of behaving the incidence changes it's very simple so if whatever i have told is true because i could have made it up right i could have just made it up to make myself look intellectual or it look interesting if i have made it up there are few things which will not fit in evidence will not fit in if whatever i have said is true if it's a crude variant of smoke the smoke settles in bronchus the smoke settles in bronchus can i say squamous cell carcinoma will be seen close to hilum yes will that be true it should be true right same thing a fine variant of smoke if it goes till the alveoli where should be the tumor subpleural or close to the hilum it has to be subpleural that's why in the question i said subpleural mass is also a important thing for me subpleural mass i'll think of adenocarcinoma hilar mass i'll think of squamous cell carcinoma right that's how classical it is right so whatever you have read will be there if it fits whatever you read is correct peripheral tumor or subpleural tumor right like i said i'll compile everything in a single page the reason why i am trying to teach you more than what you require the reason why i am trying to go in depth this i want you to enjoy medicine the enjoyment is lacking you are just learning to pass an exam you learn to feel it once you do that you do not have exams to learn you will automatically learn you need not have me to learn you will take your book book will give you euphoria it will give you dopamine you will definitely learn right interest interest is the only thing slightly lacking we'll make sure it'll it'll automatically come to us fine so first for me is metastasis okay i'll take mets also because mets is the most common malignancy all over it's more common than primary that's the most common thing right then we'll take squamous cell carcinoma then we'll take adenocarcinoma and i'll take small cell carcinoma that's one of the neuroendocrine tumors or i'll i'll name it as neuroendocrine why small cell fine neuroendocrine okay fine so these are the four different things and we'll try to compile everything in the same place fine ashish if you have any doubt do let me know i'll try to answer you for sure fine so mets are the most common tumor they are more common than in primary uh you are a ninth standard rahul please read your uh, things complete it join mbbs you have lots of time to read don't worry about it right mets are always always in the periphery it's always in the periphery mets are always multiple 
it's very very rare to find a single metastasis it will be multiple and one more classical finding is mets are always well defined you actually know all this finding the only reason is you don't believe that you know findings that's all i'm right in saying that everyone here must have heard about cannonball secondaries you must have heard about cannonball secondaries right okay you must have heard about cannonball metastasis right the cannonball is well defined multiple lesions will be close to the periphery right it will be in the parenchyma only but in the periphery of it fine squamous cell carcinoma they are not the common one they are hilar masses or i can call them as central region central masses if if a tumor is there in the bronchus it's here can i say it has more space to grow it definitely has more space to grow right it keeps on growing more and more and more and more when it goes more and more the center part of the lesion what will happen to the blood supply the blood supply will reduce when the blood supply reduces it will have necrosis so it'll have central necrosis it's a dead tissue it's a necrosis tissue when i take an x ray of a necrosis tissue i will not see anything so it look like a cavity as a very classical finding a cancer of the lung which presents as cavity is squamous cell carcinoma right you will have cavities on chest x ray and one classical finding the paraneoplastic syndrome hypercalcemia okay squamous cell carcinomas microscopic finding is keratin pearl this is the microscopic finding for every squamous cell carcinoma throughout the body everything throughout the body be it your uh, skin vulval vaginal penile anal canal esophagus lungs oropharynx trachea nasopharynx everywhere everywhere squamous cell carcinoma has only finding keratin pearl i'll show you how a keratin pearl looks keratin is pink in color and will be round like a whorl that's what keratin pearl is ccc can be a mnemonic central region central necrosis cavity hypercalcemia okay great adenocarcinoma so most common primary tumor of lung overall most common tumor is metastasis that's all right thank you sai so here it's seen in the periphery mostly they are single and ill defined multiple periphery metastasis single periphery adenocarcinoma because both are peripheral lesions right uh, we shall mets again you are too early when you come to second year we'll learn lots about metastasis right next microscopy of adenocarcinoma you will have glands that's one important thing there is an in situ pattern of adenocarcinoma which has something called as lepidic pattern of spread this is common in mcq so just remember that it's lepidic pattern of spread because i do have lots i'll try to complete a little bit in time so whenever we get more time we'll try to cover the rest as well fine i'll tell keshav IHC for adenocarcinoma, like someone said, I want you guys to remember both this IHC, TTF one, Napsin A, both are important, and genetics is important only for adenocarcinoma. The adeno develops in a scar. Fine. Genetics is not important for squamous, not important for small cell. It's very very important for adenocarcinoma, and I want you to remember three genes: EGFR. If EGFR is mutated. it have a good prognosis i am sure ankit sir must have told about egfr drug yesterday can anyone tell me the drug of egfr keras mutated doesn't have a good prognosis bad prognosis and one more guys alquan these three are must why i am saying these three are must is because when a lung carcinoma is diagnosed if the patient is affordable we do all the three mutations and then only they start the treatment that's why it's very very important so medical oncologist knows this a pathologist knows this surgeon medicine people knows this so it might come in an exam fine that's all right practical application is more important and these two have practical application great 
So EGA5 with SPOS2, they do have very good prognosis and EGA5 is the commonest mutation seen in Asia, right? I don't know about the drug, you know better than about drug. For me, I stop with diagnosis, right? Neuroendocrine. Neuroendocrine tumors are also central lesions. Okay. Carcinoid. Benign or malignant? Carcinoid. Carcinoid has a classical appearance called as nesting pattern. They have nests of tumor cells. I'll show you all these images. They have tumor cells in round or oval nests, right? The most aggressive tumor is small cell carcinoma. You guys have not answered my question. Carcinoid is benign or malignant? Carcinoid is malignant. It's a low grade malignancy. Carcinoma is also malignancy. Right? So everything is malignant, it's not benign at all, right? Small cell carcinoma has a very classical pattern called uh, appearance called as azopardi effect. So azopardi effect is nothing but thank you, Ashik. So azopardi effect is nothing but you will have the destroyed DNA in and around the blood vessel, right? So you'll have a blood vessel here. Surrounding this, you will have DNA material. You have DNA material surrounding the blood vessel. That's classical azopardi effect. Okay. Whatever neuroendocrine tumor it is, marker is same. Yeah. NSC, you have chromogranin, and you have synaptophysin. Okay. That's marker for any neuroendocrine, right? The coach pathologies, microbiology is microorganisms, pathology is tissue, hemat, and cyto. So try to recollect this. Maybe if I want to add one, one extra finding IHC for squamous cell carcinoma P40, P63, right? That will cover almost everything required for your lung uh, tumors, fine. Mets, squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, and neuroendocrine tumor, right? Let's just quickly go through all the images and let's see what we can do, right? Okay. So this is bronchus, right? So I'm having a tumor arising from the bronchus. Squamous or adeno? Squamous or adeno? It's a classical squamous cell carcinoma, right? It's squamous cell carcinoma. Classical squamous cell carcinoma, central lesion. It's extremely white. Squamous cell carcinomas will be white, right? And this is keratin. That's also keratin. It will be extremely white, pearly white lesion, fine? What is this? Your keratin pearl. You have this uh, keratin in world appearance, pinkish color. That's how a keratin pearl looks, right? Classical findings seen in squamous cell carcinoma, right? This is pleura. So, this lesion can I call it a peripheral lesion? Peripheral subpleural lesion? Yes, it's definitely a peripheral subpleural lesion. So, this is your adenocarcinoma. Okay. okay, that's an adenocarcinoma. Actually, it will be in the telegram group. If you look at this tumor, can I call this a gland? Can I call that a gland? I'll add one more important finding here. That's a gland, right? Perfect. That's also an adenocarcinoma, right? So when we read cancers, I told you that one important finding to call it a malignancy is basement membrane invasion, right? So let's assume this is an alveoli and I'm having gland shaped pleomorphic cells. So can I say I can call it a cancer only when this cell moves to the interstitium. That's what is basement membrane invasion. Yes. When the cell moves to the interstitium, I can call it a basement membrane invasion. Am I right in saying that? Yes. So when a cell goes that, fine. So when a cell goes into that part, I'm going to have response by the interstitium okay. it will respond back how does interstitium respond back okay how does interstitium respond back interstitium responds back by producing fibrosis because a neoplastic cell going into interstitium is wound injury so it responds back by producing fibrosis can i say in between the glands, I'm having pink areas of fibrous tissue. That's the sign of invasion, right? 
So this fibrous tissue is very very important. In the interstitium there is fibrosis. I can link this to multiple places. Perfect. Like what Jayalakshmi says, this fibrosis seen in a cancer, we call it a desmoplasia. Again, like I said, everything is there in the word. Everything is there in the word. Plasia is growth. Desmo means fibers. You know desmo means fibers right from your first year of MBBS. Syndesmotic joint. Fibrous joint. Desmo means fibers. And because of this desmoplasia, can I say it's not only in adenocastoma, any cancer which has inflammation will have that? Yes. Any cancer, with in, any cancer with invasion will have that. So any carcinoma on palpation, will it be soft, firm or hard? Soft, firm or hard? Answer, soft, firm or hard? It has to be hard, right? It has to be hard on palpation. That's why when you read surgical textbook of Das, that's an amazing textbook for surgery. Heart on palpation, you suspect cancer. Soft, generally I don't suspect cancer. Because when I palpate something hard, I imagine desmoplasia has happened. I imagine invasion has happened. I imagine it's a cancer. So I take a biopsy. Whatever you have read in your MC, in your clinical examination will make sense. Should make sense. If it doesn't make sense, it's tough, right? So invasion is important. It's difficult to find invasion, but look at the uh, pink interstitial. That means it is invaded, right? Great. So this is a classical nesting pattern seen in carcinoid. See, nesting pattern will be seen in any carcinoid, be it GI carcinoid, lung carcinoid, any neuron decline. Gastrinoma will have nesting pattern. Pheochromocytoma, nesting pattern. Paraganglioma, nesting pattern. Because all of them are neuron decline. Pheochromocytoma, paraganglioma will be positive for NSC, chromogranin, and synaptopoiesin. Learn as a group. Any neuron decrement tumor will have the same thing, same nesting pattern, right? Okay. You can, I am sure you, you are able to appreciate the red color. So that's a blood vessel. You can see the blood. There's a blood vessel. Surrounding that, I have bluish areas. Again, a blood vessel, blood vessel, blood vessel, blood vessel. And you have blue areas surrounding the blood vessel, right? So that's your classical asopardi effect. Classical body effect, right? Seen in small cell carcinoma of lung, right? So those are few images for lung cancer. We know how squamous looks in microscopy. We know how your adeno looks in microscopy. Carcinoid looks in microscopy. And also small cell carcinoma in microscopy. We know the location. We also know the INCs, fine? Super. And also we know the paraneoplastic syndrome for squamous as well as small cell carcinoma from the earlier part of the lecture, right? Nice. Madhavan, asopardi effect means see you are seeing a blood vessel. Surrounding the blood vessel, you are seeing lots of destroyed DNA, blue color smudge. That's called as an asopardi effect, right? Okay. Comment on the answer. It's a very classical question. Okay, should start with B. B. I love this disease. B, B, nice, celiac. Okay, any one of you here uh, in the chat box, uh, are you either from Gujarat or Punjab? Any Gujarati or Punjabi? No? This disease is because of them. Uh, not, you didn't cause it. You gave it to foreigners. So it's good for Gujaratis and Punjabis, right? See, these two people right Gujaratis and Punjabis has few things unique for them wherever they go they never let their food go away food is very very important for these two communities I'm not saying other people don't let go but these two if you have a Punjabi family in a place you'll have Punjabi Daba for sure Gujarati family in a place you'll have sweet shops for sure that's how they are that's how they are made of and there's two things important for them these two communities Travel abroad for business very frequently, right? Both Gujaratis as well as uh, Gujaratis as well as Punjabis. So when they went outside years back, not now, I'm talking about decades back, they took my food and went to UK. 
when they took our food and went to uk fortunately or unfortunately indian food is tasty so the uk people thought okay let me eat naan and paneer butter masala when they ate that they had diarrhea because they cannot digest that as simple as that right so because their genetic makeup is not made for that our genetic makeup is made for something see uh, if you don't believe in this eat pizzas for next one month you will have diarrhea because your genetic makeup is not made to digest pizza if you're a south indian rice if you're north indian chapatis that's your staple food don't change your food if you change your food everything is going to get screwed up right so what that's the real history of uh, celiac disease if you go and look at the history books of celiac disease that's how it is but you must have not looked at these gluten free products so much so in the last few years last couple of years the gluten free product is extremely high everywhere in india you have gluten free product if you are an indian don't touch it if you start eating gluten free food from now two three generations down the road there is a chance we also will have increased risk of celiac disease why this sensation all over the world came us it's again see it's human beings science is different human beings come and destroy science like uh, rocky said it's bro foods it's barley rye oats wheat so wheat is where everything started wheat is where everything started that's why i said gujarati is in punjabi right wheat is where everything started they said okay i won't eat your food stop it came to oats came to rye the last one to come into celiac diseases barley when barley became sensitive people got irritated uk and us people got irritated right what what is made of barley what is made of barley there is one important thing which is made of barley with uh, which an uk or us people cannot live with yes and mol tell me barley is one of the important constituents of beer when barley became sensitive they said that i am making sure the entire world will eat gluten free food so that i won't have any more sensitivity uh, issues for that right so that's where gluten free food became a huge sensation because barley became it that's why i said human beings change science right change science that's the reason gluten free food is there in delhi is there in mumbai is there in every part of a country right in every part of a country because barley became sensitive celiac is simple it's a gluten sensitive enteropathy if you are an indian you can take care of this period don't touch it the incidence of celiac in india is 1 in 5 lakhs to 10 lakhs incidence of celiac disease in uk is 20% 10 to 20% 20 of 100 people have celiac disease in uk and us if they are caucasians right so what happens is in sensitive people whose hla is dq2 dq8 these are the common hlas this is common in mcq before when these people eat gluten they have an enzyme called as tissue transglutaminase i'm sure you know that that will be converted to gliadin by genetic right a mark score is a microscopic thing i don't want you to remember that it's not required at all i'll tell you why it's not required my genetics know that gliadin is a dietary fiber which i cannot digest so what normal indian people do is will excrete gliadin but this hla doesn't know that so this hla considers gliadin foreign so what happens is this hla will the antigen presenting cells will take gliadin and present to t lymphocytes the t cell starts to destroy the epithelium for me for you not a problem right it goes and destroys epithelium yes sir more please ask it destroys epithelium so once it destroys epithelium the villi is lost can i say the patient will have malabsorption diarrhea that's all right a malabsorption diarrhea that's a simplest thing of celiac disease now you guys are talk- talking about many many antibodies right so now my problem is gliadin the person with celiac disease considers gliadin foreign so if you have something foreign ttg is tissue transglutaminase that's an enzyme right so you have considered gliadin foreign so what should ideally my immune system do 
it's like streptococcus what will your immune system do will they produce antibody they will right so what my body does is to counteract this produces anti gliadin antibodies anti ttg antibodies right they produce anti gliadin anti ttg body as a effect that's not the cause that's a effect of celiac disease right okay so now my role is diagnosis there are two things one is microscopy one is serology it's an autoimmune disorder right what do you think is better microscopy or serology what is better microscopy or serology undoubtedly serology is easier right i wish serology was not discovered so that uh, 20 out of 100 european people must have had colonoscopy to diagnose uh, celiac disease right little pain in the ass right so they looted us for years together thanks to punjabis and gujaratis at least maximum we made them not touch our food right so definitely microscopy is much better than this I'll come to Jay Lakshmi. Fine. Sorry, serology is much better than microscopy. If serology, I'm going to have villus atrophy because the endothelium is so the epithelium is destroyed. So villus is gone. Villus is destroyed, right? So once villus is destroyed, you must have drawn this in your first year. The upward projection is called as villus. What are the downward projection called as? They are called as crypt. They are called as crypt, right? So when villus is destroyed. the crypt will become hyperplastic because crypt is where i have stem cells that's a thing they have crypt hyperplasia okay not just that and i have lymphocytes okay that's very true limo revenge is always sweet right so i have crypt hyperplasia and you have lymphocytes jay lakshmi coming back to your question i have both lymphocytes cd4 as well as cd8 because there are few more in depth your effect i can go i can explain why cd8 maybe we'll take it some other session and i'll try to explain why cd8 as well as cd4 fine okay this is what happens okay now serology anti ttg anti gliadin see these are the main thing this ttg tissue transglutaminase what happens is it kind of cross reacts with multiple people one of the cross reacting thing is endomysium so that's why we have anti endomysial antibodies that's all right okay next year after endomysium it also the same ttg also cross reacts with anchoring filaments i'm sure you know this so anchoring filaments are seen in skin since ttg goes and cross reacts with skin it goes and destroys the skin so what is the disease so this goes and destroys anchoring filaments in the skin so what's the skin condition closely associated with celiac disease great dermatitis herpetiformis okay so whenever there's a bout of celiac ttg gets elevated skin gets affected the patient presents with dermatitis herpetiformis right it's a simple one right so what is best amongst this i don't know since to specific i don't care because the only lab test available in my lab is ttg you can ask for gliadin i won't give you gliadin i'll give you only ttg because this is availability i'm going to practicality because one is 97% sensitive one is 98% sensitive i am really don't worry about it do, do ttg if you want to diagnose yeah that's more than enough right treatment is very simple treatment is stop eating my food right you have ate for years together at least no stop eating my food stopping bro foods is the best treatment for celiac disease right how many of you here eat oats how many of you here eat oats on a daily basis once in a while is fine on a daily basis any of you eat oats oats also is a food fad which came uh, in the past one uh, maybe a decade before that oats was not there oats has been promoted as a high fiber food right oats has been promoted to reduce weight you will reduce weight for sure when you eat oats the reason is oats is an ox food it's not a human food first of all so you cannot digest oats so when you don't digest oats it goes out in the stool 
what it oats does is oats is very notorious it takes the nutrition in the food and goes outside once it takes nutrition in the food and goes outside you will become malnourished not you lose weight you lose weight for sure but you become malnourished as a problem why i am saying oats is a bigger problem for my country is oats binds with iron it is a bigger problem for me right oats binds with iron and it pulls iron and throws outside you look at my country half of my country is not having enough food having iron deficiency anemia other half of the country is having excess food and resorbing to superfoods binding to iron and having same iron deficiency anemia please at least let's have different disease and oats induced iron deficiency anemia is very difficult to treat unless the doctor or the physician doesn't knows this what happens is oats induce iron deficiency anemia if you don't stop eating oats iron tablets also won't work parenteral root of iron only will work okay so oats is a bigger concern see if you are eating oats to reduce weight right it's only one way to reduce weight don't control your food eat well run around more you burn your calorie more thin you become more fit you become by reducing food you will never become fit you will become weak right you will become weak so please eat it uh, i do uh, know lots and lots and things about nutrition because i have hereditary gout so there are many things i can't even touch so researching all this i read one by one by one so accumulated knowledge of nutrition right okay okay true that's about your uh, celiac disease and there's a classical case of celiac disease right i'll complete with this question if you're okay fine uh, i did have dinner there data thank you hope you had dinner i started with a question with no image but an ibq i'm having a question again with no image and ibq but still you can answer the right answer what's the right answer you will answer it for sure i had ashik thank you this came 2 3 years back most of your seniors wrote villas adenoma because they liked it okay i'll wish you shankul shankul okay so here the only thing required for me is age 5 year old cannot be any of this it's only juvenile polyp right so when there is no image what happens is you focus on what you have to focus history even when there is image i want you guys to focus on history because history gives you many many information than anything right 5 year old rectal bleeding polypoidal mass in rectum i'll show about uh, i'll show you the image we'll discuss for sure diagnose the juvenile polyp there are four polyps in intestine we'll finish four polyps we'll wish shankul all of us will wish shankul happy birthday then we'll call it off a day right okay so the first polyp what are you going to discuss is juvenile polyp okay the so juvenile polyp like the age a uh, name says age is the most important clue mostly 5 to 10 years of age juvenile polyp is a very very logical polyp right it is a very good pathogenesis 5 to 10 year old kid when they have constipation they are not like an adult they won't be able to take care of themselves and only when the when they say the pa to the parent they'll come to know till that time they won't come to know right i'll come to it mega we'll we'll complete all the polyps now fine right? So when you take sigmoid column and rectum, it has an angulation, right? What is the muscle? What's the muscle which slings around the recto sigmoid junction, which produces the angulation? I think your puborectalis, right? Right, your puborectalis. So here, what happens is when the person is constipated, when the kid is constipated, the constipated hard feces goes and hits the mucosa. It's due to constipation. and because of the angulation that's why rectum is the most common location of juvenile polyp 
it goes and hits my mucosa okay you can ping me and mole right so once it hits your mucosa it will damage the mucosa there's a slight mucosal damage can i say the damage will always almost always be followed by fibrosis yes so it'll have fibrosis after the damage it's healing right it's fibrosis right now let's see what's going to happen in the microscopic level i'm just having a field this is a gland 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 okay the rectal glands are endocrine gland or exocrine glands they're all exocrine glands right okay, they're all exocrine glands so exocrine glands secrete substance via ducts they don't secrete in the blood they go via ducts so here the fibrosis kind of blocks everything blocks a few not everything a few so when the glands output is blocked but still the gland is functioning so can i say the gland will become huge in size with mucus retention okay. so juvenile polyp is a type of mucus retention polyp the classical finding you will see both normal as well as dilated glands right okay you'll see both normal as well as dilated glands that's how you'll be able to diagnose juvenile polyp right in microscopy you'll have both normal and dilated glands you can pick up juvenile polyp easily right i'll show you the image can i say this image has both normal shaped glands and dilated glands dilated glands dilated glands yes simple right you have both normal shaped as well dilated glands that's how you pick up juvenile polyp fine okay hi sir thank you right. now I, I i want you to remember this see bartholin gland duct cyst right your uh, plunging variant of ranula all of them are retention polyp the problem here is the output is being blocked by fibrosis so can i say if i cut this gland from the outside all the mucus will go outside this is called as marsupialization is actually mass supilization if you remember bartholin gland duct cyst we do that we cut we open it for every mucus retention polyp the treatment is cut and open it mass supilization you can generalize treatment also based on the pathogenesis learn pathology bit and deep so that medicine becomes easier i don't do mass supilization for rectal polyp because it's very difficult to do instead remove it juvenile polyp you excise but for every other retention polyp, we marsupialize. Fine, great. The second polyp here is huge chica polyp. The huge chica polyp again is an important thing. Huge chica is an amazing, amazing polyp. I'm sure you must have seen huge chica polyp in PYQs. Now we we'll learn why it looks like that. See, learning why will solve many, many things for us. Huge chica polyp. There's a mutation, be it syndrome or a polyp. There's a mutation in a gene called as STK11 LKB1. This is a gene. This gene has two functions. Right? This gene has two functions. The first function is they reduce proliferation. It's a tumor suppressor gene. The second function is it maintains polarity. We know what is polarity. We read about polarity of skin when we read about neoplasia right okay so now it's a tumor suppressor gene in pure jigger polyp i'm going to have loss of function mutation of this tumor suppressor gene right loss of function mutation so the proliferation increases and the polarity will be disturbed that's what happens here now let's look at normal mucosa so that we can look at pure jigger polyps we can imagine pure jigger polyps right so normal what are the layers of intestine i'm sure you know the layers of intestine what are the multiple layers of intestine you have mucosa right you have submucosa the glands will be there you have muscularis 
we'll use a pink color and you have serosa right these are the normal layers of intestine so in future polyp what happens is the gland increases in amount because it's proliferation more and more and more glands that's one thing here that's why i'm having a polyp right okay lots of glands are there at the same time like i said polarity will not be maintained so what happens is the muscle comes between the glands muscle is ideally supposed to be way below the glands but since polarity cannot be maintained the muscle comes like this that's why many of you guys were saying arborizing they look like a tree and a branch right happy birthday shankul they look like a tree and a branch so it just is arborizing most of the pugigar polyp because of this arborizing network will have a stalk they are always pedunculated polyps okay they are pedunculated polyps and is completely arborizing with glands all over understood i'll go and show you the image so that you can easily link that that's a pugigar polyp can you see the muscle going between the glands it's a beautiful arborizing polyp it goes like a tree right it goes like a tree and you'll have all of this right yeah, it can have everywhere it's not just in the intestine the most common location is jejunum it can be everywhere it, i won't stop at that we'll extrapolate the same finding of increased proliferation and loss of polarity to one more beautiful finding in pugigar syndrome which i'm sure everyone knows can i say oral cavity is also a part of uh, git yes in oral mucosa i have squamous epithelium right oral cavity is squamous epithelium right if oral cavity is squamous epithelium the lowermost layer of squamous epithelium is basal cell in the basal cell is where if you draw squamous epithelium it's going to be like this in the basal epithelium is where you have your melanocytes this is normal polarity got it melanocytes should be there in the basal layer that's what normal polarity is if there's a mutation in pugigar syndrome the melanocytes will not know to stay in the basal layer so what happens is the melanocytes comes to the top or in the center or even below loss of polarity can i say when melanocyte comes to the top it look like hyperpigmented i am sure you must have read oral mucocutaneous hyperpigmentation right a classical finding in pugigar syndrome because again stk11 lkb1 mutation which disturbs the polarity of the skin in the oral oral mucocutaneous region right classical finding everything what you read should have a reason we are going to go behind the reason we will learn pathology we will love medicine medicine should be loved medicine should not be cracked we should love medicine will learn medicine it's not about exams exam is a by product you will definitely do well fine right that's about pugigar just last two more things two more tumors i have tubular and villus adenoma okay tubular adenoma and villus adenoma the only reason to differentiate them is tubular is very very benign they have they don't do much of problem villus on the other hand will definitely become cancerous there is a more chance of recurrence that's why if you have a patient with tubular adenoma the repeat colonoscopy can be done very slowly villus adenoma i have to do every year so this is for follow up not for diagnosis right any tumor with greater than 75% villi villus adenoma any tumor with less than 25% villi tubular adenoma right varun Uh, anemia i would not comment on it as a part of the syndrome but when a patient has lots of polyp and it starts to bleed that can result in anemia right so you have villi here and here i won't have villi instead i'll have very small glands those small glands are called as tubules okay the only reason okay that's a good one like madan kuti says a villus is villain right so villus adenoma has a very high chance of recurrence and villus adenoma has a very high chance of becoming malignant okay okay as a difference between a tubular adenoma tubular adenoma is very benign you find one tubular adenoma throw it 
very very low chance of uh, having a recurrence and maybe once in 10 years if you want a colonoscopy repeat that's more than enough right okay okay so look at villus adenoma and tubular adenoma as well villi or tubular villi or tubular it is villus right and lots of villi like structure it's villus adenoma right that's how villus adenoma looks beautiful villi most of them are villi right tubular adenoma keep it as diagnosis of exclusion these are tubules the very small tubules that's how a tubular adenoma looks okay got it if there are four polyps in intestine keep tubular adenoma as diagnosis of exclusion last one right because dilated glands you will be able to identify for sure juvenile polyp and age rectum is the clue arborizing lesion pure jugular polyp oral mucocutaneous hyperpigmentation jejunum is the clue villus easy the easiest one to pick up villus adenoma if it is not villi not pure jugular not juvenile go for tubular adenoma i have only four adenomas diagnosis of exclusion right okay those are few things about colonic polyps okay okay i think i will call it off a day here because i don't want to start the other one because it will take a long time i have two things to teach you one is about wbcs I'll definitely take it before exam maybe in pw channel or in my channel or somewhere i'll definitely do it and also about renal these are two things you want to guys know we'll definitely learn about it right Sure, sure, Lemo. Sure, we'll do it. Okay, if you have any other doubts, do let me know. I'll definitely answer. Nikuj, work-life balance is there in any every branch. It's based on you. If you want to become a gynecologist and work nine to five, you can do it. If you want to be a pathologist and work from eight to night, ten o'clock, you can do it. It's with you, right? Okay. Sure, sure, Lemo. I'll do that. WBC part and your uh, renal part, I'll definitely take care of it. I'll definitely do it. Fine. I lacteal cancer. I'm not sure what you want to uh, convey, Madhav. Thank you. Sure, I'll do it platelets as well. Champion, uh, learn general pathology and try to apply the concepts what have you learned in general pathology and write your systemic pathology. Fine. Sure, Devi, I'll do it. Gaurav, if you're giving this neat PG exam, go with the old existing notes and a little bit more MCQs. Fine. The research is a very long journey, Nikunj. Maybe we'll take some other time and talk about it. Fine. Uh, Soumya, that's for PG postgraduates. Uh, I'll postgraduate this an app for myself. I'll take time and definitely finish that app as well. But the only way to remember strains is repeated reading. I will do it, uh, Limo. We'll try to put more concepts to reproductive thing also. Sure, you can do an SP. I'll definitely reply. Maybe not immediately, but I'll definitely reply. Sure, every yeah, next session, once the sprint gets over, I'll definitely uh, take classes. Fine. So thank you for your time, and thank you for patient listening. We started yesterday and we have finished today, and the last next class will be tomorrow at six thirty. It'll be an FMT. So. Uh, Come ahead and learn more with Dr. Manjunath. Fine. Anonymous, you will have it in uh, the PW app. The app will be coming out soon, and hopefully, we will learn more together, both in the live as well as in the recorded thing. A uh, second year, Robbins. Golgen is more of integrated medicine. If you're going for USMLE, go for Golgen. Fine. Sure, Somi, I'll do it. Fine. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, uh, this is a complimentary thing which is in and around the PYQs. Just so it will definitely help you in knowing idea of what will come. Let's go ahead with it. Uh, I'll leave it to Dr. Manjana to teach when, how much to teach forensic. Gaurav, I uh, am not primarily for motivation. Uh, for me, I don't believe in motivation really. I believe in consistency. And the only example I take for consistency is my mother and father. From the day you we were born they are taking care of us right you can never see one more consistent person other than them so look at them you'll definitely be motivated right rahul will do it relaxed in nature relaxed there's nothing called ideal you read 
score will automatically come. It's in the in your name. Please apply that as well. Right? Sure, I'll update. I'll, I'll update healthy people. Fine. Okay, we'll sign off now. See you. Thank you. Thank you for your patience and patient listening. Bye bye. Thank you. Hope brand is also extremely consistent. If you want to take inspiration from him, you can. Thank you. We are here, Aditya. We'll learn more.